Hi, my name is Uncompetitive and this video is called Uncompetitive Reacts to Eric Weinstein's 2013 Geometric Unity Lecture. And I'm just going to see if I can hear myself. And I'm just going to see if I... I'm just going to have to go back and see if any of that was recorded. Not breathing. Hi, my name is Uncompetitive, and this I think the sounds a bit loud, so I'm going to adjust that. Um, we're going to go sensitivity of the microphone, reduce it a bit, and then we're going to make the sound output on the speakers louder to compensate for that. And hopefully that will be all right. So from this point on, I'm going to see what I sound like. Um, and catch up with the stream. Where are we with this? Where are we with this? Oh, that's all right. Where are we with this? Oh, that's all right. All right, okay. That, that seems to be fine. So we'll leave it there. And um, I need the other tablet in case I work on the iPad. So, I, because what happens is when I'm sharing the screen, sometimes it stops sharing the screen in the middle of me um, annotating something. And I'm talking over annotating, and I don't know that it's not going out. So, I need this one to monitor the screen uh, whilst I'm doing everything else. So, if it was reliable, I wouldn't need this, but it's not reliable, so I do. And um, I don't know what I've done with my phone, my phone's somewhere. Um, right, so we go and find myself on here, so we're going to hear myself again here. Uncompetitive reacts to Eric, which is live here. Myself on here, so we're going to hear myself again here. That should be that, and we want to mute that. We're only interested in the visual. And I'll probably completely disregard that this is even here. But what's good about this is that when I'm drawing on the iPad, I won't be able to see the chat on the iPad, but I will be able to see it here. So that's an advantage there. And I think the best place for this is to put that there. And um, okay, right. Um, right. So we close that down. We're going to go straight back into the uh, reaction. We've done a little bit at the beginning. I've gone back a little bit in time. To like where he begins. So I've had the introduction by Professor Michael Tosotoy, and um, he has a little bit of a preamble, and then he gets into um, talking about um, Ed Witten and um, Ed Witten's summary of physics, where he says, you know, physics is um, can be thought of as like three things. So um, if we do that, um, that, we've got the clock there to see how much time we've got left because it could run on until it's a 12 hour thing. 
we're looking for him to say, so in that spirit, let us begin, because he says, so with that as a beginning, I'm just going to say one disclaimer, which is that this is not a usual talk, and with whatever contract a speaker usually has with the audience right now, we're going to break that contract. Um, this is a talk about ideas, so it's a speculative presentation, because it's a Simone lecture, and the Simone lectures are on the mission of being about ideas. So if we go back to the Marcus de Sotoy's introduction, Marcus de Sotoy says this, and he says, Charles Simone prepared a manifesto when he endowed this chair to guide the holder of the professorship in their mission. And he's the one who has that uh, Simone professor for the public understanding of science. So it's at his invitation, Marcus de Sotoy's invitation this is even happened right so you can blame him for eric weinstein being platformed if you have a real problem about it it isn't eric weinstein's fault if marcus de soto takes it upon himself to have him appear and speak at oxford i don't have a problem with it because if you think about charles simone endowing a chair for the public understanding of science and part of that manifesto reads scientific speculation when so labeled that a you're not saying that you you've got something when you haven't got something and you make clear that it's just an idea um and when the concepts of speculation and its place in the scientific has been made clear to the audience can be very exciting it is a very effective communication tool and it is by no means discouraged. And it is in the spirit of this part of my mission as a Simone professor that I would like to introduce today's Simone special lecture. So this is a lecture about ideas, and this is not a theory. And we go past a quote from um, Witten that's been pasted in there by the people doing the transcript, and it's this um, point one point two and point three thing with all this kind of vaguely unintelligible mathematics uh, that is what he writes up in his own uh, idiom on the blackboard. He doesn't use the symbol M for the pseudo Romanian manifold. He uses X, okay? Um, fermions are uh, matter uh, particles or matter fields, and to say who is, what is that, then we're looking at, um, we're looking at Enrico Fermi, so there's Enrico Fermi, and um, there's two kinds of particles you need to be uh, aware of, there are fermions and there are bosons, so he's responsible for giving his name to all the matter particles like electrons and quarks, and quarks make up the neutrons and protons that make up the nucleus of an atom around which you have your electrons, right? So this is like pretty basic stuff, but if you don't know, fermion means like electron, quark, that kind of thing, uh, or you get muddled up between that and the other thing, which is named after this guy, Satyendra Nath Bose, these are bosons, all right? And bosons, an example of a boson would be a photon, which is a constituent of light, and um, a gluon, which as the name suggests, glues quarks together, all right? So you've got your fermions, which are matter, and you've got your bosons, which are force-mediating particles or force-mediating fields. And... There's kind of dispute in the culture of physics whether or not things are particles or waves, because you can think of them as waves. And there's a more profound way of thinking about it, which encompasses both, which is that there is um, multiple um, tensor fields that are pervasive across the universe. So you have your space time and you overlay different kinds of tensor fields um, 
which will be like a rank zero, rank a half, rank one, possibly a rank, you know, one and a half or rank three over two uh, tensor field. And um, then there's a suggestion like maybe there's going to be a rank two tensor field. And the people who are into string theory think that there will be. And that's where you'd have your graviton uh, bosons. Where, where those those bosons would be the force mediating particles for gravity. So it's all kind of a, quite a logical pattern of these things. And a tensor isn't anything too uh, much to worry about. A tensor is um, well, if you if you want to describe something that is a distortion of um, space time, you need to have four dimensions because you've got these three dimensions of space and you want to have an extra fourth dimension for time. And it's all one thing, the, the, temp, ten, the spatial dimensions and the temporal dimension, the singular temporal dimension, kind of weave together to give you space time, right? So that's what Einstein came up with in special relativity. And then he decided, well, having it so that, that space time was flat, wasn't quite cutting it and wasn't explaining everything. And if he wanted to explain uh, gravity, he could describe it as being uh, distortions um, in the fabric of that four-dimensional weave of uh, space-time. And as a result, what you get is you see here the clock out in kind of outer space, so to speak, is going around quite fast. And that's kind of like normal speed for that clock. And then as you head towards the mass at the center, the clock is going a lot slower, right? Um, unfortunately, with this GIF, it doesn't go like all the way around in a loop. I don't know why, because um, I would have thought being a cube, they could have just imaged it so it would rotate a complete cycle. But it might be that if you did that, then the clocks wouldn't necessarily sync up because they're not all going around in a, in a loop, are they? So the ones in the center are going around at a different rate from the ones on the outside. So maybe they, they would jump anyway. But it would be nice if it did more than just rotate kind of like that and then jump back. You know, it's a bit frustrating. So um, this is by far the best um, animation communication of the idea of what um, general relativity is doing, right? If you can't grasp it from this, then it's a bit hopeless because it's like you should be able to grasp the idea that that mass in the center, which could be like a star, is making it so that time around it is going slower. If we pretend that that's the Earth, that explains why uh, global positioning satellites have to take into account general relativity to give us precise uh, map information about where we are. Because if you don't have that, the um, time close to the Earth where you are um, with your you know, phone asking where am I I'm lost in the woods, that is going to be different from even a satellite in orbit where the um, it's further, far, further away from the distortion of the space-time that is what you could essentially say is a gravity well of the Earth. And that is making it so that um, the clocks are starting to go around more like at normal rate, right? So the things on the International Space Station are weightless. They are microgravity environment. So they're like a very, very small amount of gravity there negligible uh, because it's far enough away that the gravity of the earth is not a big problem. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, the space station itself is massive enough that it does periodically have to thrust itself away. Otherwise it would decay in its orbit and it would end up burning up in the upper atmosphere. But generally speaking, as a thing, and the things people within, I'm gonna say things, the people within the International Space Station are in that frame of reference 
of the International Space Station effectively, more or less, not having to concern themselves with gravity. It is there. It's very, very slight, but it's like it's it's like not a not a problem. Um, as um, they can do experiments that um, would be ones that would be impossible on Earth because you can't eliminate the effect of gravity. I mean, they've had spiders, and they've taken spider spiders up into the International Space Station in a little experiment, and they go off and weave uh, a web, and they weave a spherical web. Okay, so they can still, still do it, but they might come up with completely different geometry um, when they do it. And they, I don't think they have anything they're weaving it onto. I think they're just floating in space, and they are able to make it so that everything they do is like, and it would, it would actually catch flies if the flies were up there. Um, it would be quite effective. So um, they kind of construct their own sphere around them, around in which they walk on the inside of, or smokes or the outside of, and then if the, a fly did land on it, they would catch it. Uh, because there's nothing to destabilize the sphere. Um, unless you kind of get a strong wind within inside the, the ship or something, or someone knocks it with their hand, uh, that would be an issue. But it's, it's um, uh, as far as I'm aware, that's, that's something. So um, it, it, you should take it as this, in a sense, is going at normal speed, and then this is being slowed by the presence of the mass. Now, it isn't that there's a universal time and this is going around at universal time, and then mass is slowing things down from universal time. But for the purposes of explaining this, um, it's easy enough to just kind of hand wave that subtlety away and um, not kind of get into what I, um, um, Albert Einstein would talk about, which is, you know, frames of reference of uh, different clocks and uh, relativity or, and different observers of the same event and so on, and how there's no definitive anything because it's all, you know, where you are and where some, something else is happening. Um, those two things are like, um, will both seem right to those two people experiencing that phenomena. And what they see of each other's phenomena will be relatively kind of distorted because of their relative positions in a distorted space-time. And there's a whole lot of things called Gedanken experiments that he uh, developed when he was working on this theory. And he had a job in the patent office opposite, I think it was in Swiss Switzerland, in Bern. And the patent office is directly opposite a massive, massive clock I mean, it's ridiculous how big this clock is if you look it up online. And the clock is for the the railway station. And you, I mean, this clock is that so big, the face of this clock, and so you just can't miss it. And he would think about, you know, what whether the clock would slow down and under certain circumstances um, to do with movements and that sort of thing. And, having a torch and carrying a torch on, a, on a, how fast the light would go from the torch uh, ahead of you. Because if you are um, moving on a tram and then you throw a ball, then what then happens? You know, you think, well, ordinarily the force iron part to the ball will be, you know, the force of the ball, right? And it will go at a certain velocity. But if I'm moving on a tram car at 13 miles an hour and I throw the ball at like, you know, two miles an hour, then the ball is going to be the sum of those two motions, isn't it? It's going to be two miles an hour plus whatever is the carrying tram car speed, right? So it's going to be that much more. And so it's going to be going at 32. And it just so happens that counterintuitively, 
with this um, light phenomenon, it doesn't do that. Uh, irrespective of how fast you're moving, light has a maximum speed limit. And you can't get it to go faster by you going faster. So if I'm static and I'm shining a light beam and I measure speed of the light beam, that light speed will be 180,000 miles per second. But if I am like in a jet aircraft and I do it again, the speed of the jet aircraft, which might be like 600 miles per hour, won't then make it that much more. Right, and it's like weird. You're thinking it would, right? So this is something that had already been established by uh, Mickelson and Morley, and they've done tests of the speed of light and measured it experimentally, and it was a big puzzle. And then um, uh, Albert Einstein came along, looked at it and said, I'm gonna uh, treat it as if that, experimental result is correct and then things that are within um, Newton's laws um, such as universal time, universal space are incorrect and I'm going to reframe uh, Newton's laws of universal gravitation around this thing where the only thing we know for sure is that light is this fixed speed and everything else has to kind of compromise around it and this is where the concept of relativity comes from. Now, there's quite a good bit of a talk by Ed Witten in this. And I think in the spirit of this being, we're talk, we've talked about fermions and bosons, which I would regard deep down to be fields, right? Um, we, the next thing that's going to come up in this thing about him kind of, doing a kind of introduction that's based around this thing that Ed Witten has said. Um, Ed Witten says, space-time is a pseudo-Romanian manifold M. So what's that then? Because that seems to be like, oh, that's dragged all the way off there. I didn't want that. I want that there, and then I want that there, right? So what is that it sounds complicated what is romanian well it's just named after bernard riemann so um i'm not sure if i've got a picture of bernard riemann on the screen maybe i have um this is um this is albert einstein roughly around the time that he was um coming up with general relativity so he wasn't doing it when he was an old man, right? He did this all, all this stuff roughly in his youth. And there's about a 10 year gap between special relativity and general relativity. I'm not like a historian of all of this stuff. So you have to forgive me on dates and things. I'm not very good on dates. Um, I don't think I've typed in and got Bernard Riemann. I might have him. On the, on the screen, but it's just easier to just search it rather than look for it on the desktop. So there you've got Mount Riemann, and that's him from 1863, so he's kicking around quite a lot earlier than um, Albert Einstein, who um, that picture of Einstein was from, um, I've gone and lost it now. Um, in fact, I completely lost it. I think I went, to that from the other one so this is 1863 and that picture was taken and uh the other page would be albert einstein yeah so this would be from 1912 so that would be what that would be 1863 1912 um take away the two and the three that would be about 60 and then 10 so that would be 40 10 that'd be 50 years later right so the breakthrough in the mathematics that he used uh, was around for about 50 years before, you know, anyone figured out that it could be applied to um, just explaining the universe being effectively this concept of squished space-time, right? 
And I, I, I've come up with the term squish space time, and I think it's better than saying curved, because curved is like, you know, you have your, um, you have your, your, you have your space, and you have, have it be flat, which would be special relativity. So that would make it a drape over there, and it's now essentially flat, right? And then you go off and say, but if I was to put something under it, then that would make it so that it is now curved, right? I mean, you can see that there's a curve there. And then you say, well, we've got a problem now, which is like, how do we measure things when the surface is curved? Like this surface here has got curves all over it that's making it squished. So what you do there is you need to have some kind of a ruler. Now, to measure distances on this, but it's got to work with curves. So what you could do is you could have something whereby you have your, your, your thing that's making it curve. I'll drape it over this cup. And then, so it's a rigid curve. And then you could go off and then say, take some tangents along this and build up a picture, right? And you have to take the tangents really close to each other. And that's using a bit of mathematics that we'll get to. But this is all what's known as, um, well, this is going to be a, um, a manifold and we're going to be doing calculus on it in order to do lots and lots of these tangents and build up a picture where our estimation of it will all be um, very fine grained. And then we will work out mathematically the exact curvature like that. So it's kind of, if you know what integration is, the way that you have like a curve and then you take slices under the curve and kind of fit like a skyline of uh, buildings under the curve. So they all touch and you just do that. So that you say, I can know that for any given width of a building and all the same with style of building, all rectangular oblongs, then they will all effectively fit the curve better the thinner the building because it will have less of a waste uh, at the top between the top of the curve and where the um, width strip goes up to meet that space. And I've done this in another video, so I'm not going to break away and have a little lecture on calculus. But the, the that part of calculus um, where you do this um, integration of under a curve to find an area, um, that's one form of calculus and you shrink the width of the buildings and that makes it a better approximation until you kind of do it a mathematical trick in order to kind of make it so it's a perfect uh, estimation. And then you've got an equation out of the other equation that generated the curve where you the other equation will tell you between one number and another number what the area under the curve above the axis is. And if there's stuff below the curve, I mean, below the axis, that usually is treated as a negative, and that subtracts from the amount that you're considering. Now, there's another form of a calculus, which is used so that if you have a curve, you can reduce that to know what the slope is. So in that instance, you would have the curve and you say, what's the slope at this point? And it, it essentially you're asking it, what is a tangent at that point? And the tangent will have a, 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 um, an angle, right? So like there, it's like, so I can lay, lay it on top, right? There, it's just horizontal, obviously, otherwise it fall. And then here, I can't let go of it because it will drop, right? So that, um, that slope there, it's got some value because it's, it's slope. And then this slope here is like zero because it's like there's no slope. 
And so it's going one way or another as it goes around the cup. And so that form of calculus um, is another thing you do, do sort of things with. And that gives you the, um, allows you to find the uh, slope of, of a curve um, at any point. And it turns the formula that gives you the curve into a formula which gives you the slope. And I, I did this at school for two years, along with the thing where you find the area under the curve integration. And I never understood what any of it was for, because they never gave me a practical application to, of it. So it was like very, very hard to learn something when there's no, why the fuck am I doing it? And it was very difficult math as well. I had no luck doing my differentiation because it wasn't like there was like you do one thing and you get it differentiated it was like there were kind of like keys and there were like 12 keys that you used to unlock the puzzle and the guy next to me would take the key and unlock the puzzle and it would be the first key he'd use and then i would go through all 12 keys every single time it wouldn't matter what order i took them in it there was seemingly no rhyme or reason why he could pick the right key and get the right answer, and I couldn't. And um, I couldn't look at this and say, oh, I'll be needing to pick this key to differentiate this properly. And it was just a nightmare. And I, I was getting behind with my homework because you get like 11, 12 questions. And I'm thinking, well, that's not really 12 questions. That's 144 questions, isn't it? Because it's going to be, you know, 144 times I'm going to falsely apply the key. And I never got any help to get any better at it. And then the guy who was good at it went off to do mathematics at university. So, um, you know, there you go. So uh, maybe there's a way that all of this, I think it has applications to engineering that to do differentiation and integration, but I heard from someone else that had done mathematics or was it physics at university? They got in to do that and they said in the first year, they come and say everything you've been told in your A levels for two years and in your O levels for five years or six years, we're going to tell you it all again in this first year as a kind of onboarding. So we sure, we're sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of what they know. And then we do the next two years of the degree. So you were there for a three year degree. And the first year, you either might not be knowing anything, learning anything new, or you are being told stuff that you should have been told correctly the first time around, but because of coming from a hick school where they didn't know how to teach, you were told not the right way to learn it. And not the official way that the university you're attending likes it to be taught and learned. So uh, you're just thinking, right, so that means that if I was to go, going to be a physicist and I was going to go through school and I'd go there at 11 years old, I would be able to have one year of focused study to then get into the two-year course in physics and I'd have a Bachelor of Science in physics by the age of um, 14. But I wouldn't do any English and I wouldn't do any French and I wouldn't do any German and I wouldn't do any history and I wouldn't do any art and I wouldn't do any of the other stuff. I'd just do the thing I might be interested in when I was 11, right? I mean, they could make school completely expedited if they did that. But they, you wouldn't have a broad base of um, different study. I mean, the thing is, is they like you when you're doing your university course to have like maybe a minor. So I don't think that's a bad idea. So that you would have a bit more, like you'd have your liberal arts thing that you do, and then you have your STEM thing that you do. So you might study mathematics, and then you might study as a minor philosophy, let's say. And then that would be taking up a much smaller part of your day. 
but you'd only be doing two two topics, right? And I think that that would be more reasonable. And I also make the time spent at university a year longer, and then I'd scrap a scrap secondary school and A level, and uh, not bother with it at all, because um, I I didn't get anything out the whole time I was there. Uh, it was a complete disaster. Um, that everything I've learned, I've learned since from Wikipedia. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that I've learned it. That's just like joining dots together and seeing similarities and patterns and stuff, which means that anyone who knows anything about physics will be in the chat saying, you don't understand, you're talking a load of bollocks and blah, 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 blah. Like, why are you doing this? You should not be doing this. Shut up because you don't know what you're talking about. And the thing is, it's like, fine. You're free to go off and make your own YouTube video series about geometric unity. Oh, wait, you haven't, even though it's been around since 2013 and it's been around as a video to react to since 2020 and it's been around as a paper to react to since 2021 and you haven't made a video on it, right? And I've made multiple videos on it. So which one of us is, you know, actually making an effort and maybe i'm wrong but i think i'm fairly right because eric weinstein phoned me up and i said it's all right if i explain geometric unity to you so that when i explain it to other people who are of a layman's levels of understanding i can kind of give them the gist of it and then i'm not you know i i, I say that and they can appreciate some part of it and he said, go ahead. And I said, I said, you know, interrupt me as soon as I say something that's incorrect. And he didn't interrupt me. And um, I only had to say stuff for about three minutes to explain the kind of the min minimums, uh, gist of an understanding of like how you get from a four dimensional mathematical abstract pseudo Romanian manifold into the 14 dimensions he uses and then from there into uh, everything else he ends up with and uh he was happy with what i was saying um so that went quite well because you're thinking like you're going to be saying that to someone and they think that you're being impertinent and they you know hang the phone up on you but the thing is is that he rang me right so um he rang me and then he was saying, you know, what do I want to ask him? And I thought that was weird because normally it's the other way around. The person who does the phone call is the one that um, I wouldn't be expecting me to ask him anything. It would be, I mean, wouldn't he, if he's ringing me, wouldn't he be asking me stuff? Now, eventually it came out right towards the end of the thing. I suppose he was sizing me up. At the end, he says, am I, am I a theoretical physicist? And I was like, no, no, I'm an art school dropout, right? So, um, yeah. So I think maybe he was a bit disappointed by that because I think he was hoping that I, given that I'd done this tweet uh, where I summarised geometric unity in a single tweet and that's what led him phoning me up that that was like a sign that there you know someone out there who could give him constructive suggestions um the only thing i was able to give him uh in any way of that nature was i asked him a question and i said um is a ship in a bottle operator bidirectional i mean actually there's a whole family of them um and uh, he said it was. So uh, I'm not sure whether he misunderstood the question, because I know there's epsilon as an operator, and then there's this inverse of epsilon to kind of get it back, because you have your, your not masked, and you, well, actually, there are multiple masks, but I just do it with one, and you apply epsilon to it, and then it goes and makes it go like that, and then it goes into the bottle, I think, this way, and then you pull on the strings to get it to stand up again, right? And that would be where the neck would be of the bottle. And so 
this whole thing of the ship in the bottle thing, of it going down like that and going into the bottle like that and being pulled back up again, the pullback of that that uh, is, is totally different from the pullback operation that's marked as pi within his theory, that this pull, pullback thing would be um, the kind of inverse of the other operation that made it go down like that to fit through the neck. And so that um, inverse epsilon thing uh, would be a gauge invariant, you know, gauge preserving operation. And that's not what I meant. I didn't mean that it was bi-directional in the sense that it goes down and then it goes back up again. So if he thought that that's what I meant, that was a kind of uh, miscommunication between us. What I meant was that when you put the the thing into the bottle, one of the masts breaks away, right? And this is happening in Einstein's version of the theory. And as far as I can tell, the, the mast that breaks away is, I think, the wild curvature tensor. And we're again talking about tensors. We'll get to talk about what tensors are presently. But the wild curvature tensor um, breaks away and he ends up with a simpler setup. And that's what um, would be analogous to his uh, diagram involving the bottle. And um, what I thought was, well, if it goes into the bottle and it breaks this thing away, what happens when you come to bring the thing out of the bottle? And is it one, is it something you can take out of the bottle again? Right? Is it even make sense to even say, you put the ship in the bottle, can you take the ship back out of the bottle? And in the case of taking it out of the bottle, does it not need the, the mask back that you broke, right? Because it seems like it's entropic, right? So if it was that this um, mast was shrunk, because he shrinks other masts, he shrinks, I think, the Ricci curvature um, constant. He sh sh shrinks that, which is at the back of the boat. He goes off and he, he could have the option of just not getting rid of this, but going off and saying, I'm going to make this minimal as if it's like, I can, it has trivial impact on everything else. And it then it's as if I had torn it away, but then mathematically there's a way of recovering it. And when you bring it out, obviously it has no value, but it's effectively, it's as if that aspect of things is flat. Uh, within the space that you're bringing it out into. So as this, the space of metrics where it gains G mu nu and becomes the Einstein field equations, which means it applies to space X, which is a four-dimensional pseudo Riemannian manifold, when you pull it out, would it not be the case that this is back into the full space of the fiber bundle uh, P of G, which is, I, I've rewritten it from P of H to P of G, because there's confusion between um, it being H for the group that he has it in, in his paper and H for horizontal vet space. And I think it makes far more sense to have H mean horizontal vet space and have G mean the group. And then you're naming the group after this guy, Everest Galois, who um, came up with the group. Right, so we have that um, thing where it moves back into the space of the principal fiber bundle, which is the it kind of more than the complexity of the 14 dimensions, but it, it's like 14 dimensions enhanced. It's uh, I did an equation on it the other day and I don't know what I've done with it. It's it might be on here somewhere. This is not official right this here is like my attempt <laughs> at doing this uh, thing of like this is where i feel he's headed with his work and i just played around with it a bit 
in order to say where is geometric unity heading and this here is Einstein Dirac squared so it is equal and effectively to the square root of the Yang Mills um, Higgs right and um, that's what he's saying in his um, paper so he is saying um, some or other he's saying that this he says it there if you look down there at the bottom and it says Einstein Dirac equals the square root of Yang Mills his Klein Gordon and you, as you can't actually do that mathematical operation what you do is you do what Dirac did and you square both sides and that means that you have to square the whole of this Einstein Dirac stuff and then you have to uh, square this side and you square away the um, kind of the impossible fantasy square root that you had on this this side right so that side there loses its square root and goes back to being normal and this side now becomes um, squared terms then you're comparing uh, two sides of something which are both in terms of squares uh, because these are second order um, based equations and second order just means something to the power of two and this would then become something to the power of two in terms of all the terms in this and I've, there's a video on my channel which covers all of this in a bit more detail where it's talking about what happens with Dirac and how he used this technique of a Dirac square root in order to obtain the Dirac equation for the momentum of a electron in uh, terms of uh, special relativity from the Klein-Gordon equation, which is a bit at the end. Now, as the Klein-Gordon equation has more recently been kind of underneath the definition of the Higgs uh, potential, then when he's talking about this, he's saying the Klein-Gordon equation with potential, um, that is all one thing, right? And so that is a uh, rank zero tensor, which is um, what would be known as a scalar uh, tensor uh, or a spin zero field. That is what the Higgs is. So Higgs is a Higgs boson, which is a bosonic spin zero field. And then you have your Yang Mills stuff, which is down here, and that's in terms of a vector uh, boson, bon bosonic field, and that will be uh, in terms of a rank one tensor field, and it will just literally be a column. Um, so one is the, where we've got this, this, we've got, we should have it somewhere. I think that's hit there. If I zip over to there, we'll see that we've got a rank two tensor there. And obviously it's got um, the red horizontal lines are gonna be rows. And you can see there it's going to be the red numbers down the left are zero, one, two, three as the numbering of those rows. And then you have numbering of blue lines that are vertical that are gonna be the columns and it's going to be zero, one, two and three now the rank two tensor is something that eric weinstein doesn't even worry about in terms of what he's doing that's what ed Witten worries about when he's doing string theory and he thinks that this rank two tensor is inherent to the um graviton right so if we go back to the table i don't know if it's on there it might be uh, yes, here, at the top here. So this top one is the picture of uh, things in, in terms of the conventional way that things are made to look. And the conventional way is that you have gravitons, uh, theory of Einstein, and spin two. All right, same column as this column here. So that's comparing the regular way that things are. And in geometric unity, saying, well, 
I don't think it's going to be that complicated. I think it's going to be you don't need these um, rank to um, spin to uh, things where they're going to need these extra uh, things that are called gravitons that we've not seen in accelerators. Uh, so it's all just kind of complete. Oh, well, gravity works because of an exchange of gravitons are bosons. And it's like, oh, really? Like, show me one, right? Um, and in geometric unity, it happens that you get um, the properties of uh, this not because of subatomic particles that haven't yet, yet been found, but because of um, this, because you're dealing with a, 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 a squished space-time. So um, it is squished space-time that's giving you those properties, and it's all due to this guy, and um, the support of his wife, really. I mean, got to give her some credit because um, if it, if I think he had a schizophrenic son, and if she hadn't been dealing with a schizophrenic son, he wouldn't get got any work done. Um, so, um, but then you say, well, you know, genius is close to madness, and then you know he has children, and the child ends up not very well. So that's unfortunate. Um, so, um, so we go back to the table that has the other things in, which is the where, which is here, which is actually the thumbnail for the video. And we look at this and say, okay, we're not using gravitons. We're going to be doing things not through quantum means in terms of how things are moving in space-time. Space-time is essentially classical and it's all being done with a kind of continuous geometry rather than the quantized thing. So we're not trying to quantize space-time. Uh, we can have quantum stuff happen within it as phenomena, but we're not going to have the actual arena in which things um, uh, act as phenomena uh, be itself broken up into little kind of, you know, you may be here and you may be here and you may be here, but you can't be uh, individual parts within that. So it's kind of like the difference between space being made out of positions numbered by integers and space being numbered by real numbers. And in a Riemannian thing, it's more like it's real numbers. Okay, so that means between one and two, you can have any number of numbers between one and two as decimal placed numbers. Um, whereas in integers, you have one and then you have two. There's nothing in between that in, in files the integers are concerned. So is it that you go down deep into the fabric and there's a weave and then the weave ends up being like, well, you can be on this bit of the weave or on the next bit of the weave, but you can't be in between because there's no notion of in between. Um, or is it that there's actually a continuous thing? And he's in the camp of Einstein where everything in happening in terms of space-time is um, this continuous, uh, uh, infinitely, in, infinitely divisible space, right? Rather than the people who are uh, in the dominant majority uh, of string theorists who are trying to, I think, look at space and say, we're going to make it be broken up into parts. I mean, I might have misunderstood their work, but that's what I'm getting from it. I think that's the case with loop quantum gravity, at least. Um, but I, I can't really give too many opinions on all of these things but, and compare them because I thought, pick one and research that. And as this was new and it had like one video to watch, I thought, right, well, I'd always wondered what a presentation for a unified field theory that unifies, you know, um, seeks, seeks to unify the um, standard model with um, uh, general relativity, what that would look like, even if it's wrong, 
even if it's wrong, I'd be interested to listen to a lecture of someone saying, here is, you know, the whole thing. And it's not like he stood there for 70 minutes saying, you know, the universe is powered by love, right? And there are theories of everything kicking around that claim to be theories of everything quite, you know, unironically and um, unabashedly so. And then they'll say that the universe is powered by love and they won't have the math to back it up because the people doing those theories do not know how to write math to, to justify anything, let alone something as audacious as that. And if they could justify that it was powered by love with math, then fair enough, but they don't. So they are cranks. Whereas Eric is doing, it at the time he gave this presentation in 2013, uh, he did not say that it was a theory of everything. And he was quite circumspect about the whole endeavor. So if we look at the presentation and what he said it was, he said um, this. This is the Facebook ad for the talk. And you can see there for yourself, oh, well, you can see there for yourself that this is saying, um, it's really tricky to resize this. I don't know why. They like the grab handles, aren't they good? Okay, there we are. So Geometric Unity, Special Simone Lecture, hosted by Marcus de Sotoy. Unfortunately, when it got mailed out that it was happening, it wasn't really circulated enough, and not enough people turned up, apparently. But then he came back and he did it another day. So he, I think he did it at least twice. So, um, but he did have a round of applause at the end of the lecture, if you listen out for that. Uh, and I think we'll get to the end of the lecture today. Um, the, um, uh, he gets a round of applause. So there is an audience and there are people in the comments of the video saying, ah, well, he's talking to an empty room. And I'm thinking, no, I know for a fact Marcus de Soto is there. I know for a fact that Peter Thiel attended, right? And there are people at the end who were applauding. And then Michael Enciso on Cora said about what happened and what the general reception was like and what the atmosphere in the room was like and so forth. So this says... Um, a program from Geometric Unity is presented to argue that the seemingly baroque features of the standard model of particle physics, what I've just referred to, um, are in fact inexorable and geometrically natural when generalizations of the Yang Mills and Dirac theories are unified with one of general relativity. And it says uh, 23rd of May 2013. And you might say, well, what's the standard model of um, particle physics? Let's look at that first. And we're going to go, well, there's two ways of looking at that. One is like the kind of conventional way where you kind of have a diagram of the particles. Where is it? Is it even here? Um, it might be here. It should be here. There. Standard model of elementary particles. And this is... I've mentioned quarks, so, you know, a neutron and a proton will make, be made out of an up quark and a down quark. They'd be made out of three quarks, right? And a proton that's positively charged will be made out of, um, it's easy to work this out, it'll be made out of um, an up quark, which is charged two-thirds. Do you see that two-thirds sign there? And then it will be made out of another up quark that is charged two thirds. And that will give you four thirds charge. Now we know that the charge of a proton isn't some funny number like that. It's just one, it's a plus one. And the units are in terms of the electron, right? So the charge on an electron should be minus one. So that's the electron, it's negatively charged, and that's there is where it says minus one, right? So we want something to be 
adding up to one. So what you do is you do two thirds plus two thirds, and then you need to take away a third. And it just so happens that the down fork is minus a third. So you have that triplet and that gets you your down fork. Now, if you wanted to have it be neutral, you want the charge to be zero. So then you think, how do I do that? I have a, an up quark, which is two thirds, and then I want to have something which is gonna take away two thirds, but I'm not allowed to just have like a negative up quark. There is no such thing as a negatively charged up quark. So what you, and you also need to have two uh, quarks because they come in threes. So you look at it and think, oh, I know what it could do. I could have two down quarks. They're both a third. Take away a third, take away a third from two thirds, and we're going to get zero, right? So I've just built um, a neutron, right, out of these up quarks and down quarks, right? And um, those are the two things that you get inside of most um, atomic um nuclei now in the case of hydrogen hydrogen only has um these three um quarks where it has um you know two up quarks and one down quark for one proton and then it has an electron to match the, the charge you know so it has one electron going around one proton and it's that simple and most of the matter that was produced after the big bang was hydrogen in fact i think it was all hydrogen and then helium came out of a kind of the heat of the big bang and fusion fusing together some of these things in order to make heavier um atoms so i think it initially initially it was just hydrogen. And um, like, if you think about the beginning of the universe and you're thinking about the, the Legos that you're building everything out of, it's like three things. It's kind of nuts, right? But someone's gonna go, hey, hold on a minute, Mr. Teacher. Um, it's actually more than that because you also have gluons. And that's true. You need your gluons. You wouldn't get very far without your gluons because you have eight gluons uh, inside of an atomic inside of um, inside of any like proton or neutron to keep that together. Because if you were observant, you would have picked up on the fact that if you have your up quark and your down quark in the combinations needed to make a, a proton, that's going to have a positive charge and positive um charge will repel another positive charge in much the same way as the north pole of a magnet will repel the other north pole of a magnet and you bring the poles of the magnet together and those two magnetic fields will repel each other with electric fields that are of similar sign we get the same effect so two negatively signed things will repel two positively signed things will uh repel and to uh, complementary, you know, different sign things like plus and minus will attract. And so I can't go into this in too much depth, but that is like a basic grounding in all of this. And although they're made to look like little, you know, billiard balls, they're not billiard balls. The electron isn't a billiard ball. And this is all a bit of a lie, right? So we've been told a lie about these things and they are more amorphous than this and they're more kind of smeared out and they're not in one definite place. Um, I might be able to find a video on what they actually look like and then you get a bit more of a picture on things, but let's just keep going because the gluons are there to keep the positively charged things together that are in the nucleus, right? So the protons would ordinarily want to just go bing like that. And even with hydrogen, hydrogen wouldn't be stable at the beginning of the universe and wouldn't be able to build a, be a building brick on which you then made heavier elements. 
it would just evaporate into uh, it's throw itself apart into just a soup of uh, quarks, up and down quarks that would, you know, um, not know what to do with each other. So it's because of the gluons, um, it's because of what's called the color force that governs the gluons that you end up having these things um, overcome their mutual repulsion because they're both positive, okay? And then the Higgs is there as a general field, because all of these things should be better thought of as fields rather than as particles. And the Higgs field is kind of like, I think of it as like the difference between light, what will be walking through a river, and it will be like in your Wellingtons, there's no real resistance and you can just go as fast as you like. So your maximum speed is the speed of light and that would be like walking through the river and then if you are um dealing with something where the phenomenon of mass would be you and your uh wellingtons walking through a bog right so it's it's really incredibly thick mud and you're dragging your feet and it keep getting stuck in but you know you've got to get home and you've got to cross the yorkshire moors to get back home and it's, a, it's an effort, right? And so that effort uh, that's slowing you down and slowing down the velocity you have, that is making it seem as if you have more mass than light, which is kind of like, really, I get to go wherever I like at the maximum speed. And you are going down slower because of the bogging down effect of the Higgs. So the Higgs is having a kind of interaction as a field and I don't understand why it has an interaction with some things and not others. I suppose it's because the photon doesn't have a mass. Because it says here, the mass of a Higgs there in terms of um, a giga electron volts is a unit. Um, so that measuring it in terms of energy and energy is equivalent to mass because it equals mc squared and then the gluon that doesn't have a mass and the photon that doesn't have a mass so presumably it's because it doesn't have a mass i don't know what that really means um because they're trying to say that the higgs is the thing that is making things have mass so i don't really understand why it is that the photon is free from the Higgs. Um, I mean, it says that it's like it is because it has no mass, but mass is defined by the Higgs. So it's like it makes me think there's some other parameter that is characterizing these things. That is like that is a thing where it interacts with the Higgs, and then that is what means that it has mass rather than it's like, oh, it has no max. Because it's like a circular definition that way, right? So um, we have the these Z boson, and that has mass, and we have the W boson, that has mass, but it also has two forms. It has a, uh, a plus form and a negative form, so you could count that as two particles because it has a a negatively charged version and a positively charged person version. So there's three of those. And um, uh, what we can say that's interesting is because we've established that there are eight gluons and they're actually these, um, there's one photon and then there are three of these uh, other things, the Z and the W uh, plus and W minus. So you've got eight, three, and one. We'll need to look for that and see if we can find that somewhere. So um, if we look at for it here, it's all here. So we've got it there. We're going to say, where is something that looks like a one? We've got a photon there, and we've got a one there. And it just so happens that this U1 holds within it a subgroup U1EM, where it has a little EM written there, and that is 
controlling the, the, the U1 as it stands is something that's called hypercharge and U1 with EM is a subgroup of that which contains the um, unification of electricity, magnetism and light. So out of those three, we're interested in light and um, that will be your photon. Now, I think the whole of electromagnetism is mediated by photons, but I could be wrong because I think it is. Um, and so that is related to this. So we put that, if we make it so that we, um, what's the easiest way of doing this? If we keep that that way up, and then we go off and we rotate this, then that might help. So we take that. I don't think it's good. Oh, yes, it will let me rotate it. Okay. So we'll have that like that. And so we have the photon there. And we'll have the photon underneath the U1. Do you see that relationship? So there's one thing and one thing. Then we're going to have that one thing and those two things, which makes three things. We're going to say, well, three doesn't seem to work with SU2, right? Well, the actual way you work it out when it's a special unitary group is you go two cubed minus one. So that, no, not cubed. It's squared. Yeah. Two squared minus one. So for any anything that, you know, SU of N, it's going to be N squared minus one things within this, right? Fields within this. And so that will mean that you do the calculation, it would be two times two minus one is four minus one, which is three. So it's literally that simple to know how many fundamental particles there will be in this group it will just be the number squared minus one now you might say well that doesn't work over here because if you square one get one take away one you get nothing right and it's like yeah i think that's because this is not the same as this this is a unitary group and that's a special unitary group and i think if you put this in terms of another group in terms of a special unitary group um, you possibly would get the right answer but I don't know how you would do that because no it wouldn't work because there's no number that you can do that would yield a one is there because uh, you'd, you'd be looking for something where it would need to be two would be the thing that would be the result of squaring something. So what can you square that will get you two? What two numbers come together to square to two? And you can't think of anything. So, I mean, there is a square root of two, but these are all uh, natural numbers. So um, I think that should be regarded as a separate case, right? So... That U1 is a separate case and is corresponds to the photon, and the SU2 corresponds to the Z bosonic field and the W plus bosonic field and the W minus bosonic field. And that has those three things in it. So now you're looking at three and you're saying, well, we think we're starting to understand this. This should be of the formula three squared minus one, if this was two squared minus one. And so that would be three times three, which is nine, minus one, which is eight. And that gives us the answer we want, which is we've got eight gluons, right? And I think this will extend up into higher numbers of SU something, right? Where it will say with SU5, it's going to be, um, one would guess it would be five times five, which is 25, minus one, which would be 24. Uh, fields, right? So I could be wrong about that, but that would be my general instincts. Now, having got the diagram in this form, we can now see that we've, we've got most of matter in the universe described 
by everything around you, everything here, everything, my coat, everything is all made up of up quarks, down quarks, electrons held together by gluons, emanating photons, given mass by Higgs particles. And these things tend to get overlooked, but they are essentially um, there for purposes of radiation um, and like fission. So like if you have an atomic bomb, um, that's a classic atomic bomb, not a thermonuclear bomb like we have today, um, like the bomb that was in Oppenheimer, um, that bomb, that original bomb at Trinity was working on the basis of producing these things, okay, and creating a cascade and making more and more and more of them uh, with an uh, unstable material that was prone to generate them. And then that would lead to more conversion of matter into energy using E equals MC squared. And then that energy would give you your mushroom cloud, right? So that's the weaponization of the nuclear forces within inside atoms. And that's something that um, Albert Einstein was mindful of. And he um, was like, he worked out e equals mc squared when he was doing special relativity and not long after that i think he was either writing to the state department or to the president of the united states to say i've done some work and it points in the direction that you could take um you know these things uh that you could take the atom could be you know turned in energy could be made out of that matter and it would be a, a lot because it's E equals MC squared. And if, if M is matter and C is the speed of light and the speed of light is 180,000 uh, miles per second and you're squaring it, that's like, like a large fucking number. And so it's like a tiny bit of mass will go off and give you a large amount of energy. And even if you don't have a total conversion of the material inside of your uranium-based atomic weapon, it's going to be really, really dangerous to set one off, right? And they're about like a kind of football-sized amount of uranium for a, an old-style one. Um, in Oppenheimer, it seemed bigger like this, but the rest of it was the containment thing, right? Because it's so radioactive. Um, In the film, they didn't seem to show the demon core, which was a mishap they had. Um, but I won't get into that now, but it's worth looking that up if you want to. Um, and it would have made the film more dramatic because it's all people talking in rooms and the demon core was like, they nearly set it off accidentally when they were assembling it. And it's only because one guy basically intervened to stop it going off uh, that... Um, it didn't go off at the, at the site with all the people around it. And um, he got radiation poisoning and died very quickly from having such direct contact with the material. So um, they didn't they didn't cover that story. And I thought they would. Um, and it would have underlined how incredibly dangerous it was what they were doing. Because there's also a thought that, you know, what if there's a chain reaction between the bomb and the atmosphere? Because the atmosphere is made out of, you know, matter. So what if this this fission reaction that's involving um, essentially this, what if these products that cause nuclear fission just go wild rampant, you know, into the atmosphere and cause the atmosphere to burn up? It's like, not good, is it? So... We have that, and then we have um, a whole bunch of other things we don't really need to concern ourselves with, but it's more interested to nuclear physicists where in accelerators they have been creating high energy collisions and then they keep having these other things pop out. So normally you just can get to get by with up and down, and that's what you'll see most things made out of, but you can also have at higher energies, the collisions will produce charm and strange. 
and then there'll be truth and beauty or what more dull people call top and bottom right so you'll see here number three in roman numerals um the number three in roman numerals and then we'll have number two and number one and that's what's known as the three generations and it's classing all of these things as fermions right which is where we were earlier when we were mentioning the difference between different kinds of thing and there are you've got your fermions and those will be your quarks and your electron down there and then you'll have up here uh, you'll be having your force carrying or force mediating particles which will be your bosons and so there's that um, now they've gone and made them color coded where they've made it so that in this diagram the red or orangey color things are called vector bosons and I could probably do to re rotate all of that so there we are so that's called vector bosons on the W plus and W minus and um, Z naught and photon and gluon, right? All of those types are called vector bosons. And that means that they are described by vectors. And so let's look into what the vector looks like. And we will um, go to vectors. There, okay. So we've got that, what's a vector look like? We've got a rank two tensor, and a rank two tensor is, well, a vector is a rank one tensor. And so we go off to here, and we'll just try and make this a bit bigger and shove it off to the side like that. So if we just have a column, that's gonna be a vector. And all it is is rank one, tensor and if we have another dimension that makes it rank two that would be rank two um and even if it was just this it would be rank two right just adding another column would make it rank two it doesn't have to be two by two to be rank two or, or, four, or four by four i should say to be rank two so um you could have a um vector that was simply that right that would be a column that counts as a vector right but if it's that it's not a vector because it's not two things or more two or more things in a column it's not a column it's just a single entry that's still a tensor though and that would be described as a rank zero tensor and that is where you get your spin zero things from. And an example of a spin thing would be your Higgs particle, which is described as a scalar boson, right? So in mathematics, if you have something like two outside of a bracket and it's multiplying things in the bracket, it's usually referred to as a scalar value because it's just one number. But if you do anything, say, with array programming, uh, like uh, APL or something, all of this will be familiar from that because it will be like the scalar values are actually not single numbers, but they're always in an array because it can't think of anything other than everything being an array. And so an array with just one entry in it, one row, one column, will be treated as a scalar, and it will be treated like, most languages will treat a single value right but then you'll say i have a list of things here and it's like four things right and so you'll go from having you know a single variable and it will be the scalar and then you go off and you'll say let's give me um i'll have four things and that'll be in a column which it wasn't showing this thing in the corner But there's a way of doing it if I'm careful. There, okay. So you have your four things in a little vector, 
And there are things like C++ now that call a short list of the same type of item uh, a vector in programming languages. So there's a bit of crossover with programming. Um, and uh, they have it in APL where it will be just another array, but an array of those dimensions of so many rows, so many columns. So it's one column of four rows. And in that instance, you will have something where it will be called a vector. And in all of these things on the right that are in orange, your photon, your gluon, your Z boson, your W plus and W minus bo bosons, they are described by this. And in four dimensional space time, you will have to have all of these four entries given values. So in the Dirac equation, um, the, um, the electron um, would, mm, the, the electron is not a, a boson, it's a fermion. But essentially it's also governed by having to work within um, four dimensional space time. Um, in the Dirac square root of the Klein Gordon equation, he had space time be flat, which made the math a whole lot easier. And this was after general relativity was a thing. So you kind of think, well, why didn't he not just do all the, all the math for the Dirac equation? So it was working within squished space time. And I think it's probably because to do that would be too fucking hard. And um, he was like, well, let's just start off by seeing if I can get quantum mechanics to work within special relativity, right? Have that crossover happen. Because it hadn't happened until Dirac got involved and did that. And um, he managed to get the electron, which is part of quantum mechanics at the time, in 1928 to be described with given a momentum within a flat space time and of special relativity. And he needed to have the first entry where zero would be, be time. And then the other three, one, two, and three, be, you know, the X, Y, Z positions. And uh, there's a bit more to it than that because the time is, is usually a negative and it's multiplied by uh, the, the light speed in a vacuum so that it has a measure, which means it has deals with relativity and the other things will change their lengths, but the lengths of uh, speed of light won't change. And so um, that's to, due to the uh, Lorentz, I think. Um, I'm not sure if if Lorentz was something that was in special relativity. I think it was because um, things happen when you move faster, where it makes things shrink to the observer of the thing that's moving faster, right? And the thing that's moving faster, things aren't shrinking for them, but someone who's observing the thing moving faster, everything's shrinking. So. That's another, you see, the thing is, it's like you get into like talking about relativity. It's got two forms. One builds on the other and complicates things with the fact that things are squished. But essentially it's the same uh, core idea. And the things that uh, Albert Einstein was going through when he was working on it at the Bern patent office and looking at this big clock for the railway station is all to do with time and all to do with things moving fast by you know going on these uh, railways right and so he had that um on his mind and that's how uh he formulated it with what's called gedanken experiments and i could type that in here um now um So all of that's quite interesting. And there's all manner of videos about that stuff, but I find that not particularly helpful.
So when they talk about, you know, the torch, you know, carrying the torch, you know, on the front of the uh, of the tram or, or a train, and I'm shining it out and I'm expecting it to be um, at the speed of light plus the speed of the tra tram, and it's not. And like, what does that mean and everything? And it's like, you you have, and what happens when the tram approaches the speed of light as well? And I, well, it wouldn't because it couldn't. So I'm already like checking out of the whole thing of the explanation. So it gets very, very silly when they have these thought experiments, these Gedanken experiments, and they go off and say, right, we've got a train and it's going at the speed of light or near to the speed of light. And it's like, no, it's not, though. It's not, because trains don't do that. So come back to me when you can explain it to me without talking nonsense, right? Because it isn't a nonsense theory. It's very simple. All it is is what I've shown, where it is this thing where everything's squished and it's like you know that image with the with the things ro that's rotating around the star and everything's like that so in this instance this will be your vector and it will have you know your photon will have a direction in space and all of this all these things will be vector bosons uh the higgs will be a scalar value and that will just be a single value like that and it's a field which means that everywhere within the manifold of like space time or if you think about it as just like a as a as a, just a flat thing here that flat thing that's your your your, your space would have the higgs everywhere all over at every point it'd be a completely pervasive thing that would be kind of baked into uh reality in fact all of these fields are everywhere it just is the amount in which they're manifesting as an excitation at any given point is varying and if they're if they're a single value all they can do is have a number a, a numerical manifestation of this is how much mass there is where I am. And then when it's dealing with the um, vectors, uh, vector type stuff, the gauge boson, vector bosons, the ones that are the photons and so on, that's going to have a um, not just a magnitude of a, of a size of scalar, but it's also going to have an orientation. And it's going to be like a, like a field of glass where the bits of glass are sticking up a certain amount and then they're pointing in a given direction right so as, as wind blows across the field of glass you're going to see lots of blades of glass seemingly going in the same direction and then you're going to look at it and say oh well I can see a pattern there it's undulating glass that's waving and whatever so it's waves and then some of it's going to because it's if you add other dimensions to it uh, it's become more obviously clumps, right? So, like, if you think about it as you've got rain coming down and the rain is in obviously in space and in time and it's coming down all the time, then um, you can sometimes look at the rain and think, right, it's raining. And then you can look at it and say, well, actually, it's kind of the wind is blowing on the rain and it's kind of creating these waves throughout the rain. And it's all 3D, but it's going through the space, right? So you can see the individual droplets of rain that are falling, of course. Well, if you imagine them to not be falling and imagine them to all be fixed points, but they can change their, um, their, 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 their size and their orientation, uh, to a certain degree, then you can kind of get a kind of a sense that they are a field of droplets of water that's sort of suspended there. Because no sooner has one drop, then it's replaced by another one. So when you're like look, looking at water, water, you know, rain coming down, it's it's almost the case that you can look at it and think of it. It's like the rain is just there. 
it's not actually falling it's like it's just there and then i mean you could sort of freeze time take a photograph of the rain as the wind blew through it and then the the way the the rain would kind of seemingly clump up i suppose it's not that good of an analogy really but you could also have the rain kind of get into a cloudburst mode where things will actually um there'll be like a it will end up being like a particle so it's that's not a very good explanation though um i've got a video i could show on this but um we when we're dealing with things that are um fermions they aren't um vectors and they aren't scalars they're in between and they are uh to get something like that they, you're not even allowed to do this so what you have to do is you have to make it so that that somehow conceals an extra dimension and doesn't count as a dimension in this sense and what you do is you use complex numbers and that way you're using like the imaginary unit to give you real numbers plus real numbers multiplied by the imaginary unit which is square root of minus one and that is a kind of cheat a kind of hack to get you a kind of extra kind of unofficial dimension where when you multiply out your equations and you kind of square things and stuff it all goes away because you square the square root of minus one you get minus one so so long as your quantum field theory gets squared at some point or um, um, it multiplied by it ends up being what's it called the word when you do, do it to the power of four um when you do something to the power of four you even get rid of it being minus one because minus one times minus one will be one so it'll just end up scaling it by one and it'll be like it was never even there so you can completely eliminate the imaginary um unit by taking your 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 equation and doing it to the power of four and um i feel as if the quantum field theory stuff that makes use of this hack um um can have have it go away with the either squaring or the things that are inherent and that way it goes out of being in the realms of kind of this kind of imaginary wonderland and it has turns into something more, more deterministic where it can't be that it says right what is the position of something and it's like well um about that it's in an imaginary location that like, no i'm sorry but you can't give me an answer that's involving the imaginary unit it's got to be something definite right so um that is what's happening with this over here when you're dealing with um all of these things where they are spin a half and you'll see that the up quark is spin a half all of these things that are fermions the electron here is spin a half it's at that same position and so um that uh, is made to work by having it be um on that basis um what else is there to say on this i was going to show you a video of quantum field theory visualized and a video of uh edward witten talking about the same topic and then going into uh this so what we'll do is we'll see the first part of the edward witten video and then the second part of it later so we'll do that because it's going to be talked about Witten. And the, the Witten thing is a framing narrative for the whole video and for the uh, notes that end up in the uh, conclusion and the summary of the paper, which I'm also referring to. Because in the paper, he goes through and says, 
if I was to describe geometric unity in terms of Witten's summary of physics, it would be one, space time is a pseudo Romanian manifold X, right? And blah, blah, blah. And it's kind of quite similar there. And then he goes on, and because he's talking about a lot more stuff, it ends on going, going on beyond point three. It ends up being quite a lot of points. I think it goes up to like nine, something like that, episode nine. Uh, so we'll see how we are with this. Where we want to get um, the stuff by Wooden here, and we'll have him. This is quite a good video, and I recommend people watch it. And um, I'm going to put the link in the chat. Not the third. Describe. I'll put the link in the chat and um, go from there. Now, before I put it on, I'm going to look at the um, So do this, then we have quantum field theory visualized, and then we'll go back to this again, and then we'll be in a better position to kind of breeze past the stuff that's really quite hard, and like a kind of cattle grid at the beginning of this lecture, where it kind of gets bogged down almost immediately into completely incomprehensible stuff where Eric Weinstein is saying, this is um, Edward Britton's description of physics which is itself incomprehensible and this is my re re rearticulation of it which is kind of a, a good match i would say it's it's slightly different symbols slightly different notation but it's essentially the same and i'll point out where the differences are and why is he's doing it that way and once we got past that um it's like it's like he's been given like a kind of recipe of like if this is what the problem is of the summation of like the distillation of what physics is like you've got relativity and you've got the standard model and you've got the stuff that Dirac's done and it's all quantized then those four things are going to have to be at the core of anyone making a serious um unified field theory, uh, which is what I think he is trying to do. And what he says in his um, um, Facebook ad, he's trying to do. And so um, I mean, in the Facebook ad, he says it's a program. And, it, and uh, in the uh, introduction to the video, which I haven't shown, I'm not showing, uh, he describes what it is, and he says that it is a uh, work in progress, and then in the paper, what the supplementary slide explainer he he talks about it as you know uh, as being a work in progress and is aspiring to make a unified field theory, and then at the uh, paper that he published in 2021, he does not say it's a theory of everything. Uh, he says that, again it's a work in progress. And by saying it's a work in progress, it's automatically not a theory. And it couldn't be a theory because it's not quantized. And that's not a knock on it. It's just fact, right? So um, he was on Lex Friedman. And Lex Friedman was like, you know, saying, does it make predictions? And he says, yes, it makes predictions. And one of those would be it predict, predicts a different kind of spin matter. So you know you had what I was saying recently about um, tensors and how you have you know spin two tensors. Well, you can also have a spin like one and a half, and it's a bit like the way you do the spin a half thing uh, that gives you your electron, and it's like a vector that's also kind of cheating and making use of complex numbers. So it's like a, a vector boson, but it isn't a vector boson because it's using these 
uh, also complex complexification, which is allowing it to be another example of a fermion. And these spin three over two or um, rank three over two um, tensors are um, obviously mathematically suggested in the way everything's being put together. I mean, if you're going to be proposing spin two, it's the thing that naturally falls between everything else. And uh, this is being named uh, by William Ruritta and uh, Julian Schwinger, uh, uh, Ruritta Schwinger matter, because it's a matter particle, because it is a um, fermion. And um, uh, these things would be uh, predicted within his part, within his theory, within Eric Weinstein's theory, uh, as a result of it having parity. And parity is something whereby you have a symmetry between um, different types of particles. So that if you've got some that go and spin left, you've got the same type, uh, corresponding type that spin right. That doesn't mean that there's the same number of them and that they're like an even match of numbers of particles that turn, spin left and spin right. It's that the number of types are matched. So like, um, you know, there are no, you know, it's like for every male Alsatian, for every type of male Alsatian dog, there'll be a type that exists that is a female Alsatian dog. There might be fewer male Alsatians than female Alsatians, right? In actuality, the number of dogs might be different, but the number of types will be um, a match, you know? So um, that would be an example there, and that would apply to more than one kind of breed of dog, right? It'd be every breed of dog would have a male and a female. And those that typology would be kind of akin to saying, we've got some things that spin to the left and some things that spin to the right. And that um, bifurcation into that split um, uh, was like, right, so we've got a kind of almost like a mirror of these things. And like, just as I've got a you know left hand and a right hand and they are, uh, one would be the mirror image of the other. If I touch the glass of a mirror, this hand would come up to touch it from behind, and I'd think, oh, right, there's my mirror reflection. But if in Alice through the looking glass, Alice was to then say, I'm going to climb onto the mantelpiece, and I'm going to reach through the glass with my right hand, and I'm going to grab the wrist, and I'm going to pull it back and then out this way, the Alice that was reflected in the glass would now be have their hand this side and they would then say oh well this doesn't actually fit with this hand right so the alice through the looking glass is is not going to fit with this hand i can't make this match this is this is not the same as this hand. I can't have this hand put inside this hand. It's it just doesn't work. The thumb's on the wrong side, right? Everything's wrong about it. And so this notion that you can have an object that is not symmetrical uh, is a property in mathematics called chirality, and um, it's just a fancy word for asymmetry. So if you were able to have something that was symmetrical, for example, forget about the water, this glass, right, is symmetrical about the vertical, right? That side and that side are the same, then that's um, non-chiral. Equals symmetry, right? So um the notion inside of physics that there is going to be um symmetry 
um, is a con concept which is called um, an expectation um, of symmetry um, is in physics. Okay, and that means that uh, things would be the same in a mirror universe. And that is not the case according to experiments. However, those experiments were carried out in the universe. And you might say, yes. So how does that undermine them as being true? And I say, well, it does if there's more than just the universe. Okay, those results can be invalidated if the universe, uh, those are invalidated if they are not the whole story as the universe is just a section of a larger structure. Okay, so um, Eric Weinstein says that large structure um, Cutting like right over into like the middle of the talk, um, Eric asserts that larger, uh, we'll call it 14 dimensional structure um, is called the observerse, which includes uh, space time, four dimensional space time, as a particular section of those fourteen dimensions. Right, so you've got your whole thing here so just imagine this meniscus is where you're trying to get to that represents a one-dimensional universe that has to be this simple to you to be able to represent the 14 dimensions right you then go off and you take tangents to this so you, you imagine the points around this and you're just trying to capture the information onto fibers and these are the fibers and so you go off and you touch it there and you touch it there and touch it there. So like I was doing earlier when I was doing differential geometry, you're doing the same sort of thing where you're saying, what's the slope of a curve on this thing? And you're finding out that the edge here is like a constant curvature, actually, where you're going around because it's a circle, right? So this is what would be called S1 in terms of algebraic topology. Uh, where S1, the one, refers to a sphere with one dimension. And if you're dealing with, like, you know, the surface of a sphere that was like a beach ball, which is not solid, you're only dealing with the surface, that would be S2, right? Where the, the number two is like a superscript, and it is like the number of dimensions. But this, you look at this and thinking, well, I don't see how this is a sphere, well, it would be a section of a sphere that was a one-dimensional section of a two-dimensional sphere where the two-dimensional sphere was like the surface of the Earth and that was the equator, right? 
So the equatorial line that goes around the maximum width of the Earth is a section of the higher dimensional sphere, right? And so you can take that further and you can have a three-dimensional sphere, which you wouldn't really be able to do a drawing of, right? And then you can have a four-dimensional sphere and so on and so on and so on, right? Now, he has, in some of his thumbnails and his videos, presented something that's called a hot vibration. And the hot vibration is um, something that looks like this. And that would be, let's have a look if we can find it there. And this is the hot vibration. And we'll just have a little bit of a, this thing. And so this will be a sphere. And these dots on it will be uh, shrunk down rings from the higher dimensional thing. And it's very hard to articulate this. You, you'd have to look into this a bit more to capture what this is. But this is the kind of thing that he is saying, oh, this is what is uh, the structure that is overlooked that's um, at every point within our space time. And this is kind of where the extra dimensions of the 14 dimensions exist because you have, let's say, a 10-dimensional hypersphere, and we'll ha have that 10-dimensional hypersphere, um, and we'll capture it. And I don't even think this is an example of a 10-dimensional one. I think it's a simpler one that's got fewer dimensions. But we'll just let this run, and we will see how the motion of these things here give us rings here, right? And then we start charting a space around it goes around in the ring and it creates that and then we shrink it down and expand it up and it's all having this weird interrelationship because one is happening in um a high dimensional space and we're seeing a projection from it so as it moves around its own high dimensional space our projection of it looks kind of freaky right so i've only got a little bit of this but what I can do is I can go and scrub over it like this. So I can go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards like that. And I can pick, point, pick points like there. It's like spinning around because the dots in the right hand corner are spinning around. And then it goes out to there, it splits. And then splitting, as it splits, you get a doubling of these lines. These lines here are now doubled where they weren't before. So you go back and they're the single lines, yeah? And so when you have them doubled, they're like doubled now. They don't look that doubled there, but they are doubled, right? And then do it a bit more and then spreading out a bit more right and they are now you can see sort of that this is like an internal structure like a kind of wicker basket inside a wicker basket and then that then will shrink down so as this goes down towards the equatorial thing this second thing that's moving down will be getting more compact and the thing that's there at the top is staying exactly where it was, sort of like a framing thing, like a lantern. And then this thing down the bottom is now, it is going to split into two things. And so that's going down. And this one, I think, is going to go horizontally. Um, which way are they taking it? Well, we're at the end of the video. So um, that's the end of my screen recording. So um that's split again you can see the relationship of this being separate things and this being separate things and um, that being a single thing and this isn't the entire thing because the entire thing would be blobs over the entire surface of the sphere and if you do that you get 
something that's far more complicated. In fact, you don't even get to see what's going on because everything's covered up by the outer shell. So we have that, and we could look up the hot vibration on on the um, online. So how I would do that. Uh, I probably got it somewhere. Um, it would be Niles Johnson. Hot. And I need to have it be, it's a bit longer this video. He's got like a video, a video of him talking about the mathematics. And he's talking about S1. See that there? I don't know if you can see that there. And um, that will be like a lecture that will be like an hour. Uh, so I'll link uh, that. I'll link that as well. We don't want the music. So we've got the same deal here where this is the thing that's doing the charting. I can't do the thing where I scrub on this because it's obviously playing forward as a YouTube video. You might recognize some sequences as part of the sequences that I was covering where I was doing my capture. So, uh, where was it? It started off at the top and it's kind of mauve. I think I started my capture here and then it gets to the top here and then it goes through that and it's, then there's a ring at the top in mauve just about after this yeah it does that and it goes to the ring at the top which is in mauve and there okay then it splits then you get the shell inside the shell then another shell inside the shell and then all the things are now turning around in different directions like a kind of merry-go-round and then you're orienting the whole thing around with those being the points of contact. And that's basically doing your heading because it's in like at least four dimensions. You're kind of getting a nautilus shape. Um, and that was a Mebius brand for a very, very short amount of, sec of seconds. When it was red, it looked like a Mebius. And... That's kind of thick braided cordings. And then we have more like what he has for the video uh, thumbnails. But he's going to make it more obvious because it's going to get more solid still. And then there's going to be like C shapes uh, on the gray thing in the bottom right hand corner. And the C shapes are going to be a, a kind of cutaway. So you can see into the shape. So he'll have a cutaway there. There's a cutaway. And there you'll see that's the sort of thing he has in the thumbnail. Now, all of this stuff was done. There we go. That's the geometric unity thing. Um, and that's not geometric unity. And you might say, but it is. I've seen it. He used it in the thumbnail. His um fiber bundle is more complicated than that all right more complicated so um it is what i've said before which was it is i don't know if i've got it it i i have it as a um not that not that where is it? Because mm. I was struggling with it the other day to write it out, and I think I got frustrated and I might have got, gave up. Um, it's not on here. Um, it's somewhere else. Um, because that's incorrect. I was trying to do it and it's incorrect. It's missing information. 
Um, yeah, I don't think I've got it written down as being what it is. Oh, yes, it's on this one. It's on the thumbnail. Okay. So this is an illustration of geometric unity. Um, although that should say why there. I don't know why that's happened. Must have got erased. But anyway, um, yeah. So it's pretty complicated. You have an Erismanian fiber bundle. Well, an Erismanian manifold, which is uh, constructed out of the pseudo-Romanian manifold X4. And this is a different form of geometry, and it is geometry based on the work of Charles Erisman. So we've got a picture of um, uh, Bernard Riemann. We want one which is of um, Charles Erisman and which one is it? Right. This is the be best um, best picture is we've got him Charles Erisman on the right. So that's him on the right there. Um, and let's see, what date is this? Oh, well, that's 1949. So that's like ever such a lot later after um, Bernard Riemann. Bernard Riemann, the, the, the picture of Bernard Riemann was like 1863. So this is like getting on for like a... Um, uh, almost 100 years later. It says it's known for the um, um, the complex manifold as man's vibration theory. So you know, see the term vibration, um, as man's connection, jet bundles. So I don't really know much about what jet bundles are. But it's partly what we can find out. So in differential topology, the jet bundle is a certain construction that makes a new smooth fiber bundle out of a given smooth fiber bundle. It makes it possible to write differential equations on sections of a fiber bundle, right? So that would mean like space time taken out of the total space of the 14 dimensional fiber bundle in an invariant form, which would mean it preserves gauge invariance. Okay, I, I didn't know this. Jets may also be seen as coordinate free versions of Taylor expansions. Right. Um, now we will have, um, so that will be Charles Erisman, and we will have, this is no other picture of him, no. And then uh, we'll have a picture of Bernard Riemann. And I know we've already got a picture of him already, but we're going to have both on the screen at the same time. So we're going to just have that bit bit higher and then have that there. And then that way we've got our Bernard Riemann and our Charles Eversman on the same screen. And then we've got that over there and that over there. So geometric unity is the unification in part of the geometry of Charles Erisman with the geometry of Bernard Riemann. Right? So that's like, okay, that seems fairly straightforward. Um, but it's not because like obviously everything's complicated. Um, and that's one of the reasons I had this be my thumbnail uh, in earlier videos. And I was quite pleased with this although it's turned on its side but here it works out quite well because it's like we've got uh charles Eversman here and we've got bernard Riemann down here and so um if you look at the supplementary slide explainer at the end of the lecture eric weinstein starts off with um a pseudo-romanian 
abstract mathematical manifold of d dimensions he doesn't even say it's four dimensions he's like leaving it open and then i color code this as blue and like it's like the ocean of space-time but it is not yet space-time because he hasn't given it a what's called a metric which is a uh, set of dimensional measures with which to measure that space so it is a kind of amorphous thing and it is kind of equivalent to saying i have this floppy kind of space-time uh, not floppy space-time i have a floppy space which uh, can have stuff happen in it and that's my arena in which I am thinking of putting my um, unified field theory into but I'm not going to rush in and say oh well it's going to have one dimension of time three dimension of space because if I do that right away I won't be able to then say later where did time come from because I'm assuming it right so for it to have an opportunity to not lock out the opportunity of saying like right, this is where time comes from then he has to start off from a position that's much more abstract and i would say that in the lecture he's starting off from the position of having decided that this has four dimensions right but actually it's it's like simpler than that he has something where it is d dimensions and d can be more or less any natural number right it could be one dimension it could be two dimensions three dimensions four dimensions it could be as many dimensions as you like right and that then gives rise to a whole bunch of math which we will cover uh, as we go through the lecture because we're not doing it all right now and that is what the early part of his lecture is all about kind of going through all that math and then he's like saying this will then grow you hear that word grow a um a uh Arismanian manifold and that will have i would say he doesn't say this because he doesn't use the num he doesn't use the do not use the label m he just directly does it in math but it's simpler to just say say that m is equal to d squared plus 3d divided by 2 according to his formula right and for him he calls m, well, he would call m the metric okay and that will be what i will call in english in far more words the unrestricted set of dimensional measures for the pseudo romanian abstract space uh d D was the abstract space X that has D dimensions, right? So if D has say four dimensions, that's going to mean you get a Y where M is equal to 14 because D squared plus 3D divided by 2 can be worked out with D equals to 4, where D squared is going to be 4 times 4, 16. 3D is equal to 3 times D, which is going to be 12. 16 plus 12 is going to be 28 divided by 2 is 14. so that's how you get to that right but that's his method that's not the method i explain to people as well how you get from four dimensions to 14 dimensions because i don't understand why is that formula it's completely opaque right so i will cover why it is that you go from 4 to 14 later on because i i don't want to spend too much time on this but the point is is that this is a general construction okay and this is him doing this and he gets up to a higher dimensional manifold so this is his Riemannian manifold then he has another manifold which i can't see how i'm going to represent but that one would be a, a, like a kind of would sit on top of it and that would be like things that would stick up at right angles to that reality okay and that full height thing would be the space in which this would be found as a section and so that's kind of like we get back to the glass and we get back to a bit of gauge theory 
and with the glass we say the meniscus is uh, analogous to this space we've just been talking about of xd and then we go off and put tangents to it along like that capture the stuff as positions on here and then having done that we then go like that like that and we'll turn it so we've got the tangent and then i think it, what it is is the cotangent of this I'm not sure mathematically if that's correct but he wants to have it be so that this is now um able to construct something whereby they are all able to be ordered in the same sense so that when these things are all going around like this what happens is the diagram looks like uh this we'll move that over to where we are here and we'll move that there right so if you look at this we look down on a very simple example of the glass, right? And we're looking at the meniscus, and say the meniscus is where this example is, you know, where this analogy is. And the meniscus is one dimensional thing. And that would be where all our tangents are going. And imagine this is red, and this is the, the red lines that are on the screen there, okay? So each of these red lines is coming around now. I haven't drawn them all in because to draw them all in would be too confusing and too bristly. But that, that thing that looks like a kind of crown of thorns, that will be capturing as a tangent of S1. And so there is a circle would be S1 in algebraic topology terms. And that one doesn't mean to the power of one. It means... It has one dimension. So it is like the equatorial circle of the Earth, only considering it as a surface, right? Whereas S2 would be the entire surface of the Earth. And then T out in front of it means take the tangent of it. And those things are the set of tangents of this, right? And then... Um, you then go off and you construct from that by turning them from being that way to being this way, right? You create this, every, you take one in particular, then it's going to be going vertically. Now, I could have drawn them so that we were outside of the glass because obviously you can only turn them when they're on the outside of the rim. But then I thought about it and I thought, well, yes, that's probably better, but it doesn't really sell it as much um, as if I'm doing it the other way around and it's on the inside. Now, this is, you know, in a sense, this is wrong as a drawing, but what it means I can do is that it means I can drop that um, into the glass like that. And you can imagine it's like a kind of thing that you're keeping all your pencils in and the glass and the meniscus are at the same point inside right i mean there is no glass in the way of you and the meniscus if you put it on the outside it's preventing you from making the tangent right but on the inside when you're immersed in the, the water the the meniscus and the thing that makes a tangent to the meniscus is the same point right so um you obviously you wouldn't have been able to turn this this way whilst it's inside the glass because the glass would be in the way but we're not talking about this being water we're talking about this being an idealized circle that's inside of a frame which is a cylinder right so i mean you could have it be you've got like a toilet paper core and a cardboard cylinder and then you have like a hairband and you put that around the toilet paper core and you could move it up and down and that would be your one dimensional circle and then you go off and say right now let's take a tangent to that and we'll put that on there and we'll have as many of those as we need to capture that whole circle and then we'll turn it up vertically 
so that it's in line with the circle, and then that makes lines the whole length of the carpal tube, right? And when he was on the Theories of Everything uh, podcast, and they were talking in general terms about Theories of Everything, I don't think he was saying that he, what he was working on was a theory of everything. I think he's been quite circumspect about it. He got a bit frustrated and he was saying, look, we always come on, and we always talk on about multiverses and stuff like that. And we never get to anything that's like meaty, right? We never talk actual science. We could be doing that right now. You know, I've got this theory. Well, I don't know that he describes it as a theory. I've got this thing I'm working on where it's this, that, and the other. And he brings out these props and he goes off and does a rapid explanation of it. And I think that people found it incomprehensible because it was so much removed from reality. And what he was doing is he was saying this thing of like how to construct a fiber bundle of a one dimensional universe. And a one dimensional universe wouldn't work as a universe because you need at least two dimensions you need to have time and space for there to be any dynamics for there to be like a lagrangian right for there to be potential energy and kinetic energy in some relationship right so you can't have movement through space you can't have movement through time and you can't have movement through space that takes time unless you've got at least two dimensions so your signature of that space would be like one comma one and the signature of the space that we're dealing with here because it's one dimensions is like take your pick it's either one uh, comma zero because it's time without space or it is zero comma one which is space without time now if you choose zero comma one it means you've got space in which to sort of set up some kind of space but you don't have any temporal dimension for anything to happen in. So um, that doesn't really get you very far. But um, he does do another explanation of it with a two-dimensional space, which does have space and time. And that, because of that, it looks like a donut. Uh, and that's in the Dr. Brian Keating program. And I find that even more incomprehensible, okay? So the um, the one that for me clicked for me was when I worked it out for myself in the case where it's not one dimensional or two dimensional, but four dimensional. And when it's four dimensions and it's actually representative of reality because you've got the three dimensions of space, you've got left, right, up, down, in, out, and then you've got past, future, or you know, now into the future. Um, that uh, setup is familiar, and that's sort of where you want where you want to have your jumping off point, right? And um, I was able to work out um, how it is that it is however many um, dimensions it will be for what he calls let's see the kind of behind the yellow the metric. Uh, for x13 I was able to work that out from scratch and then when he phoned me up I then said to him the means by which I'd worked that out what what procedure I did and he didn't correct me on it so he had an opportunity to tell me no that's wrong and he didn't so it's either he's happy with it or happy that I tell people it's like this and it doesn't really matter all that much um, I'm not claiming this is definitively correct because he doesn't say in his lecture or in his paper how it is that he gets from X4 to Y14, um, like, other than to say it's like, you know, D squared plus 3D divided by 2. I'm like, well, okay, why that formula, right? So it would be a big help if he um was to say in this next paper why is he gets there and he was on joe rogan he had like was trying to explain that to joe rogan why it was that it was 14 and he had like uh picks and four different objects on the table 
and was kind of like saying that, well, it's like this, that, and the other. And they've got angles between the different four things, and you count those and count something else. And I don't think anyone understood. And I didn't understand from the basis of that explanation. And I don't think it was a very good uh, explanation because there would have been a lot of people who would have been uh, watching, but there would have been a lot more that would have been listening. And they would be able to see what he was, he was doing with these four things. Um, so, I mean, I could show a bit of that now for context and we could just, See, I mean, I'm not here to critique his um, pedagogy, but I would say that there are things that he could improve when he comes to present his ideas because it's like, um, you know, so where are we with this? We want to have... Um, And I'm not quite sure it could be this one. And we want this where he's talking in terms of We'll try it from around here. Get swept up in the politics of physics. Be seven years or whatever it is. And like today's the first day that I'm sort of free because I've kept this to myself. So if you want to ask but me any why? question about geometric unity. But why? Why did you keep this to yourself? Because I don't trust these people. You don't trust these people in the same, like I know there was uh, some people that have written some art, but wasn't it Sean well, Carroll's wife? But it's not them. It's a, it's an entire system that believes in peer review. It believes in forced citations. You have to be at a university. You have to get an endorsement to use a preprint server. Um, it's too few resources, too many sharp elbows. Um, Do you think that there's there's a logic to that method? No, I to, think to preserve it from charlatans and yeah, you have to do crackpots that. Yep. that are yeah that just want to publish stories. Yep. So this way you have to be sponsored. You, it makes sense, right? Yes, but it. So whatever I'm doing, whatever mistakes I'm making, assume, assume what I'm wrong about by this theory, which is fine. Um, I'll find out that I'm wrong. Give me the layman's version of the theory. All right. Yeah. First time ever. Yeah. Um, do you know that, well, let's start off with Escher's drawing hands. Mm -hmm. So do you, Jamie, do you, do you have a picture for that? The, the key problem that we have in a fundamental theory that people don't think about is not why is there something rather than nothing? I don't think we can answer that. It's why is there so much that is that is rich out of almost nothing? And so this issue shows that if you had a piece of paper, could you will into being the hands holding pens using ink to draw each other, right? That problem is akin to the problem that we face in a fundamental theory. If you had the canvas, how would the canvas bring all of the richness that you see around you into being? And what I did was I said, okay, we have to go below Einstein. So we have four degrees of freedom, but they're not yet space and time. It's proto space time, but before. And then I said, okay, that. So what he's just said there is confusing. It's proto space time. No, it's not. It, you can't refer to it as proto-space-time because it's not anything to do with time. It's just space. Okay, so the first, thing, it, first mistake he's made is by trying to talk about space-time in the Einsteinian sense of space-time and say, well, we need to go below Einstein. Okay. You need to have something that is more fundamental than general relativity, fine. Then you say, how do you recover space-time? How do you get to Einstein from something simpler? Well, you could have start off with something that's an abstract 
four-dimensional pseudo-Romanian manifold, which is where Einstein was before he added in time. But when you say before, you're not talking in terms of cosmological history, you're talking in terms about the history of physics and the development of the theory of general relativity, right? You're talking about before in that sense, not before in terms of before time, which is like, what do you mean before time? You need a notion of before to be time. You need time for the notion of before, right? So it's kind of a linguistic trap that you can avoid by saying, start off with a four-dimensional space. And then you grow out of that the unrestricted set of dimensional measures for that space and you say well what would that be and it would be like well we've got the dimensions of left right um, up down in out and we haven't got past future because it's not got time so we're going to have to think of another one for the fourth dimension and we call that Anna Kata, right? So the fourth dimension, and it's this is the the the, um, the official term for the fourth dimension, not like left right. It's called Anna Kata, right? A lot of people aren't really aware of that. It does have those names, and then you go off and say, okay, this is confusing to me. Can you explain it another way? Because that's like, I can't picture it. I can't picture this thing that's got four dimensions to it. And you say, okay, what we'll do is we'll have the three axes that we would ordinarily have. So you have the um, horizontal um, left, right axis, the vertical up, down axis, and the, you know, going close to you, uh, Z axis, no, the, the in out axis. And we will name them like we would in mathematics. We'll say that one, horizontal one, is X. And this one is the vertical one, which is Y. And this one, which is the in-out one, um, is going to be Z, right? And the, all of these things are just labels. We could name them any letters that we like. We could let, label them all X. And we could have that be X, you know, one and that be x2 and that be x3 it doesn't really matter how we go about labeling things so long as we are consistent about what we're doing right so we have that system of things that we are um, either calling x with a subscript or we're calling x y and z and for sake of simplicity i'm going to just stick with those as the labels so we're going to say um, we're going to have um, three axes for three-dimensional space. So in uh, 3D um, space, we would have uh, three axes, and that would be X, Y, and Z. Now, you might say, well, that, yeah, obviously, that's completely obvious, right? In 3D graphics and stuff, you have a point in 3D graphics, it needs to have a X component and a Y component and a Z component. Yeah, sure. I mean, when are you going to tell me something interesting? I'm trying to keep it so that this is for the layman and people who haven't done that kind of, what would you call it? What part of mathematics would it be? It would be, you know, drawing, drawing, drawing anything on a kind of 3D chart and stuff. It like, some people would not know this stuff. Right, so for the sake of them, even if you know this, this is this is kind of getting them. I mean, I could have made it worse. I could have started off with X, Y, and just had things like a kind of diagram that they might have at work, where there is a an X coordinate, the horizontal, and there's a Y coordinate, right, and everything's on a flat plane. But then I'm jumping ahead of that, and I'm saying no, we're going to consider you know, going ahead into the camera, and that is thing going off the the page into the the, the view so 
you know, if you have that and you have some drawing on here, right, and then you say, right, something stuck out of there, that thing would be Z, right? And so this would effectively be like the movie Avatar, where you're kind of wearing your glasses and it's kind of like, wow, you know, it's all coming at me, right? That would be the thing coming at you would be Z, right? And in computer graphics, it's generally the case that the way you set up your data structure to draw computer graphics, and I've done this when I've made games, is you set up so that the Z um, axis is the one that is the one that's like thrusting out at the player. Now, what happens if there was uh, a fourth dimension? Well, that one will go off and say, well, there's no letters after Z, so we're a bit fucked, right? But we could put it before X, so we could call it W, so it's W, X, Y, Z. So in 4D space, we have four axes, and they are going to be W and X and Y and Z, right? Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we're not dealing with Euclidean space. It is non-Euclidean space. And you might say, I don't know what I'm talking about now. What is non-Euclidean space. Euclidean space will be, you have your space and then it has ruler on it. And this is gonna be the ruler, right? The stripy bit of the tie. So this underlying bit that's there is gonna be the space. And then the thing that is on top of it, um, it's not high enough, is it? I'm gonna to have to do this. So, the dark part there would be space. Is it on camera? The dark part there is on is space, right? And then the stripe part is going to be um, a measurement. And all of these are going to be even divisions, like you know, inches or something, right, on a ruler. And because it's on this book, it's all saying flat. Well, that's not really that flat. Um, but you get the general idea. This is supposed to be flat, and that is going to be um, there. And that's going to be your ruler on space, where the space is Euclidean, and it's all well-behaved. That would be a Minkowski manifold from Hermann Minkowski, and that would be uh, what Einstein would have before he added in space, and before he added in time, would be uh, a space that would be a geometrical space that you would have where um, it would be flat space, right? So this has got the book and that makes it be a flat space and that would be what he would be using as a basis of a geometry for special relativity, but he would, by the time he got special relativity uh, going, he would have uh, time added to the, the space that you already had. So you'd have three spatial dimensions and then he'd add in a temporal dimension, all right? So that would get you to special relativity. So that would be, if that had time in it as well, that would be a description of special relativity, but we're not doing time. And Eric Weinstein takes about more than an hour into the lecture to get to talking about time, right? because there's so much more he has to do before he can go off and recover space time from everything else that he's doing. So he's starting off with what I would call is a primitive um, abstract space of called X4, where it has four spatial dimensions. And it is of certain type of geometry that's based on the work of Bernard Riemann. And the work of Bernard Riemann is like, oh, well, we could have space not be flat. Um, so it's different from Minkowski. And 
Minkowski is it's flat, and in Bird Agreement, it can be curved. So in the case of it being curved, we're now dealing with something a bit more sophisticated, and it's like that, right? Where the ruler is now going, um, is it on camera? The ruler is now going around. So that there is like the tangents that you would take on this to measure things. The tangents that you take to take to measure things are going to be um, right on camera. The tangents that you would take to measure things are going to be um, all on this surface, but you don't want to be using a ruler. Like he talks about a ruler, and and that he talks about rulers and protractors, and I find that very misleading because this is like a ruler, but. If you have a ruler on a curved surface, what do you do when it comes to the curve? It's useless. It can't cope with the curve. So what you want is not to talk about a ruler, but you want to talk about a tape measure. And so a tape measure would allow it to cope with the it tracking along with whatever the curve was at every point. So these are all even stripes, and the even stripes allow you to measure, say from that point there, that dark stripe, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on, right? And so you'd have that measure from point to point along this thing that was curved. And that would be really, really useful. You kind of need that uh, gadget to measure things um, within the geometry of a squished space-time, a curved space-time, as it's often referred to. And we haven't got to the curved space-time because we haven't put in the time. But if it's just a, a curved or deformed four-dimensional space, then we will need to have a a tape measure that can cope with things that are going to be undulating and uh, that's that's very important so he shouldn't be using the word ruler because that gives us a sense of it being like this and it not being flexible a flexible ruler would be a tape measure and it allows us to measure distances over an undulating surface okay so the, the undulating surface is what's called a non-Euclidean space. And um, I think it, what would be quite interesting would be to say, let's look at a video game that has a non-Euclidean space in it to get a feel for what that might be like, because I think I can find this. Um, I think there's a couple of examples here. Um, um, let's see how we are with this.
Vai. This is all joined by MC Escher as well. It's interesting. I see. It's, it's, it's portals. <laughs> I can't do it in unity, it's too hard. Oh my god, poor Byatt Bastard, he had to make his own rendering engine in OpenGL. What, you could build the Azure stuff inside of this in VR, could you really? It'd be cool if you could build the Asher stuff inside of this. You probably could, actually. Um, oh, that's quite good. So that I'm going to put in the comments. So that is, um, this is non uh, Euclidean worlds engine. Now, the reason I'm putting that in here is that this isn't, strictly speaking, the same type of thing that's going on with these, you know, four dimensional spaces. Um, um, that's like doing stuff with portals. Um, you might say, um, I see it as another example, but it's kind of like giving you a feel for like that was like the first example going through a tunnel and it taking you somewhere that was a short tunnel that takes you to a long distance with like a wormhole. Uh, have a look at this one. Um, Non-Euclidean geometries.
Hmm. You're going to go in the blue one. Okay, well, I'm not sure that I can see how that relates to things that much. Um, but I'm going to put it in anyway as a thing that people can look at. Maybe it will give people um, intuitions into things. Um it's basically things that aren't behaving like straight lines. Um, look at this last one. Okay, moving into dimensions. Okay, and that repeats itself. Um, asteroids had a wraparound map, yep. Go off one side, come on the other side. And then asteroids, you fly off one side of the screen, come on the bottom mark screen. All right, so you, yes, you yeah. Okay. If you're centered on the player character, then what would be close to them? Is that more like Zelda? I suppose it might be. Well, I think Zelda, you move around a bit in the middle and then you get to a box and then it starts scrolling in from the box. No, that's too fast. How did you get to that? Okay, so what we, but maybe it's not the world that repeats, but the world is simply wrapped in a cylinder. Right. Um, I think I understand. So you go around the cylinder and you end up back to the same place again. So it's like a it's like a space loop, kind of like a time loop. And if I kept going that way, I mean, if I keep going that way, I'm going east, and eventually I'll come in from here, west, because the Earth is a sphere. So um, it's just like on you you're on the inside rather than on the outside. Gotcha. So we wrap it up, and what's happened there? I see what they've done. Rather than it all being folded out, they've taken that and they're saying, well, we're going to bring all of those repeated patterns of the map, and we'll bring them all back to be optimized so that we only have one circuit of all the map that's original, 
and then it goes from being this and replicated until it goes back to this and it's just like this is all original stuff and we don't have repeats okay gotcha and now we can fly along it but it's still going to be repeated in the other dimension So you might want to wrap it the other way around as well and then make it, I suppose it would be a donut then, wouldn't it? So if you had enough content, you could put it on the surface of a donut and then keep going and have an infinite map where you could go one way and the other way all the way around. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Right, so the space is not all the same size. It's, the space is an uneven um, um, amount of size.
geodesics. the shortest route. We can also do as follows. First, go upwards to make the vertical distances shorter. Then, go back to the plane close to the point C. Then, descend below the plane to make the horizontal distances shorter and go back to the plane to our target. This path is shorter, but it can be still improved. The idea is the same, but we do it more smoothly, without sharp bends. This is the reason why our geodesic oscillates between going up and down. Of course, for points further away, it is better to move up and down just once. The geodesics are only locally shortest. Now, here is a solution which wraps both the X and Y coordinates. It's similar to our Euclidean donuts, However, donuts are not homogeneous. The inner circle is shorter than the outer circle, which may feel unnatural to us. We can solve it by using spherical geometry instead. This construction is called the clipboard torus. Behold the usual weird effects of spherical geometry, such as going past objects and then seeing the same objects in front of you. Well, it is probably time to wrap up this episode. But, of course, there are more ways to embed the Euclidean plane or cylinder in various geometries. We could also immerse not only the Euclidean plane, but also a spherical or hyperbolic plane. As a teaser, here are some embeddings. If you want to play with them by yourself, see the links in the description. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day. Right, well, um, that's very hard to follow. Um, I'm going to post that in again, as this one, another link. Um, I'm not sure how much help these videos are to the topic, but I thought I'd let them play out. I'm very new to the whole thing of general relativity. I know that they have stuff like, you know, what happens in the, um, I think it's called the Tesseract in the film Interstellar, with Matthew McConaughey. Um, that's a sort of similar sort of space. So um, in the sense that it's kind of a repeating kind of, you know, it's in there with a bookcase and it's like four dimensional view of that. And I'm not gonna show a clip of that because I could get a copyright strike from what would it be, Warner Brothers. So I'm not doing that now. Um, so I was covering this thing and I was saying that we have, in four dimensional space, we have four axes and then no time, right? And then we have, there are gonna be angles between all of, all of those axes. Now in a, Euclidean space, the, the angles between the axes are always going to be 90 degrees. Um, angle there, right? There's angle there, angle there, and angle there. Now, these angles in a Euclidean space where you can have like a arrow, which would be called a vector within that coordinate space, that um, is all well understood. Everyone's probably done it at school if they've done any um, high school math or they're familiar with it in like video games because most video games like Call of Duty, any video games are using a kind of Euclidean space and all the vectors that are in there are like, you know, you fire an arrow in Tomb Raider and the arrow is like a, 
thing that looks like an arrow and it flies in a certain direction and it goes through the space. Um, okay. You can have it so that these angles don't necessarily stay 90 degrees and you can do this. So in a lot of the examples in the things of the three videos I showed, the corners of objects that should be like square weren't staying square and were going kind of squished. And then you can have it so that you have the opposite and you can say, what happens if these go wider than 90 degrees and then they end up splayed, right? So they can be splayed or they can be squished and sometimes they can be, you know, orthogonal, right? 90 degrees. So uh, the, Euclid, the non-Euclidean case will include the 90 degree case as well as all the other cases of it being splayed and squished. And so, um, um, non-Euclidean geometry is also, is not, is not merely axes at 90 degree angles but um, greater and lesser angles so splayed and squished right so hopefully that's clear and we need to have a way of measuring those angles. So if we have our base and we have a ruler on, on, on there, but it's a tape measure, right? And we want to be able to have it so that this surface that is this thing here has a way of it being measured uh, where the, this isn't just, that dimension and that dimension are at right angles to each other. But when it goes into being like, you know, kind of dip, the, the part where it's going into a dip will start to go from that into that. Yeah. So like if we look at the, um, I think it was here this we will look at that you can see that on the outside things are things are like more or less square and the angles here are kind of staying that's like largely at 90 degrees in deep space as we get to the gravitational thing the, the mass it's making everything curve and bow in and so that isn't that the lines would be bowed, it's that there would obviously be more lines and each of those straight lines would all each need their cube to be at angles where the angles that made up the corner of the cube would all be not at 90 degrees in order to go off and um, have that um, bow like that, right? So that's what you're dealing with it's a bit more obvious to see when you're looking at it like that than it is when you're dealing with this because you can't see this in 3d so it's like i don't know if i look at it like that and then i said that's horizontal and then i let it sag um i let it, I let it sag like that then that then means that the the framing when it was like directly perpendicular uh, when it goes like that, it's going to then end up not like that. And it goes goes from being everything off this is going to be um, happening in, in perpendicular lines and then it bows in and it's all going to start. Um, it's the wrong way around, isn't it? It will be cubes are all going to be bending at the top they're going to be like that 
And as I bend it in like that, they're going to be going in um, very hard to do. These two things are parallel, and then they go into being angled when they get weird like that, I think. So anyway, so that's roughly what we're dealing with there. I might be able to do a drawing. Um, let's have a look. Where's my this? So if we have two situations, we've got black pencil, black paintbrush. And we're going to go, we're going to draw um horizontal thing. And this is going to be our Euclidean space. That's going to be Euclidean. And then we're going to go um, we can see how we can kind of construct why did it not change color? I changed the color. I went and said I wanted that color. Right, we're going to do that. And then we're going to have a box there. And that's going to go back like that. And that's going to be like that. That's not available at all. Hold on. We want that further back there. And that like that. And that coming up in perspective this way. And that going down like that. And that's too much. So we're going to have to raise this bit here. So you obviously can go and fit a box in there like that and this needs to have a line at the back as well and that will be your although that does throw you off in reading it because you can read this back face as the front face so I'll, I'll get rid of it like that so that's a bit more obvious what's going on there and so all of those angles inside of that space of that sub cube of this um, surface are now going to be um, at 90 degrees to each other. And now if we were to go and draw this and have it be um, curved, that's going to make things different, isn't it? So let's do that now. I need to have it be black. We'll get some black. Then we're going to get this. And we're going to draw this over here. We're going to do it as simple as possible. only having it vary in one direction like the scarf and so now um, if you put a box on it well I'll put two boxes on it I'll put one there and that will be at that point there and then these are the lines that are going to be no wrong place these are going to be running in perspective here like that I could probably put one further up this way but I don't know that I need it do I need it I'll put one to the left So this is showing in perspective where the dots are on the surface and then we're going to construct boxes on top 
Um, we're going to get the color from the other blue that we've already used. And then we're going to draw the box up. This is going to be a different size box because that's wider there than this is. But we're going to start with one that's kind of similar size and we're not going to change the that length. We can have it be the same as the height. So that height there, that's going to be a reasonable diagonal there. But the problem is we can't have that here. That can't be the case because that is not that's perpendicular there, right? That's perpendicular to the base, but this is not perpendicular to the base. So what we're going to have to do is redraw that line. So we're going to go rather Now, I'm not even sure that this is correct, so I'm going to get rid of it. But we can say at least that the first line that's perpendicular is okay, because this is flat, and it's the same as this line here that's flat, right? And it's just, just a, like a tangent to that space. So what we're looking at doing here is making things that are tangents to the space. So we have that, and we're drawing a tangent up from it. And because we're not looking at the space squishing the other way, only doing it in the curve of the scarf, it's going to be the same length line as that is. Certainly, so it's a little bit longer like that. Then um, we'll draw a line between these two lines. Now, this could be bowed. But we're not going to do that because it will. If we were going to do it more like it is in the shape of this um, here, it bowed because it's like um, not showing lots and lots of grids inside of grids inside of grids in this space, right? So what we're looking for here is. Uh, we're looking for something whereby we can. That's kind of gone wrong. Um, that we're looking for something whereby we can draw this so that it's not curved, and it is an approximation of this. So um, we'll move that over. We'll see both at the same time. And although <laughs> I wanted to, we're going to have to do this, aren't we? We're going to have to move that over like that. All right, that's all right. Now, don't need to show that. We're going to do this and we're going to do that as a perpendicular to that line as if that was straight so to help with this i'm going to rotate that with the rotation tool so that that's now horizontal and now i'm going to draw up from that horizontal like that and I'm looking for this to be the same height here. Like that, All right? And then similarly, I'm going to do it the other way to make that be, that's pretty well straight along with that being straight. So now I'm going to go up from there. And then that is going to have to be like that. Now, these four dots that are the back, those are going to be for joining to this point here to make the cube. And that one there, 
to make that cube there and that one there to make that cube that wrong to make that cube there a bit more straight and then that one there is basically behind it and then join these which is basically a straight line and then here as it goes that i'll do that again as it goes up we can do that again do that again do that again do that again wrong angle i'm going to do it with this help help me out with this i want those two dots to be horizontal do this go between them right those that one on the right is slightly higher than the other one I didn't realize. Do it again. There. Okay. So um, this will need to construct the back side of this uh, thing, and that's going to be. Um, where we are with this so um that's gonna have to be at that point of the curve running through here where that point on that curve is going to be the tangent so that's going to draw that vertically there uh i will probably have it be that long Okay, that's looking quite good. And then we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do that. Um, there, I think. This is not very straight. It's much easier to draw horizontal than vertical lines. Now, these lines, because it's in perspective, I'm drawing them shorter than the lines um, in front. So this is the front of the cube. The back of the cube is going to be shorter. And then I'm going to draw a line connecting that line to that line. And then I'm going to do this. And so we're going to have that one. Those two should be easy because they're flat. So that one's going to go up directly there. And it's about yeah. there. And that one there is going to be also the same. It's all in line with this. That's too far over. Go from this if I want to line it up slightly like that but it'll do and then we'll go across right okay now we now need to draw lines from the front port there back into this that's what you wouldn't need to see because it would be lining up with itself and that would be like that and that would be from there to there right and that's just with the stuff that's in front and not with the stuff that is in, in the background right this is just um this main thing that is um this thing that's going this way that's got these cubes off it right 
So we do that, we zoom out and bring that over, zoom out. And we will make that whole thing take up the whole screen because I think we need space for the purpose of the live stream. I can't have it share the screen with the other image. I'm going to have that bigger. So um, the cubes are. Uh, what I've gone and done is I've made it. No, that would be the case. Here, the area of this, if I look at this and I look at, like, say, the area, and I do the area of this, that is the same as the, the base, isn't it? Because it's a cube, right? The top of the cube and the bottom of the cube are going to be the same area. And then over here, the area of the top of the cube here Could do that better actually. I'll do that. I'll zoom in and do it better. That area here, I'll just fill that in because that is the actual area. It's not got a lot of space because it's squished because it's, it's got to fit in with the other thing. That's next to it, it's shouldering in next to it. In fact, what, what I'll do is I will do the one that's caught between the two. So that line there, that would be the corner of that. And right, okay, oh, that's too much. Now I've really got to do all of that. Drat. Okay. If I let go, I can't get an undo mid brush stroke, you see, so I have to let go periodically. Okay, so there we are, that area there compared to the area of the base, which is B, down the bottom. We'll do it in a different color. The area of the base is going to be essentially like this. You see how much that is less between the orange and the yellow. So this this is getting squished. This is literally squished here. And um, That's what you're getting, and that's what's happening over here. And all the stuff that's going close to the thing is all getting squished. As it's as you get this curvature, um, it's having to compress. And that's just compressing in one dimension. So it's. Um, here on the outside surface of this, the measure between these things is going to stay more or less the same. I know I've drawn this 
one on the left. I've made it too narrow. The distance, um, if you think about the distance of, say, that one, that one is not a very good metric because you're not measuring in a straight line with a ruler. So that, the idea of the ruler already breaks down. You want to have a ruler that can cope with going around corners. So you need a ruler that can do that, which will be from that point there to there and there to there. In fact, it needs a little bit further on than that. So that's the first arrow. And the second arrow will be, well, it wouldn't be, no, it's going to be wider out there as it is. I've drawn that wrong because it's not going to be far out that far. It's going to, that's going to mean it get wider and wider apart. It's going to be literally along the line, isn't it? And then it's going to be another one measuring this around this curve like that. So that's going to be your measures. Now, both of these purple lines, I know they're going around in a curve. You can kind of see that they're about the same length in terms of the distance traveled. And if you want a more persuasive way of seeing that, you could sort of put another color on top, which would be halve them and then halve them again and um and then make another color and then the green and then have that be um in between all of those one at the back so let me tip there back there Right, there should have been a red dot there. But anyway, I think it's option to get uh, out, alt. Should be a red dot there, and a red dot there, and a red dot there. And there should be a green dot there, there, like that. That's in the wrong place, so. It should be a green dot there. Okay, so here we've got um, kind of, they look like the joker colors, um, purple and green. But anyway, these are our measures, which are the whole thing, that part and that part, all the things that you use to measure it would be your tape measure. And um, this here, that you wouldn't be using because it's not suitable, um, that one would be your ruler. So the ruler isn't any good for this purpose. And you can see it's even worse when you extend it because it's not, it's not capturing the, the thing. So the tape measure is tracking the um, the shape as it goes around the corner. So as the scarf is going around the curve, the marks on the you know the stripy bit is measuring the bottom part as that bends like that. Okay. So if you're doing it and you're adding in more than just a flat dimension, you're making it into space. The thing is that happens to the top part is that that part, these areas are gonna get squished together because the base thing is gonna stay all regular squares, but the this is gonna be like over here, uh, we'll zoom out, it's easier. So this part on the left is gonna have a regular square with the, with the top part is the same size as the top part of the box is the same as the bottom part of the box. But if you're over on the right, um, 
you're going to end up with it being um, squished where the top part of the box in orange is different in, in size and area from the bottom part of the box, which is on the surface that is uh, curved. And um, here the measures are going to be equivalent but um, if we're measuring this, um, that, in fact, I've gone and drawn that wrong because the top part of the box is not actually there. That's at the back. So that needs to be extended. So we're going to do that better. It gets a little bit bigger. Hold on. I just realized I have drawn inside the wrong blue blue lines so there's that and then there's this okay that's better that's correct now you can still see that this top area is um smaller in area than this area here and if you were to project it down it would kind of be about and we're forgetting about the perspective because the perspective is just, it's there, but it's not really the area. It's kind of like that. It's, it's shrinking down by that much. That's that edge that's on there. And that's how much the thing is on the, on the base. Um, so that's making quite a big difference to it by kind of having these things. And you can think of these things kind of like cubes of jello, and they're being pushed together as they get pressed together. Um, and they are they're okay at the outside where they, the curve is not really affecting them very much, but as they curve together here they are um the top part is is where they, they are most being deformed right okay now this here is an example of um a non-euclidean uh, geometry and so um i better title this um we don't want that font. That's going to be in the layers, and then we need to paste that again. I'm going to just say Euclidean. Oh, we're going to have to ask, type in the whole thing. Hasn't remembered the thing for the last time. Okay, then. Um, image window. Show me the layer editor. Where is it? There it is. And then we're going to do that. Then we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Then we're going to move the layer a little bit lower. We're going to put that to be rotate layer. And then we're going to take that and we're going to copy the layer. Um, what do we copy layer? Can we add layer? Duplicate layer. This layer, and then we've got two of these, and we take that one, and we drag that over there, there, and we move this one onto that, 
and then we render those, we render everything. Edit text there, rasterize text there, rasterize text there, merge all, and then <laughs> that's not really lined up, it doesn't really matter. We then go off and take away, uh, where is it, the tool? Oh, here we are. It's all the way over there for some strange reason. Um, right. This is, we need to have the lasso. We lasso this. And then we cut it. There we go. That's that done. And then we can lasso that. And then we go and we cut that. And we paste that. And then we move that to be more where we want it. So there we go. So that's our illustration of um, two spaces, Euclidean and non-Euclidean space, um, and the differences in area for here. And mm, that took a lot longer than I wanted it to, but it's done now. So. We will now file that away, save as. I don't really know why I'm filing it away because it's not like I'm going to be using it again after today. Um, Euclidean and non Euclidean. Okay, uh, we've done that. Didn't know there were any layers to merge. Okay, we're going to close that off. We might need it again later, but we're going to close it for now. So where were we? We were, um, we were dealing with manifolds. We were dealing with various people like, uh, I mean, this applies to both of these guys. Uh, Charles Ellisman and Bernard Riemann. Both of these are dealing with curvature. Okay. So um, when you have Einstein, he's dealing with curvature uh, in his general relativity. We're dealing with curvature equations when we're dealing with um, geometry based on both of these things. And so geometric unity is an attempt to get these two geometries to work together because this one, Erismanian geometry, is underlies um, quantum field theory, and this one underlies general relativity, right? So the way you would get a unified field theory in terms of geometry would be to say, well, look, we've got two kinds of theories that are both geometric, uh, at heart, at their base, you know, the quantum field theory is geometric, general relativity is geometric, maybe there's a way of harmonizing them, and this is why in my thumbnail, I construct this thing where it is the um, Erismanian um, thing at the top here, Y, M, and that is this is the space in which you have the geometry of Charles Erisman, and then that has the um, that is grown out of the geometry of Bernard Riemann. And the thing in the middle, so you could be might be looking at for all this time, thinking, I don't know what that does, what that is. That is um, the um, That is the Roman uh, mythological creature, which is a hybrid of a um, lion and a snake. And so this at the front is a lion and this at the back is a snake. And this suits this concept of it being one type of thing, one end, quantum field theory, and being uh, uh, space time eventually at the other end and um, this is called the chimera so um, 
and this itchy this actual thing although he doesn't reference it and he doesn't have a picture of it in his paper i think this better represents and as a, like a mascot for geometric unity than say things like drawing hands would do so drawing hands will be found i mean that's quite good but only for general relativity then you go off and say what about um geometric unity and you might say well there's that shape he has of the hot vibration uh well i'm sorry but the hot vibration is not actually i haven't got it on screen for some reason the hot vibration is not the one he's actually doing in his uh thing because the vibration he's doing is uh a chimeric uh fiber bundle it is a fiber bundle the hot vibration is a fiber bundle but it's not this particular it's not the hot vibration he's doing so those illustrations on those videos the reason why they're there is because those things that hot vibration have been around since the 1950s and people had gotten around to uh, rendering it and doing animations of it and stuff and so no one's done um an image of the um kind of fiber bundle other than me and it's very very bad all right <laughs> because what it is is it's like y refers to the eris manian thing so we've got y there right so we see y and that will be in purple and that's the purple that is from the thing that we had on the previous page so let's we we go to that we will find that image here and we will make it a lot smaller and bring this down the side up oh, wrong way i don't know if we might need to make it smaller still um and we want to put that on top of this and we want to have this off in the corner here and shrink this down and that'll be all right like that so right we've got the this is the way it appears in the thumbnail on some of my videos like geometric the geometric unity explained in under two minutes that video has got this thumbnail and we have xd which could be taken to be d equals four and then that will make it so that the unrestricted set of dimensional measures for that will be d squared plus um 3d divided by 2 which in this case would make it 14 and i'm going to get to how you calculate it in a minute but i just wanted to explain that this isn't the end of the story having got to 14 because then you have to do all sorts of clever things like complexify it and then um, um, construct a structure group um, and then take that the complex triad structure group and decompose that and then from there uh, have a split signature metric so that this isn't um, 14 comma uh, a set of complex numbers it will be uh, 7 7 with seven time dimensions and seven space dimensions and then i mean this this went like later on this is like the whole thing has already been resolved and you've, you've recovered space time and space time here is split as well and that gets the lorentzian metric of one comma three all of this is going to get explained over the course of the next few hours right how all of this works but i'm just giving you an overview right now way ahead of when it would be appropriate to say what is this thing like why the fuck have i put this in here well he calls it the chimeric fiber bundle c and this is c here so c has as a parameter y 
okay y is grown out of x4 y then ends up after a whole bunch of more math turning into y77 in the, in the case of x4 we still at this point don't have x13 that's not even in the conversation we just got this group but how do we build the group we'll build the group out of say we want the frame bundle fr of the climate fiber bundle y77 okay and this red tilde over the top of this stands for um the double cover so we're asking for the double cover of the frame bundle of the climate fiber bundle of um y77 now i think if you do that it's getting closer to being correct but actually 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 this is kind of wrong because there's more to it than that and i have written it out somewhere else in another video where it got super complicated what this whole thing should be but this is as far as i got when i did the thumbnail so i've actually progressed further with my understanding than this uh okay well this goes this is close to being correct this goes into a group and then the group's called g uh change from h as it was in the paper and then that is that's going to be um h was the horizontal vector space and then g is named the group um the group that is part of p where p is a principal fiber bundle um yeah and then the principal fiber bundle p is this yellow stuff that's all throughout this and i think the best thing to do here is that the chimeric stuff is also in here and uh, okay look, let's just this is going to be inexact because it's like some of the math here is isn't complete the up to scratch but when you see how complicated it is you'll know why i'm doing what i'm doing because look, look i'll show you i'll show you i'll show you i will show you we will go here and then we'll take this off here over to that page where all the graphics are come on where is it this okay so we're looking at this and i'm going to say i want to see the frame bundle so the frame bundle will be hmm, this the main principal bundle okay this page here and it will say um this and this is going to be difficult for me to draw put on the screen because if i zoom in it's going to end up all the way over there so what i have to do is i'll have to move this under this so you can see that part of it there right and then this is going to zoom in um, with this so um the main principal bundle uh this is page uh 24 and we'll post this um into the chat so that you can look at this yourself and um and this is very early and this is too early to be looking at it but we're going to look at it nonetheless so that we have some sense of like what is it that we're trying to do because you can get lost in all of this and it is that we're trying to recover space time 
x13, which is this thing which I've written there, x13 there. We're trying to recover that from a group which is represented by the principal fiber bundle on G. Okay, G is a group. And it's like, I don't, I don't understand what you mean. You're thinking, okay, let's look at the whole page and read what it says. So we're going, uh, we're going to have to have that further over that way. Okay. So we have this whole page here and we read it. Everything in section 3.6. So we have always found the Byzantine intricacies of Clifford algebras confusing and an attempt to recollect the various containments just discussed is offered here. Now, Clifford algebras are a mathematical set of tools that allows you to manipulate all manner of interesting things that would ordinarily not be associated with, that, with each other, um, which is the kind of thing you need to build this kind of stuff, all right? And um, this, um, if I go back a little bit to page 22, you'll see that in equation 3.20, uh, this one here, there's this, and um, that is, uh, it says, um, <clears throat> that is the, the, <clears throat> I'm getting so far ahead of myself. <clears throat> it's, not, it's not that I can't explain it. It's like that I, I... Every time I see something, I think, oh, I can say this about it. And I'm not allowing myself time to get to the point. So... And this bit of math here is wrong. And... The bit that it refers to is this 3.32. So it says, our main object of focus will be taken to be P of H, P, F, R, C, 7, 7, cross, um, row D. Right, and of H, and you look at that and you're thinking, wait a second, what do you mean by H? And he says, well, on the previous line, he says, H is equal to U6464, and he says, um, for the rest of this exposition, we will let row of subscript Dirac equals row of D. And it's like, okay, um, that makes it a bit more cryptic. So where it says, uh, where it says that, it just means row Dirac. Um, and that's defined by spin seven, seven, which is actually what you want to get to for your Y seven, seven, right? That is included, that arrow means it sits within the wider group of the structure group or the gauge group of U6464, okay? And that's correct. And if you look at the uh, diagram uh, here, we get this, right? So Y77 is inside of this at the top here, where it says U6464, um, and it has dollar and C, where C is the uh, chimeric fiber bundle. So this is a much more terse summary of the whole thing. So um, it's saying that once you've recovered space time, X1 through at the bottom there, um, had made 
uh, through its use of a, um, the unrestricted set of dimensional measures uh, that is the metric of x13, the space which is ba based on the, the geometry of Charles Erisman, which is y77. But it, it doesn't do it directly like that. It 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 gets that from um, this other process from getting other mathematics, and it gets that from the group because um, that is initially fourteen um, complex numbers, and then that then gets you the group, which is u one hundred twenty eight um double strut c so it's all uh, it's all i mean it's like an hour of explanation to get from x4 to there to there if not more and then um but there's an elaboration and this is a simplification of the elaboration which is this is not even quite right and i'll show you why it's not quite right and i was trying i was struggling with this the other day and i i kind of got frustrated with it and gave up um and i thought this slide was actually showing it correctly and then i realized it wasn't because if you compare it to the notes it's missing out on the um, the cross of this, but this is wrong. This is actually wrong. So I can say it's wrong because he says it's wrong. If you highlight that there, it says a footnote four, and you look at the footnote four down here, and it says here, note the symbol H is being used to denote two different objects a group which is how, it, how it's being used here and a horizontal vector space now i take the view that you don't want it to be used uh, for a group at the expense of it being used to mean h equals the horizontal vector space you want that to be as obvious and monomic as it can be so because I don't want to change H from being the horizontal vector space, I have to think of another letter for the group to be. And I checked his paper and, and he has a G, but it's not a G that's in Roman typeface, it's a script G. So I'm using a Roman G and modifying it so that rather than it saying P of H, it would now say P of italic G right um and the script g we can find it somewhere where that is um oh well it doesn't matter it doesn't matter uh, i get distracted very easily so this is there's so much that you can say about all of this all the time and you just look at any one thing and you have commentary on all of it because it is a reaction this this isn't an organized uh structured scripted um oh and i've lost my my video feed have i we ready let's have a look no it's all still going um but this thing here where he's done that so he's made a mistake by writing I mean, maybe we could do it right now and we could do a better job of it than he's got there. So let's see. We'll do that there. That's provisional. Then we need to have where we want about it in the paper. Well, not, not in the paper, in the transcript, in the video. So we need to have the video. Um, and the video will be this. And this is a part of the video where he has it in a in the supplementary slide explainer, which is how it was in 2020. And we're going to do that. And we're going to bring that out. And we're going to take that out of here and put that there. 
And then we're going to have this further up the screen this way. And have this further down the screen this way. This will all be worth doing later. Because it will look like I know what I'm doing. And anyone who tunes in later will be like, oh, that all makes it make more sense. It'll be like, well, it didn't make sense at, what was it, two o'clock in the afternoon. But it, it will make sense later. So this bit here is too simple. The bit that I had over here that was, where was it? It was, I think it was here. This one here, that is, um, that bit there is, again, wrong and too simple. So we're looking to do something that isn't wrong and is correct. So, it's got to be a hybrid of all of these notations because, well, it does. So, at the bottom down there, he has, um, we look at that to begin with. This is 2020. And we'll go back to this. And we'll go forward a bit. Okay, now I make that bigger. I'm going to scroll that up. We can't scroll that up. Hold on. We just want to have this bar. Can I not cut that off? I suppose that's big enough to see. So I have that on top and make it smaller that way. Okay, that's not bad. Can I make this bigger so I can see it bigger? Yes, you can. All right, now I'm going to do a screen grab. Now I've got it over on my, and it's giving it to me on the wrong iPad. I don't know that it's going to let me even annotate it here, is it? I've never had it be that I work on this. Why has it gone and put it on this iPad rather than the other iPad? I want it on the one that actually works as a pencil. Is it the pencil's not charged? No, it's charged. So this is just, that's kind of stupid. Because I was going to annotate on there and look at the video on here, and it's going to pair it with the wrong, wrong thing. Can I tell it which one to send it to? Uh, what's this do? Google Chrome stop showing, no. Um, drat, do this, do this. Do this, iPad 3. Maybe that's gonna do it. And then we'll do it at the screen grab again. It's gonna be one of these iPads. That didn't do it. Okay. We're gonna do it again with our setup as it's got it's got it was working fine the other day. Um annotations on say iPad two. Put it on the wrong one. I think what I'm going to have to do is make it so it's less confusing for it and turn this one off. And then how can it get it wrong if there's only one to send it to? That didn't work. 
Okay, well, um, I will, um, let's see, Bluetooth off, on, Apple Pencil, Apple Pencil not connected. Connected. Now, um, that's not working. Oh, if this stays like this, it's going to be a pain in the neck because I won't be able to do any annotations of anything. Um, well, unless I take the screen grab and I go and take it into the paint box, which is the other option. But I don't want to have to do that. Um, I'll tell you what I could do. I'll try turning this off and on again, see if that helps. If I go back to what I think it should be, which is iPad 3, which is the one I bought third, The other ones are that one I, I T stores iPad. No, that's it won't that would be the oldest one. So this one will get out of this and they'll put this on again. And I'm doing the same thing I've been doing every time I've tried to react to this, where I spend hours like in preliminary stuff, and it's just not good enough. But um, offline, I'm on. I'm on. I'm back online. Live. 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 Okay, that's that's working. I've got audio, I've got picture. Now I need to see if I can draw on this. But it's good when it works. No. Why not? It should be putting the image here for me to draw. I've turned everything off and on other than the computer, and I'm not turning that off. <sighs> if it's going to be like that, I have no, I have no need for the other iPad because I only have that to monitor the stream in the event that this um, I was using this to draw with and I won't let me draw with it so that's that was working nice and it's now not working at all so it is a charged up um, pencil so I can't account for why it's not doing that now um, restarted the Bluetooth um, and I've turned it off and on again, and that one's off. It can't be sending it to a different iPad other than this. I've got a third one. I've got a phone, but it's not going to. It's not on the phone, is it? No, don't think so. Um, right, what we'll do is we will uh, crop this and we don't need quite so much. We just need a bit. And then we'll take that and we'll give ourselves a bit of space to work with. 
and we'll have the whole of that there and like that and we'll crop that like that and we'll save that and oh. this means everything's going to have to be done with this which is a pain in that because it's going to be harder for me to write everything in fact it's going to be a real nuisance because i handwriting mathematics with a mouse it's just like why but anyway um just add one more last go to see if it'll do it no didn't do it um so let's see i've got to go in the filing system i've got to go and get the document which is going to be the one that was cropped this one and then that's it and then i want to take that into the um the paint box here and i'm going to drag that in from this into here and then that we'll add a layer and do everything on top of the layer so um i don't know to what extent i can do it with the text maybe i can we're going to go fonts we're going to go 64 point we're going to go, um, well, we need to write something and highlight it. Then we're going to do sticks to math, 64 point regular. What? Two text. We're going to go, and it's going to be in, largely in italic. We're going to say italic. Medium italic. Semi-bold italic. Uh, medium italic. So that's that. And then we're going to write something um so this is going to be what it is so far and it's currently this ph equals p of um, fr with the tilde um the tilde uh, c 7,7 um, need that wider um, and that then cross well not that cross it needs to be the cross times that's going to be a problem I haven't got a cross operator on the keyboard have I I mean Unicode I might have it um i'd have to look into that uh, just a second um can i input unicode into this to then get unicode out of this so we're going to cross cost operator or vector operator out of vector vector or cost product I don't know whether it's circle times that's a proper way of referring to it or whether it's like tensor product or whether it's okay to just say um, the other one I had before. So if I go before, we have vector or cross product. And I don't know that that's quite the one he's using, but we're going to copy that and see if it will let us use it in the this and we put that in there so that worked which is good we still need this here for greek row greek lowercase rho and so that's the row symbol he's using there copy that and paste that in you can see there that kind of thing that looks like a sperm is kind of like the thing that he's using here in his document 
Um, there are other versions, though, we could probably go for. I would probably go with that one because it's more like the one that he has uh, in the supplementary slide explainer, which is this one here, right? That's the same symbol. Uh, so we won't have that one. It's overstyled, and that one's fine. And then we're going to have that, and then we're going to have Zad, and then we're going to see where we are with the rest of things, because that is where he is with equation 3.32. And then we're going to have the stuff that's inside the slide, where it's going to be P of U, it's going to be this, it's going to be uh, this here, P of U of um, all this much more complex stuff. So it's going to be P of U of dollar C, then it's two to the power of, and then it's D squared uh, plus 3D uh, divided by 4, uh, 4, um, and then that is also going to be cross row P, cross row Z. So we can copy that over to there, and that's essentially what he's got on that slide, and then uh, this here is that one, the frame bundle thing is probably need a little bit more room there and okay so where is he going wrong well he's going wrong because he's using h and he says here the symbol h is being used to denote two different objects right a group and a horizontal vector space i'd like h to mean horizontal vector space so that means i'm going to change h to be g right so rather than P of H here, it's going to be P of G as the final principle as the group thing. The thing about him defining it here, where it says uh, he wants to have the notation where H is equal to U6464, is it's wrong in two ways. One is it's wrong, which he admits it's wrong, with this thing where it says 4, and he says here, the symbol H is being used to denote two different objects. One is it's like, well, it should have not called it H here. But in this, the um, Dirac spinners here is being used against, and that's annotation that I haven't put in. Uh, I don't think I did. Did I put it in? D, I didn't, I forgot to put it in. That there. Uh, should have been D for the Dirac spinners. Okay, so he goes off and has that. Um, oh, wait, no, he doesn't say Z, he says H. So he says H here as well. And he says H earlier as being H is equal to U6464. 64, 64. And okay, now that's all right. So the thing is, is that H can't be the group. H has to be something else. So you look at this one over here that's in this um, here, and he's got Z. So it's like, well, what's going on here? Is this going to be the group? Because this is you, and you, when you do the math, this ends up being uh, 128 when D is 4. But then when it's decomposed, well, when it's complexified, it's 128 double struct C. So that's like a whole whole thing, right? So if we go off and say um, double struct C, that means complex numbers. We copy that in. That 
comes from U 128. It's 128 in the lecture, and it's 128 in the slides that match the lecture, but it's not 128 in terms of the fermionic field content that is a slide within the lecture, because it's actually that. Um, so that's wrong. Um, so it should be um, an arrow there, uh, uh, rightwards arrow. So there we're going to go that. We're going to put that in there like that. And that's going to be, that is included inside of that. Uh, as it is elsewhere in equation three point, I can't remember what it is offhand. It's either 3.19 or 3.20. Okay. So, um, right. So we've got all the bits we need, I think, except we need to change some things around because ZH, I think, is going to be wrong because it's going to be conflicting with the horizontal vector space. So we need a new name for that. We need a new name, which would be it there. Then he says up here at the top of the page, he says um, what, what uh, D is and how D is the Dirac. And I'd like that to just say Dirac and not be abbreviated. Problem with that is it shouldn't be in italics. That should not be in italics. So I'm going to just uh, probably um, put that in as a mental reminder to put that into Roman font later. Uh, and then all of that, that's going to go over that. That will have to be something else. And as he's using Z here, would it be all right to use Z here? And would it be right to say Z there? Or is that wrong? Because if he says C, Z, Z, C, C, 7, 7. Is it C, 7, 7? Because here he's saying that. But no, oh, wait a minute. There's something that's missing. There's a dollar sign. So the C of Z, 7, 7 is missing. If we rewrite it. It should be to be close to this. It should be this. It should be y seven seven, and then it should be dollar of that. Right. This is getting your. So this is getting a chimeric fiber bundle of the Erismanian manifold, which has been divided into seven dimensions of time and seven dimensions of space. Then when you do this, it's turning into a structure group, I think, and that's going to give you it as 64, 64. And you might say, how do I know that? Wait a second, I've gone and done something stupid. It's gone and wiped out everything I've written. I, I had it too much highlighted, did I? What did it say a second before? It said, I'd go back in the stream, couldn't I? And see what I'd written. Because we've got time trouble. Um, uh, I don't want to have to. <laughs> There's so much here. Hold on. Like this second. So PRFR. I haven't got a way of doing undo within the text field. Why not? And why did it disappear like that? Um, let's see. How's the start again? C seven comma seven cross that. So that's back to where that was. That there shouldn't be that because it's actually the chimeric fiber one of that. Right, and then that, if you look down there at the one with what looks like a B, that is 
this s of that the not the s of that the dollar of that so that would be that of that and then you look at the sum and it's going d squared plus 3d divided by 4 which is half of 14 which would mean that m whatever m is of y in this case it would be 7 it would be 7 now that would be it in matching with this thing that diagram there but we know that for it to be 64 64 it can't be oh wait a minute no it's got to be 2 to the power 7 so 2 to the power 7 there and that's going to be 128 uh but it's actually 128 double struck c and that would mean that it would be that mathematically speaking and then if you go off and say right we don't need to see the workings out because we're not doing it in this slide we're doing it inside of the text we can then go off and say right we're doing that and that will be equivalent and then you can say but actually we don't need to see all that because we're decomposing the Dirac spinner that's there into uh, wild spinners and so the wild spinners will be real numbers that will look like that and that will get us the thing we need where this is this is this that, that yeah yeah and so that will be that so where it says divided by four it's divided by two um really um to get to the m so so when it says um uh, that and then it's then divided by two um which you could do that with and then that would be that so so i've got two equations one of which sort of shows the workings out where c is hiding a whole bunch of stuff in the bottom right hand diagram c is actually operating on y and it doesn't even show that it does in the top one it does because i made it so it does and it says there it says here where p of tilde over fr is equal to c77 and i'm expanding it into being that the current fund bundle is the is the um what's on top of y i think that's fair and the 64 64 are going to be subscripts and that i think i can say yes to and um, where is it drawing on the screen where is it where is it drawing where is it drawing it? What happened to my what happened to my sketchbook? Where is it on the screen? I went to all that top. Where is it? Oh there it is. I see. Now we can have it be any size we please and we can have it be the same size as this we can have it this size um it might be an idea to have it bigger so we're going to have it bigger so we want the p to be the size that is here's um italic is more jaunty than my italic really i don't know if it's going to let me drag it all the way over can is it 
going to have a limitation. Maybe I can I'll do it with another P. I'll use this P. Um, I think I'm running into a problem with the size of the length of the thing. Why is it not letting me drag it around? That looks about roughly the same size, doesn't it? Every time I move it, it's going to have to re-render it. 107. It's probably having a fit over all the Unicode in it. That's not bad as a matching size. I, I mean, you could obsess over this thing. This should be taller, I think. Let's mow from 100%. What? 100%? Why is that 100%? Taller, hundred and ten. That looks a bit big. Um, hundred and that's okay. Now I just need to get this over to the right, so the whole thing's included on screen. Okay, now, um We'll put this the where there's a good place for it. There's practically no place I can write it. Um, but I want to see that. That's that. That's fine. And I want to be putting this. Um, I'll put it down. Because I've got it on a separate layer. I'm not stupid. Um, I'll put it on the white there. Um, all right. Okay. That'll be all right. That'll go there. And then it's going to get rendered. Rasterize. Text layer. Okay. Now, we need to, in this layer here, we need to go and do this. We need to go make a bigger brush and then we need to pick white, which is going to be, how would we do that? Do we go white and we're going to go underneath the whole thing like that. And that's not all that solid. But we're going to make it so it is solid. Right, so this is, this would be easy in LaTeX, but uh, the thing about doing it in LaTeX is, um, well, it wouldn't actually, it wouldn't be easy in LaTeX. It would just be like wrangling LaTeX then, and that would be the problem. So it's better to um, stick with this. Um, keep it simple. I could do the bigger brush. Take a forever to rub things out. Okay. So what I've got there is what looks like garbled nonsense. And I want to do something where I take this brush color and I take this and I pick a color here and my intention is to make this it's much smaller it's way, way too big oh that's the, that's the wrong thing how do I how do I make this smaller can I not make this smaller I don't want to change opacity I want to change size What's going on with this? Size, 
55, 50, 60, 32, 20. We are, you know, maybe smaller than that. There, that's all right. Okay. So what I want to do is this there, that bit there, is horrendous. And it's horrendous largely because of the bit that is way writes um that so that's his formula for coming up with things and that is written in terms of two to the power of that but then that is being applied to c and c is a chimeric fiber bundle and then he does a dollar sign of that and the dollar sign of that doesn't reveal what that does because well wait a second no that's misleading wait no wait that's okay the dollar sign of this that needs to have this yeah but it's not that it's that divided by that okay so when it's four there it's being divided by that again so of course the denominator is getting doubled in size and so we're getting a four rather than a two so we're going to be uh, looking at that being a four okay so the structure group um which I think is what that is. Um, and if it's wrong, or it's something else, well, I'm guessing here, but it's getting in the number of what looks to be the group. So if you put in D equals four, then when you're looking at what is Y and the metric for Y, then the metric for y is going to be um, d squared plus 3d divided by 2. And then you look at this and say, well, why is this being divided by 2 again? And it's like, well, that's what happens when you're trying to create something that is uh, spinners. And this symbol here is what's used for spinners and the way to do you do it is you say let's say you have a group that is y m then it's going to mean that the um let's do this again we're going to do that we're going to do xd and then we're going to say y m where m is equal to d squared plus uh, 3d divided by 2. And I will show you how to calculate that another way. And then we're going to do z. And then that is going to be z. And I would have another variable and I'd say z u. Um, where the u is equal to, um, well, okay, we have to go through like three different ways of doing this, all right? So the way that it would be consistent with this writing here, which is wrong, is to say we are going to... Um, We're going to go and we're going to say D. Um, we're going to go and take that result and it gives us M. And we're going to now say um, U is equal to 2 to the power of N. 
which is like incredibly simple, right? And then you're going to say n is equal to m divided by 2. Now, by making it like that, you don't get into any confusion where you say the size of the space in the group is 2 to the n over 2. Two, 2 to the size of the space divided by 2. And this happens in the interview between Eric and Sir Roger Penrose. And it led me to amend the transcript of that video because the transcript just had it in words and it wasn't clear what that what that was and when i worked out and checked books and it was like it should be effectively it should be size of the space is two brackets size of m divided by two That would be that would be the size of the space, and that would be the size of your group, you. There, so like if you're saying, okay, it, it, what kind of size quantum field theory are we dealing with? It's going to be a u of two to the power of m over two power, but it's not going to be u of two to the power of m where two is divided by two. Because that sounds just the same, doesn't it? If you say two to the power of two, two to the power of m over two, and two to the power of m over two, is like, well, which one do you mean? And so it's actually this one that you want, and not that one, okay? So when you verbalize it, it helps if you're talking to someone who already knows what you mean. But if no one has... People watching that episode of The Portal won't have known what it is and wouldn't have known from the transcript either. So when I saw the transcript was wrong, I said to the people running this place, is it all right if it gets... You know, you should change this. And they said, oh, well, you can change it. Uh, you know, so as if, like, anyone could edit it. And I thought, oh... That doesn't sound like a very good idea. If they if they keep it like that, the whole thing could get vandalized. But um, maybe they've got saves that they can regress to, you know, for edits like um, uh, Wikipedia. So hopefully it's um, like that. So anyway, um, that's the only change I've made to the portal transcripts. And that meant it was, I think I put in some parentheses or maybe I put it in the math. But anyway, it, I think it's different now than it was. Um, now, this um, thing of like writing it in all these steps with extra variables is what I've done when I've done it in my YouTube comments because you can't write something over something. You can't write, you know, you know, 3D divided by 2 uh, in a YouTube comment. Um, it doesn't work. You can't do the horizontal line, so um, that's a problem. So, um, uh, so where are we with this? We want to be able to hide that, <laughs> the power, the power, and then we want to add this in another thing, and we want to get ourselves white again um i want to get another brush for white it's going to give us that and we're going to do that and we're going to do that so hopefully this is starting to get a bit more obvious where all these numbers are coming from but i'm going to go over this multiple times I'm doing this partly for myself at the moment, so that I can, I am reacting to this rather than I am explaining this. I mean, that's what you've got to bear in mind. I'm not explaining this, I am reacting to this. And I'm seeing that there is 
a big confusion in the way that all of this information is presented and it's like yeah i think we can do better so um this stuff here on to the right is what would look like this if i formatted it and took the time to make it all like that so we could start there and that means i need to be on that layer and it means i need to do this and have this lasso be my main friend and then i need to zoom in on this area we're not interested in that we're interested on that part um over there and we'll start off with something simple so oh um d squared right so we're going to do a d squared so we're going to do that around the d i think i might have cut off part of the d i did we do that again um escape um we're gonna do i should have room to go between things on this right we we'll do that and we need it in the other one so we're going to do this twice and we're going to do that we'll cut it out then paste it back in and we're going to shrink it by about half about there then we're going to go there a little bit bigger now how is it on this that's okay and it should be about there and we're now back to this tool which we don't want and then we're going to be we've got a d squared now there's another d squared on the other side and we could do with that one being copied do we do it now zoom, zoom out the d squared is going to be oh we haven't got it on the other side because that math just works out this is the showing of how this is comes about and that one uses um that one uses seven seven so we won't worry about that that's interesting okay so now we've got 3d now the 3d the d squared times 3d over two that's what we're trying to do and so we need to have the tool again which we need to pick like that we're going to do that that's wrong there move that no that's just selection we need to actually do a cut oh okay we're not on the right layer we're on that layer so we need to be on this layer this is the thing is that it automatically changes layer and you don't want it to do that necessarily um most of the problems with computers are one thing and they are trying to be helpful by doing something you think you would want it to do, right? Um, and it's kind of like, I'm going to help you do this. And it's kind of like, can be boiled down into saying one word. And that word is Clippy. So the philosophy of Clippy isn't just confined to that thing in that operating system is it's actually rife everywhere and um we need to get to this and we need to get this also it doesn't remember what tool i had selected last so i keep on having to reselect it which is annoying and this is what program this is adobe sketchbook so you'd think that adobe would know how to make a thing right but they don't they don't now with this um we're gonna have to reselect this but we're gonna use this time we are gonna use a rectangular one so we're gonna go that there so we're gonna go cut paste 
So I'm going to put that there. Um, slightly longer than the D there. And then we're going to go and stretch it with this one. Uh, but it's too much now. So we do that. That's looking pretty damn good. The division line. And it's not encroaching on anything. And then we're going to take the two, which should be Roman two. So that needs to be done. All the numbers should be Roman rather than italic. But I can't be fucking bothered to do it properly. So um, we're just going to have to put up with the numbers being in italics because I can't be bothered. Oh, and again, we're on the wrong layer. So we're going to do that. Um, and we're going to do the two. So where's the two? The two, the two, the two. Um, I mean, for me to do the two, I'd need to do this. But the thing is, is it has forgotten what font I was using, and I have to so I have to remember to type in something for it to change. Because if I set the font, then I type, it goes back to what I was doing, and that's annoying. Um, we want this one, we want to have regular, yes, what size was it? I can't remember, 64, I think. If it just remembered it from last time, and then I changed it, that would be better, wouldn't it? Now, what's happened to this two? There it, wait, 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 wait. Where, where's it going to put this in my text? Layer 14, under here. That's a Roman 2. I want it on top of everything. So I want to move this layer up to the top layer. Where's it gone? Where's the text layer? Text layer, move it up to the top. There. It's going to have put it on the screen somewhere, but it won't be putting it here because that's where I'm working. I'm going to have to zoom out and find it, wherever it is that it is on the screen. And it's there mixed in with the text. Because obviously, obviously it would be there bang in the middle of the screen. And if it had decided to put it there, would I be able to find it? Hmm? Would I be able to find it? No, I wouldn't, because this is a dome, and we don't want to make things convenient by having it appear anywhere close to where your cursor is on screen, because that would be sensible. So it's there lurking in there, and we're going to have it... Oh, look, it's on white. I can see what I'm doing. So now this is going to get rasterized, and then it's going to get scaled down, and this is going to be D-squared. And I'm going to have, I'm going to need this twice. I'm going to need it here and need it here. And I'm going to need it that a third time. And I'm going to need it a fourth time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to need four times. I'm going to need four of these. Um... And we're going to just leave it like that. And then can we copy layer? Delete layer, add layer, duplicate layer. Right, it's duplicated it on top of itself, I think. And then this is going to be... Um, oh, uh, well, we've got two numbers that are going to be used for two which are probably both going to be too big. I don't know. I might, they might be too big. The number two is too big, isn't it? But I said I wanted it size 24. If I move it with the layer move, what happens? I've got two of these. That's too large, isn't it? It does look too large. I don't know why when I ask size 64, it's that big. 
and now if I scale it, it's easier to just do. If I scale it and duplicate it, would it be better to do it where I delete this and start again? Delete that, have that, scale this. So I go to so this scaling tool. There, it's, I think it's V, and I go there and I shrink that. Now I need this to be that same size of that three, but it's a bit hard to tell because everything is um, it doesn't scale to a corner, it scales centrally. So if you're trying to do stuff with type, you've got a baseline, you're trying to bring it onto the baseline, you can't do that because it's stupid. That looks all right. So now we've got a two. Now we're going to have this. Um, we're going to add a layer here. Then we're going to put in some white. Well, we won't, we're going to have to. It wants us to render that, but I think I want to copy it first. So I'm going to duplicate layer. Now I've got two twos. Now I've gone that I want to duplicate the layer and I want to duplicate the layer. Then I've got that and I go V and I think I can do, drag this away and I can then take that one and I can take that away. Those are the ones that are going to be reduced in size, although they're going to be dissimilar size because they didn't do it correctly. Um, I have to do it by eye, which is bad, bad, bad graphic designer. And then this one is going to be, this one is going to be dragged away, V. So that one's better. So these are going to be replacing that number and that number with ones that aren't italic. And I'm not going to do the parenthesis as well. And... Uh, and these ones are going to shrunk down so they're all needing to be rasterized um, okay then we're going to rasterize them all and we're going to do now we're going to take them and we're going to shrink them I sh oh, I know what I can do. I can shrink the two together. So I, all I have to do is um, merge these two layers. They merge with the layer, merge with below, but not merge all. Because that would be bad. And then we're going to do this. Grab the two together by selecting them. And then scale them both down together. Yes. And now we're going to have to make them so they are sort of the right size to go there in terms of their height and that's a little bit taller and that'll do so we've got one of them and then we've got the other one now we need to have them one there and one there so we put them <laughs> put them there and then that can be where that lives. They're rasterized and scaled. We now need to erase this, which means we need to know uh, paintbrush. We need to have white. We need to have a smaller paintbrush by some measure. Where is it? Oh, we could do the paintbrush. Or we could be, no, we can't do an eraser. I don't think an eraser will work. Um, uh, everything I, I keep this puck needs to be further over this way. This way, this way, this way, this way, this way. Okay, now we're painting on the, the layer two where this is, it will occlude this. 
Okay. Then we do it again. And then do it again. It might be four times we have to do this. There isn't a hundred percent. Right, that's more or less gone there. Then we're going to go to this lasso. That's the one on the left. And then drag it into place. And we want it to be roughly where the other one was. Now, is this one, it's actually in the wrong place, isn't it? Because it should be not like that. It shouldn't be italic. But that's now on a background of... Uh, white so I could um, oh I'm tempted to do that if we render that down to that's gonna have the white on it which means I could drag that over to there so I could do this I don't want to move it, I want to copy it and paste it. And then I want to take that over to there and drag it on top of that. Oh, that's strange. And it's taken it away like that. Why has it done that? That's done that wrong. Okay, undo, undo. Okay, we'll just do it the hard way. Because we want this d squared to not be italic we need to be on the right layer we are on the right layer we are in the right brush we have got white so why is it not going away why is it not going away is it because this is add a layer on top why is it I, why can't i rub that out to make that Run. Why is it that I can't make that rub out? That's colors. That's what I want to rub out. It is working. It's got, it's got it there, but this one is not getting any darker i wonder why if i selectively turn things off that oh there's one up over here there's a layer there so we can get rid of that that's what i want to do and now i can then move this layer well, I can go and grab this and then I see. I didn't realize there was a layer above. Um, so what we need to do is with uh, this, take that and then move that there and then drag this along like that. Although, that's not on the right layer. Why? Because I don't know. It's not, it's got gray over it. We're going to have to cut it and then go to the top and place a layer on top. Place a layer on top of that and paste it onto that layer. Now it should be all right. Okay, now, okay, we now need to have the two twos. We've got that one, which presumably is the left hand one. I don't know if it is. Let's just see. No, that's the second one. So it doesn't matter. We have that first one, and we're going to go uh, 
this one and do there and we're going to move it to be below here right now we're going to take this one and we're going to go and put it underneath the other division sign because it's the division of the division so to do that we're going to do this but that won't work because that's not even on that layer so we need to select that and now that might work um is it on that layer maybe i needed to do it the other way around hold on oh it's going to be part of the text i see it's going to be part of the text and then i'm going to be selecting that and then i'm going to be cutting it out and i'm going to be putting it at the top and pasting it at the top and then i'm going to be it's going to be putting it in the middle of the screen because it's doing that okay it's going to be it could be anywhere i'm doing a v for a layer move which is totally intuitive and there it is. And so I need that to be there. But wait a second. What happened to the division line that I had? I had a second division line. I had a division line here and I had a division line here. Um, This layer tool, I need to, oh, I need to do that. I need to do that. Where was it I had it before? I had it so that it was letting me move this around. Okay, right, that's not too bad now. What I don't understand is I need to have a second division of this division. So how do I do that? Um, I take this and I duplicate the layer. And then I take that layer and I do V and I just drag it down like this. And I think that's all right just to do that. I mean, now I go off and I take that two, which is here, and I move that. Is that the right one to do? That one, that one, that one. There's this one, that one. That one, V, there. Okay. Um, now, the mathematics of this is, um, that's all two to the power of that, right? So we're going to end up with erasing this. And we're going to go brush, raise this. I'd like to change the opacity, but I don't know how to do it easily. How do I do it? Window, toolbar, brush, palette, color editor. I don't know why there's no, there should be something here which changes the opacity, but I think I just have I need, I need this to be a bit bigger because it's taking too long to. Is it that that changes the opacity? Oh, it, it might do something. Saturation. Um, size. Right, here we go. We're doing that bigger.
Okay. So now we need to have the other bracket, which we've erased, um, but we might as well put it in by text. So we're going to just go text bracket, select, otherwise the font won't change, then go through and say, oh, what font do you want? And they're like, well, I don't know. Give me all your choices. So 64, regular, there, and OK, and that appears there, and then that's there, and that's too big, and we're going to now go like that. Um, this is going to look kind of weird, but you know, not a lot you can do about it, because those are like, tilted and the other ones aren't you could do a better job of it but anyway so this is here and i ah, know we're not on the right layer we need to be on escape we need to be on the text layer here and then that should work for us to then paste that in at the top then what happened here? What happened to my whole picture? We want to be pasting that in again. I want to be bringing that over there. Why is that now offset like that? What went wrong? Uh, I suppose, actually, come to think of it. That's on another layer. We'll move it into place and whatever later. So, P of something, 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 right. D squared, blah, 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 to that. Um, that is another bracket. That one bracket there is not sufficient. It needs a second bracket. So we need to duplicate this layer. And then this layer will be where this one is here. We're going to go V. We're going to go no V and drag that out like that, which is super easy. Okay, we've done that. Now what we need to do is take the whole of that and shrink it so that is now the superscript of that. And then that one will then be like it is there. So the two stays the same size, but the superscript stuff expression ends up smaller. Oh, I know the U needs to have a bracket as well. If, yeah, okay, so we need to have this there get duplicated, and we need that one to be V, and that one to be out of the way here. All right, so then all of this, I really don't know <clears throat> how I'm going to refer to it all, but it's going to be, well, I could probably do it by hiding it and say these things, that one, and then that layer, and then what's this? That, and then that. That there. Hmm. You know, it's probably an easier way of doing this. <clears throat> the easier way of doing this is this. And you do this, and then you do this, and you do this. Because it's that difficult to use a paint box that we're going to use this. 
And you see how much quicker this is than fucking with the layers. Because now what I do is I go up to the top and I go, give me add image. And it'll be the document that's just loaded. And there it is, thumbnail. And then it's there. And we just pop it on top and we've got it there. So now what we need to do is we're going to interpose a layer here which is going to be whiting out the the thing with white so this is going to have to be white again oh black white we're having the brush okay and we're going to have to um that's a new thing there i think is that right That's a new thing. That's the thing I want smaller. I mean, not smaller, deleted, or rather covered up. I want that on top. I want this one to be white in between. And so I will make that all go away. And. Right, okay. Are we even still broadcasting? Looks like we might be. Okay, so we've done that. Let's grab that out. We go up to the top there, go V. And then we're going to move that into place. And that should be there. Now, that is the power of this um, thing that I had where was it where was it that it was written in before oh it's here okay so the um i suppose the midline bar could be a bit longer but anyway um you could say that the brackets are redundant you don't need them um You can say it's bad mathematics because it's uh, division by division. But, I mean, that is going to work. So it's supposed to look like that. But with the 4 being a 2 divided by 2. So it's 2 to the power of d squared plus 3d divided by 4. It's kind of awkward that the 4 is on the same line almost as the 2. And um, that would mean, in that case, it would look like this. And that. Now, that means I need to erase where that is here. Which then means I need to go zoom in on that, get the eraser and erase this. I probably could do with moving that bit tighter in. Um, mm, no, it's all right. That's basically the distance is there, pretty much. So that is that. Now, in a case of a stacked fraction, is it the fractions? That, that's in the case of powers, the ones that are the power of a power ends up being smaller as you go up. In the case of a strapped fraction, does it go smaller? So that should this one that's below be a smaller two? I can't remember. I've got a book on LaTeX. I could look it up, but it doesn't really matter. Maybe it is like that. Let's have a look. Find it in here. We'll see what it says to do. I 
we might have to look at the AMS style guide. Okay, um, what we've got there is a bit of math uh, where it's square root of 5 over 1 plus the fifth root of, and then the thing in the sub-expression, normal size for the, for the denominator, and then something in brackets, which is also a division, which is also smaller because the division sign is smaller. So uh, any division that's on the bottom part, the both parts of the division should be smaller. So the two over two should be not full size. They should be like it is there, where it is like that. So I've done that wrong. It's good to know. Um, so all I need to do I need to take that, and I need to rub that out there. Well, two, of, two divided by two is one. Why did I not notice that before? Um, yeah, I hadn't noticed that. For it'd been a long time on the screen, and it'd be it's gonna have to be four, isn't it? I mean, if you had that divided by two, and then you had the outside thing somehow divided by two, then that'd be okay. But when it's stacked fractions, how do you refer to the outside fraction as divide that by two? You can't. If it was like over here and you were like saying and that you divide by two, that would be a totally different matter. But you can't do it like that with this. So that I now have an insight into why he was writing it with a four. Because there's not another way of doing it. Um, not with a stack fraction, though, isn't it? So that's interesting. Um, I was thinking, I, it was one of the things that most puzzled me about this whole thing was why this was four. And now I know. Because he couldn't have written it the other way. I know why it was numerically four, but I didn't know. Well, eventually I figured out why it was numerically four. But I... I have to zoom out. Oh, where is it? There we are. A bit bigger. That'll do, right? So that will be there. Okay, then. Um, now, that's all in place, but... Mm, doesn't that all need to be smaller? Being a superscript, I think it probably does. Because that four there should be more the size of that two. So um, that's all right. That's not a problem. Now, what we're going to have to do 
is we're going to have to do another screen grab to make sure we get these layers because it's too hard to get the layers ordinarily unless we can merge this with the uh, rasterized text layer merge with below merge with below now that's all oh right um hmm probably best to merge with this and i think we can't merge with that because if we merge with that it's just gonna end up uh shrinking that okay so these things this thing on its own we're going to shrink this and we're going to do this I want the four to be about the same size as that where are we That falls too big. The four needs to be about the same size as that. I think that's probably going to be all right. Okay. Now we've done this, we need to erase this with a small um, there, we'll zoom in on that, and then we do that. Okay, so that took long. <laughs> um, now we need to zoom out we need to move this over to there because that will complete our bracket is that right because we have it here but that is the bit up top so da, 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 now the thing is is that's how he has it there so we've reproduced it haven't we other than the fact that well it's The C there could be more elaborated into being Y, and then the, the the U itself is a subscript, but we could get around that by making the P bigger. So we take the P out, and we make the P a lot larger. Then um, if we go into that, and we go, Lasso. We do that, and then we do that, and we do that, and then we go P. Then how big is P compared to that double size? Hard to say, really. There seems to be a, like a big gap between P and that. But then the thing is, is Z is all the way over there. So it's on the same line as Z. Back a bit. Oh, I see what he's doing. The U doesn't line up. The U is in a different character cell than the P. Pretty much. I mean, a little bit underneath. Um... It's about two third. It's about thirty percent bigger, isn't it? The P than the U, would you say? Have I done it double? And it needs to be smaller. It needs to be maybe there. It does seem a bit 
in emphasis compared to the other one. And then that needs to be slightly over it so it looks like it's got it as a subscript because it's slightly as if it's on the inside of this. So it's like there and then it's like there where it's got quite a big space between one and the other. Um, I feel it should go lower and slightly to the left. Lower and to the left. Okay. Now I could have changed it the other way around and I could have made all this smaller, but if I make that small enough to be the subscript to this, it's going to make this super tiny. Now, there is an opportunity here to um, take that and put that otherwise at the top. But it should be at the top because it's the most important thing because it is the principal bundle. And I don't want it ending up just being covered up by anything. Okay, right, right at the top. So the principal bundle of the unitary um, group of the uh, spinners of the um, chimeric fiber bundle. Although this could be of Y77 seven, seven, if we wanted it to be. And then that would be that, and then it needs a bracket at the end of it all. But is it not the case that we want to do something else and we want to say, oh well, where we went wrong here when he was talking about all this is that his diagram for the lecture at least it should have been. This it should have been coming up with U 128C. So this U blah blah blah. This in the case of D equals four will be 128 because if D is equal to um, four, then D squared is equal to um, 16. And then 3D is equal to 12, and then that's going to be 28 divided by 2 is 14. And then you take that and put that into there and say, same formula except we divide by 4, then that's going to be 7. 2 to the power 7 is 128. So that's where we get the 128 from in his explanation. Now, that way he's doing it is 2 to the power of the size of the space which has already been divided by two. Okay, so if it's y m, then it was going to be m divided by two as the power of two. Or if you say like um, two to the power of n, then it'll be n is equal to m over two, just to make it completely explicit. And so what we need is we want some of this over here for that to work. And so I'm going to do that now. And this is going to be where I deviate from what he's done so far. And come to think of it, I could probably merge all that at this point. Um, now, this is all just a bitmap now. And we're now going to go, because it's getting into kind of too much complexity. And we want to go and we want to do just this. And then we're going to do a uh, copy and we're going to go paste. And we're going to have that over here as well. Now, I can't drag it that far. Hold on. Now this has to be after this over here. 
the problem oh yeah it's on its own layer so this is going to be um comma blah 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 so it's going to look kind of strange but that's that's all right that's okay and now what we need to do is we need to erase this all of this because that's wrong and we can do that it's on the layer below so we can go to this and we can make it white we're going to have a a thing for the size how big is it no wrong wrong this is size one i can't remember is this going to give us a full saturation don't know doesn't seem to be um so it goes underneath the layer that and that will now look how it should look so now the thing is is that if he was going to make this be 64 64 then he would have to write different math because this here gets you 128 so if he wanted 64 he would have to do that minus one as the power of two and he'd have to do it twice over so you'd have to do 2 to the power of d squared plus 3d divided by 4 minus 1 uh, for both parts of the group. And this, the terms here, uh, it, would be, it would be 2 to the power of that comma in the superscript, but right? it would be 2 to the power of blah, 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 and minus 1 comma, da, 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 same thing again. And then that to get that B64, it's four, which would be a nightmare, all right? So, although this is the formula that he uses to get to um, U128C, that is, um, that is, well, that is about as far as it gets, right? I mean, you can't really, you don't really want to do too much more than that now. He has got this over here, and I need to erase this. Oh, I need to move that onto there. So I could do with changing this. So I've got a nicer bracket. That's right, do that. We change the bracket. We are going to go this, and we're going to move this from this layer and we're going to copy that and then we're going to go cut it actually and then we're going to place it here place it here paste it and we're going to move it on top probably going to end up occluding it isn't it yeah of course it is um but then i'm going to raise it later i can go with this and i can go zoom and then i can go like this like that and then we've got a nice bracket and then mm, no then we've got um have paint here and we're going to do well we want to be on the layer that that is on we're going to get rid of that artifact there oh too much and we need to do that okay that's good and then we'll do that now that bit there's wrong because that should say Dirac and Roman so we've got to put this together so that does say Dirac and also Z is not big enough so we've got to cut that out and that says Z to begin with and the Z is going to be italic so that part at least is correct so we need to do that and we're on the right layer we need to do this and we're going to do that for the Z and then we're going to go I think we'll do that again hold on that for the Z and we're going to go well hold on a minute we need to have both of those things scale correctly now the this one here is too small 
compared to the other things. Um, it needs to be bigger. And that, I think, I mean, what he's drawn there is like a, a big cross. So I might have the wrong character. So I'm going to do that and move out of the way. And it needs to be up here somewhere. And I need to make it bigger. And I think it's too thick. Um, so if I get something better that does job, I will use that instead. Um, this symbol and that group together will keep it as it is, but we will make it so it's obviously the right size for this. So that will have to be in match with that size, which is not quite yet. Okay, now that row symbol, is it too big? Yes, it is. Um, now, is this over here, is it on the line? Um, hard to say, I think it might be. Um, I'd have to probably drag this down to see, get the edge of the screen, see whether it's lined up. It could do with being a little bit lower. Now, how are we doing with the spaces of the spaces between that and the whole of that needs to be closer to the times, but the times is going to be getting bigger when we replace it with the bigger times, if we provide one. So I think I'm, oh, and we need more room because we've got Dirac. So Dirac is going to go in there. So you put it all the way over there, I think, as a guess, and then we'll move that back. So that might be a little bit higher than that, but I think it is actually, hold on. Yeah, it's too high. Um, we're gonna have to redo that. Um, Where's, what happened to all my tools? Oh, here we are. Um, see how that looks. Oh, that's on the line. Oh, that that's good enough. So um, we need to have some text and we need to do the um, text for the, the thing, but we need to have the Unicode, which means we need to have the text symbol um, cross, or I don't know what it will be. I mean, it would be times symbol? N of A times operator. We'll try this. Uh, do you think this will work in the thing? Should do. Um, we do that and we go and say we want it in uh, that. And we want it that, 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 and then there. So that's the replacement for this. And that's on the wrong layer, but we've sort of got it more or less in the right spot. So then that goes up to the top above there. And then we want an intervening thing here where we wipe this out. With white. Okay, I've got white. Why do I not have white all the time? I'm always selecting that and it's always black. Okay. That's wrong. Now, this P here needs to be smaller um like it is there and it is about a third of the height of the character so where is it can't see it where's where, where's it gone i'm going to merge all the layers 
Um, I need to rasterize the text there. I'm going to merge all, merge all, and I'm going to now take this with this tool, which is this here, and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to make that smaller to about a third of the height of that, so that would be yeah. Which part am I looking at? I'm looking at the bulb of it being at a third of the height. It's slightly less than half height. And it should be midline down there, which means it should be about there. And then that itself has the rack written next to it. So there's just enough space for that to have directness next to it. And so we now go into this and we have more text and we're going to go Dirac. Because I think it's better to say Dirac than to say D. Just personal opinion because it's just a bit clearer what you're intending to do. And we're going to go that. And it's Roman. And that is okay and we'll take that down to like that and so that goes in like that and that should be smaller because that's a subscript of that and i can't remember quite how small he has it but he does have it small uh, let's see how small he has it um it might not even be on the screen because he might have got cut off oh it's right at the top there um, the so the D is bigger than the circle of the row, and uh, it's double the height of the R, double the height of the R. The whole character is double the height of the R. Hmm. So this should be bigger. Oh, uh, where? Wait a second. Where is it positioned? Oh, it's sort of on the same line as the character, which is where I've got it roughly. How much of a space is it between it and the character? Um, how much of the space is it between that? Oh, there's quite a big gap there. Okay, right. So the gap that we've got there is about the same gap as that. Um, uh, mm, I would have the whole of that further over that way. So I think I would probably bring this close to this, um, rasterize that, um, merge it all, and then I'm going to bring, probably move that over this way. What are we doing here? We want to take that and we'll move that a little bit further this way. And then we want to have about a roughly equal amount of space between the, both of these objects, which means we're going to move that there. And I've got that object and that object are separated. I think actually this could do with being further away. And then we'll put that in between here. Okay, so now what we've got is we've got ourselves a replacement for this, which is correct. And we will now take that and duplicate the layer. And then we'll take that and we will take a section of it and we'll take that. Well, no, no, no. We don't want to cut any of it off. We'll take that and then we'll put that 
up there and that's going to go in place of that so we need to make this smaller Now this is without the complexity of dealing with Y. If I zoom in a bit, I can kind of maybe make it more accurate height wise. That'll do. So that needs to be about there. So those are the two things. So um, you can see that there's quite a lot of similarity there. And um, if we zoom in on that, we have um, on this. Can we now do this? So what we've got here is we've got the one he has in the supplementary slide explainer, which is obviously the one that's printed here, right? And that one is the principal fiber bundle of the group U uh, cross row Z. Because he's got three spaces, Z, Y, and X in the supplementary slide explainer. And that's because Y got rewritten from being u in the lecture and it's y in the uh in the draft paper from 2021 so x y z is a, a better uh, naming of these three spaces and so he has that and i have put in the fact it's a direct spinner and the z will contain the group um uh u6464 now well it will do it actually in this instance it will actually contain the group u 128 c which is this one down here so that one down there will be that and that's how it should be in the paper in the uh submitted slide explainer that he did in 2020 which was incorrect uh, because he didn't complexify things and he should have done. And I can say that with some confidence because there's a slide in his lecture that shows signs that all of this had been complexified. And I'll get to that in a moment. So this here is um, how it ought to have been. And as a result, I'm going to put that in its place and correct the mistakes of the past and then that will be that'll be that so for that to work we need to have that on top and we need to have where we, how our color went which is this where is our puck what what, what, what what's happened to our pucks what happened to the thing we should have color. Oh, we want a tool, I see. Um, on this, it should be on this. So, and it's back to being black again. Why? Okay. So, all of this, right, okay. All of this could be, um, we want this to be underneath that. No, underneath. There. So as I erase this, it should be, what's going on with this? Why is it not erasing?
Right. So that I've made some of this um, observers thing a bit erased. So I shouldn't have done that. I can bring that back by going over it with the eraser. It's still there in the background. If any of that's gone a bit dark, we can do that as well. There we go. And we can do, do it with this. I think maybe, I don't know, for sure. So we've got that. Then we bring that back in. And then we've got a whole lot of clutter, which is okay because we can deal with that too. Because we've still got white to do this with. But um, we need to be on the layer that it's on to get rid of it. So. As a bit of the observers, we don't need. What's happening here? What's happening with this? Why does it look like that? Did I not erase that problem? Why does it look like that? Is it not the top? It must have been on another layer. But it's still there. It's clearly baked in. Right. Okay. So I'm going to have to do it again, which is annoying because I had the Z right. So what we're going to have to do is uh, the easiest thing to do is do it again. So we're going to do copy from here. Copy from here, grab the copy tool, go this, go to this, and that, to there. And we're going to grab probably a bit of, a little bit of the background with it, can't be helped. And then we then do copy, and then we go um, paste it on top of this. And we go paste it there. And then that will be that moved up there. Now, we will want to have that scaled down so that the Z is the right size to go with the Z. And not quite yet. There. Okay. Right. So there's that. <clears throat> now, it still looks quite scrappy, doesn't it? Um, I'll take it over there for now, clean it up over there, and then I'll clean all this, and then I'll bring it back when it's clean. That's probably the best thing to do. If I hide that, that's already clean. Then I just need to think about cleaning this up. Oh, my God. Didn't mean to do that. So we need to clean this, which means I need to zoom in on it. Um, well, actually, I need to put it in its position. So before I do that, I need to find a way of finding a place to place. No, no. Move it into position so it is here. Um, I 
this should be about on the here. Okay. Now, add a layer, add some white, and then go off and put that on the top. Unless it's not going to let me. Oh, come on. I've only, oh, I know what it is. I'm erasing rather than I'm painting. And I think that's going to take away from there. And we're going to make that bigger. And then this is a bit grey. Right, okay. And that's too much. That should be a smaller brush. No, wrong way. That way. That brush. That's a way too big a brush. And then that's now like that. And that's not like this. And this is now. Okay, so some of those parentheses like these ones should be straight, but they're not. But that's not terrible. And so that will do for now. Um, that down there, we need that. Um, So that was the one I did before that didn't work out. So we're going to get rid of that. Um, that's edits to this. This one is cleaning that up below. This layer here is, that's just the end result. And then we're going to do um, the context, we're going to leave that as it is. Uh, now, we can now take that and merge all. Right, so that's half of it. Yeah. <laughs> we've only done half. So we've done this, and uh, if you want to do, we could reconstruct this part of the diagram from wherever but it would be from the supplementary side explain that and we need to get the xd back at the bottom and then that would then complete the diagram so it'd be like most fields and eager with dancing on such and such and so we're looking for that which is where it might be the filing system hold on we're looking for physics There's that one there. Observation of the observers. Um, where is it? Um, oh, is it? This is it. So that's the whole thing um, where this is the old one. And so if we were to copy this in, this is a position two point uh, two two hours uh, twenty two and twenty. So if we were to um, close this down, right? Um, oh, hey, that's pretty useful having that. Well, um, where have you been all my life? Okay, this is exactly what I need. So I need to have. The bottom part of this diagram to then fit in with this and then spice that so that I can then um, have that overlay stuff to repair all the damage I've done. So let's see, we do that, we crop this, we want this, and we're going to do well, we might as well include that um, and get it out to full width there and then to there ish 
Um, and then that's going to be clock, and then save, and then save. And then I don't know where it was I was working. I just go to the app, and it will take me there. So we want that down there. We want this, and we want to add image. So we're going to file, add image. And then it will be in documents. This bit of the thing, and it's going to put it on top. And then we're going to just drag it onto it there um, and make it a bit smaller and I might be I need a bit more canvas so this top part here is where that top is and so that part there is where that part is roughly and then that part's there so that arrow should line up that arrow and then we want to scale this so that it is the right size and the arrows match. We want to probably change the transparency of this. Can I do that while I'm... I can. I can change the transparency of it whilst I am... Oh, wait a minute. I have... Right. Right. So it will want me to... There. So we're going to do that we're going to make this about the same size smaller hmm So if we do that, looking like it aligns quite well, we don't want what's here, um, except, except if we not careful, it might overwrite the whole thing. No, it shouldn't do because it's the image is only out to there and that part we don't care about. So we've got our frame bundle stuff that we need to work on. And then this stuff in this slide, where it was complexified, and we've complexified it now, we've done that. So we now bring that up in intensity. And now that is now covering it. That's beautiful. So that is a slide where if I just do that and I erase that, then that will be... Um, that one will be bigger. So this thing here, where it's that we've got up here, uh, he's written it there and it's similar, but it's also got a Y77 in the middle. So it's, this but it's y77 without the other things so what's that gonna look like oh my gosh it's gonna be this is gonna take a long time okay i might try doing this another way So this is how it is when you do it with a paint box and how long it takes. Um, and this is looking very, very small. So I've got to zoom in on it so you can see it better and leave it on screen for a bit when I leave the room. So um, it won't be long. So we're going to just do that. And we're just going to merge the layers here. We don't really need this now.
Ouais, ok. Now, why have I done this? Why have I made it so that all this here is now complexified where it wasn't before? The reason is that he made a mistake in his lecture. It's not a huge mistake. Uh, it's not something that undermines geometric unity. All it is, is that there was a, a mistake in his presentation and all I'm doing with this thing, is all the things I can criticize about it are mistakes in his presentation. Like here he is on Joe Rogan and he goes off and he talks about four things and he talks about um, how to get at the four dimensions. And that's not really all that clear, I don't think. And I was just, um, I was looking at this. Um, we'll, we'll get to the fermionic field complex in a moment. But before we do that, it's easier to do it if I do the Joe Rogan thing first. And I simplify that. I'll get to that first. So the Joe Rogan thing is here. And he's going to get to this in a moment, like in a minute. Four degrees of freedom are like the stands in a stadium. And the stands somehow need to build the pitch. And the pitch is a 14 dimension. We're going to go back a bit because he's like asked about drawing hands. You got to do it from here. In a fundamental theory. If you had the canvas, how would the canvas bring all of the richness that you see around you into being? And what I did was I said, okay, we have to go below Einstein. So we have four degrees of freedom, but they're not yet space and time. It's proto space time, but before. And then I said, okay, that those four degrees of freedom are like the stands in a stadium. And the stands somehow need to build the pitch. And the pitch is a 14 dimensional space. So if, Let's imagine um, that you had, uh, okay, we've got four objects here, right? So the four degrees of freedom correspond to four objects. Then we need a ruler to measure how much of each of these four objects we have. So that would be four additional variables. And then you have angles, because length and angle is what Einstein gave us in space time. So the angles between any two objects are the same as the reverse of the angle. So then you can count it up and there's six angles to be had. So there's four degrees of freedom, plus four rulers, plus six protractors, which is 14. So there's a 14 dimensional auxiliary space. And in my estimation, you and I are in some ways potentially having this conversation in a 14 dimensional world that we perceive back in the stands rather than on the pitch as a four dimensional conversation. That is, we are in a three dimensional room going forward in time. So I've called this the observerse. And the observerse is two spaces rather than Einstein's one space. Can I stop you right there? Sure. Why 14 dimensions? Because I'm saying that the fields, that is the stuff, is dancing not mostly on the four dimensions that we think we perceive, but it's also dancing on the rulers and the protractors. So in other words, if I have X, Y, and Z, I need rulers in the X direction, the Y direction, the Z mm -hmm. to measure things. And I need a watch, which would be like a ruler in the time direction. So those four rulers are in fact in play as well. And the, the protractors, because like space time is four degrees of freedom plus rulers and protractors. I'm saying work over the space of all rulers and all protractors as part of where these particles and fields can dance. So the rulers and the protractors are part of the system not just a choice of particular rulers and particular protractors. So by choosing particular rulers and particular protractors, Einstein is grabbing a tiny filament of the space of all possible rulers and protractors. So in, in effect, space-time is recovered as the act of the observers contemplating itself. That's a little... Okay, so going back to the glass, going back to the um this 
right? Okay. We start off with a meniscus, which is this between the contact of the water and the glass. We're not talking about a disc. We're not talking about the surface of the water. We're talking about where this one-dimensional thing of the edge of the water touches the inside of this glass vessel. We're not really talking about the glass vessel. We're, we're just talking about a one-dimensional ring, okay? Then we go off and say, uh, we're gonna put this on the outside for the sake of convenience. We could put it on the inside, so it's actually touching the, out, the meniscus on the inside. Uh, but if I want to be able to do the next thing, I have to compromise and you have to pretend that the glass isn't there and the water somehow stays where it is. Uh, so the meniscus is there as a ring and then that's against it like that, right? And so that's going to form a tangent and here would be a tangent and here would be a tangent. All the way around would be a tangent. So looking down from above, you could see that there'd be a whole bunch of these tangents. And if the pencil was red, then you'd see something like that structure that I've drawn there, where embedded in this kind of ambient two-dimensional plane, there would be a one-dimensional circle, where if you lived on the one-dimensional circle, you just walk around in a loop. That would be your entire life. You could go forward and you could go backwards, but you couldn't go anywhere else. Now, strictly speaking, in one dimension, you wouldn't be able to do anything like walk anywhere because if you had space, you could be at a point in space, but you wouldn't be able to have time as well. So you wouldn't be able to walk anywhere because that would involve time for you to be able to make progress anywhere. Now, so it's a very, very restricted example, but it allows you to use a kind of commonplace thing of like, this right so you're looking down on this you've made your tangents this is what is algebraic topology and it's got this thing on the right there that says s1 and s1 represents the um a one-dimensional sphere if it was a two-dimensional sphere it would look like you know ordinary globe right uh like with countries on it and the surface of that globe would be S2, that, that's if it's an ideal sphere. And of course, the, the globe is not an ideal sphere. It's actually oblate and it's got continents on it. It's got Everest on it and so forth sticking up. It's not completely smooth. So, but I'm just saying as a, as a general analogy, if you think about the, the Earth that we're on and then you think about the equator that goes around it, that equator is like a section of the the higher dimensional surface that is s2 so on this this is here could be thought of as an equator of a sphere that this would be the surrounding kind of midriff band of that would be the equator of okay now we create our tangents to this and we make them very, very close together, closer to each other than I've done there. And the tangent space, because it's a connected continuous space of this, and that's where you can do things with algebraic topology, that's red, red, marked red, and the tangent space is T, marked in red. So the tangent space of S1 will be all of those completely capturing the circle as where they touch it now it's an entire thing that is each of these red lines they're straight and then where they touch it will be one single point okay so as that meets that you get your point on here and that would be like okay you get another one and you touch it on here and it's going to be at basically the same point like the midpoint or something like that so then you do all of that and say, for a given one, you say, let's do the next thing we need to do, which is turn it. And I'm turning it, we're going to do that. And it's now going to be um, 
holding up like this. So you can imagine that all of these are arrayed around the outside of the glass. And that will be, drum roll, your fiber bundle of this. Because that point on the fiber that matches a point in the circle is a zero dimensional sample of a one dimensional universe within a two dimensional observers where this is one dimension and this is the second dimension and this is obviously pencils all the way around right to cover the whole thing and so you've got a two dimensional observers with one fiber which happens to be oh right what's happening we are going to pull out of this we're going to recover our space and we're going to recover this one dimensional space which is this ring we would have to do it by in concert taking all of the fibers of the fiber bundle we can't just do it with one and then that will going to bring us to the point of contact and it's given an infinitesimal point in our circle to describe what's happening there and whether or not there's something there or there's nothing there because you know, there could be like information on this, like, you know, binary or something. And that would be like, this would encode binary on it, let's say. I mean, it wouldn't, but I'm giving you the example to keep it really, really simple, informational theoretic. That could have like one on this one. And the next pencil round would be zero. And the next pencil round would be zero. And the next pencil round there would be one. And so it would be storing in this, Thing, a bunch of you know ones and zeros as it went around the outside because it really only makes sense for it to be space it can't also be time as well so you could do that and if you were to say well that doesn't sound very interesting I'd sooner it would say an electron that's problematic because the electron has spin and that would mean it needs time okay so you know with Dirac Dirac has his um you know relativistic um equation describing the momentum of the electron in special relativity which is even you know flat space time but it's four dimensions it's like look get real you're not going to be able to have an electron in this uh scheme because it's just space no time and it's one dimension of space so like it's like it's too simple for you to be able to put in any actual phenomena, you could have information, you could use it kind of conceptually, you could simulate this on the computer and you could say, I'm going to have this thing and I'm going to kind of have a digital quantized space where at like, you know, we're going to have, I don't know, 1,024 positions where there could be bits and then the bits could be either on or off and that would be the best you could manage with this. You couldn't say, let's have some quarks, let's have some gluons, all of that, because they all need to have dynamical traits in order to be what they are. And that means you need a Lagrangian, and that means you would need to have potential energy and kinetic energy, and you'd need time, right? So you don't have that extra dimension, so you're just going to have to lump it with just using this to sort of store information in a persistent record, let's say. But it is a reasonable model for kind of like, you know, baby's first universe to kind of make something where there's a fiber bundle. So you've got a zero dimensional point inside of a one dimensional fiber among many, which form as a bundle, a two dimensional uh, immersion within which the the ring is a section of that uh, two-dimensional bundle. Now, if you go off and you use the mathematics that we've established, which is uh, the size M of the metric is going to be uh, the size of D for the dimensions 
squared uh, plus 3d divided by 2, we do that with this. We've got one, right? One dimensional circle. And so we're going to say one squared is one times one is one. Uh, plus 3d is going to be um, three. That's going to then be four. Okay, one plus four is one. One plus three is four. Divided by two is going to be two. So that gives you this here, the vertical dimension and the all the way around circular dimension, and that gets you the um, what would be. I mean, if this was, it's not the uh, pseudo Romanian manifold by any stretch of the imagination, but this is sort of like it could be x, but it would be more like x1, right? Uh, but I mean, technically, it's s1. And then this one here would be um, a space, but it wouldn't be a sphere, so it couldn't be s2. So I don't know quite how you describe it. It would be. I suppose it would be described as it's described here as well it's not ts because the fiber bundle is going to be probably the cotangent bundle of the tangent bundle of the original space because it's it's this and then this so i have a feeling that it's that transformation that you're doing that's twisting it up that makes it into the total thing that is something there. So I'm not sure about that. So there's a little bit in the way he does his paper and the way he presents the lecture where he goes off for like 40 minutes about talking about, you know, taking a tangent and then a cotangent and, and it, it goes through it very, very quick. And um, I can't hope to explain everything in all of that in the main body of the lecture uh, because it's like super deep gauge theory. But the general gist of it is what I've explained here, which hopefully has kind of explained things a little bit better as to what gauge theory is and why you want to have a fiber bundle. Because what you can do with it is you can have a higher dimensional space and then you can then say, I want to sample from that higher dimensional space characteristics about my own world, which is this section within it. And so rather than say, you know, how is it that the, I mean, okay, this is too simple because this doesn't have time. But let's say you had this and it was somehow the observers and it was somehow 14 dimensional. What you could do is you could say, I have this space. And I am now going to ask a really difficult question. I'm asking it to see if I can recover space time from 14 dimensions. And this is what geometric unity uh, seeks out to do. And it seeks out to pull um, out of the 14 dimensions that are there, uh, the combination of dimensions that will be the right signature for it to be able to have uh, space time. And that will be this, which is the Lorentzian metric X13. Now, there are five sectors. That's different from sections. So the section is the, this is a particular section. And there are other sections which would also be four dimensional and you pick what metric would make sense. So he's looked at it and he said, well, there's five of them that you could have and it would, they'd all add up to four dimensions and there would be X four comma naught, um, X um, three comma one, X two comma two, this one, and then X naught comma four. Now it's time first, space second. And when you have um, no time, as in naught comma four, well, that's not really very helpful, is it? 
So you haven't got any way of doing dynamics and having a Lagrangian. If you're at the other extreme and you have four comma naught, you've got four dimensions of time, but nowhere to have any space, right? It's, it's just absolutely no room for anything, totally claustrophobic. Then you've got um, two comma two, where two dimensions of uh, space are gonna look like this, where you have your flat land, okay? And that is, again is a flat land, all right? So this is a, a like as if this was, uh, if I made a hole in a piece of cardboard that was flat and I stuck this in it so that it was the same level as the water and I was then just viewing it so that I could show it to you inside of that space that space isn't serving any purpose other than to kind of clue you in as to what is happening with the fibers. Because if I just draw a ring and put fibers all the way as a tangent to the ring around the back and in the front, it doesn't look like very much. It, it, it doesn't read very well. Whereas if you kind of don't do it correctly because they're supposed to be on the outside not on the inside and you put them on the inside instead then what happens there is when you are um embedded in the space like this you won't see it it'll go below the level of the space and so that will actually make it clear that that is, you know, that that one at the front um, here, that one at the front is like cut off by this lip of the of the circle here, and then you see it again below. And so I felt that was a better way graphically to represent it because that way, although it's technically wrong, it's 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 making it clear that these things are connecting to this ring. And honestly, I don't think it makes that much difference if they're on the inside of the ring or the outside of the ring that much. I mean, it's, it's a practical problem. How do you make them turn against the, the um, as tangents, how do you get them to turn? But uh, you wouldn't be able to get them to turn if they're on the inside of the ring because then it would be like you'd be here no, you'd be, I mean, you wouldn't be able to have it as a tangent to the inside of the ring because it would be, uh, the ring would get in the way of it. On the outside, you can do it, but you can't do it on the inside. So, so that's, that's, that's like that. Now, so that would be your thing. And the intuition you build from doing all of this is that this is at right angles to reality, which is written up there in my bad handwriting. Bad handwriting. So this is at right angles to reality, and a fiber bundle is at right angles to reality, and it would work in higher dimensions. So um, we say that a, I think it's actually spelled like that. Have I spelled it wrong? Yes, I spelled, there's two ways of spelling it. Now, We've just had him describe things, and we can listen to him again in a minute, but <clears throat> after we've gone over my description. So my description will be from uh, my <clears throat> short video. It should be here somewhere. Okay. Okay, this is a um, video mashup of Kelly Rowland and um, um, Franz Ferdinand. And you might think, what the hell? And it's like, well, the lyrics are appropriate to. Um, Geometric unity, because it starts off with Franz Ferdinand, and they're talking about the dark of the matinee, which is like 
dark of the matinee, dark of the matinee, dark of the matinee, dark of the matter, right? So dark matter is what this geometric unity theory ends up predicting, which is good because we need to have dark matter in order to make it so that the uh, uh, physics of galaxies, I mean, galaxies basically break the laws of physics as they stand right uh they're not rotating correctly and you need to either say well the laws of physics according to einstein are wrong which no one wants to say because it's been proven again and again that his laws of physics hold up really well or more likely a quantum field theory is wrong which has gone through multiple revisions over the course of 20 uh, over the course of about 70 years so they keep on adding stuff to quantum field theory, finding new things, adding to it, adding to it, adding to it. So the likelihood is they're going to keep adding to it, right? So if they're going to run their accelerator or build a new one, find more, more particles, those more particles could account for dark matter. So that's the better bet that there isn't anything fundamentally wrong with um, Einstein's general relativity in the sense that it's like, like completely fucking wrong right and um Eric Einstein's saying well we need to go beneath Einstein all that he's not proposing coming along and scrapping Einstein so comprehensively it's no vestige of it is there I've looked at the work he's done and what he's doing is like uh, an elaboration of it to uh higher dimensions as far as I can tell he's taking it from being four dimensional at space time to 14 dimensional um uh, space from which you recover space time as a as a uh, one three Lorentzian signature. So um, in this uh, we have hopefully got some comments where I go. I try to explain geometric unity for the layman in under six thousand words and i'm doing it like this because i thought well you know i'm probably really bad at um saying um this uh quickly and I, if i have it written down it, if this is going to help then that's going to be of help so um yeah we can read out this so we're going to make this a bit bigger Gotta be careful that I don't make it too big though. We're gonna make that wider. How's that looking on screen? Is that big enough? It's pity you can't just hide these sidebar things. Um it's like I'm pay I'm paying for YouTube premium. Do I have do I need to have this all on the side here? From your search for non-competitive. Is there no way of getting rid of that? Oh, I could drag it off the screen, couldn't I? I could make it bigger and then I could make it wider this way. Make it super wide and then I could do that. And then I can make it wide that way. Like that. Is that gonna work? I don't know if that's working. No, it's not working. It's keeping it on screen, even if I make it wide. Let's keep, let's go extreme. Oh, you bastards. So that they've made it so the JavaScript renderer will make it so that you can't. Okay. Is there a way? If I turn off JavaScript, will it make it so that I end up without those images um can i deactivate that just to get the text um settings disable javascript reload no i don't get a damn thing 
I don't get a video. I do lose these, but then I lose <laughs> I lose my text. So that didn't work. Um, well, it's worth a try. Re-enable JavaScript. Reload. Okay. Right. In before the copyright. How long of a riff can you have before you get in trouble? I don't know. Um, and we're going to go down here. Oh, that, wait, wait, wait. How did we manage this? Oh, this is perfect. This is perfect. This is as big as I could ho hope for. Okay. So, um, it put the these things above. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, I did this nearly a year ago. Um, I'm going to attempt to explain geometric unity for the layman in under 6,000 words. Eric Weinstein is saying that there exists a single unified field named Omega. Eric Weinstein is saying that there exists a single unified field named Omega. Okay. Um, which interacts with itself in 14 dimensions to produce relativistic waves, some aspects of which become determined via interaction with the engine of observation that is gravity, i.e. the curvature of our readily accessible four-dimensional space-time. Then I have a quote by John Archibald Wheeler, who is a physicist, and he said in reference to Einstein's field equations, space-time tells matter how to move, Matter tells space-time how to curve. Now we can have a look at the Einstein field equations, which look like this, which we will bring over to be the next screen over. So these are the Einstein field equations. The bit on the left is the curvature of space-time, and the bit on the right is uh, matter. So T here will be... Um, what's called the stress energy momentum tensor. And this is just to scale it down so that the mass of say a planet or a moon or the, the sun uh, doesn't really impact on the curvature of space time that much. So you don't like get a black hole out of the moon. You, 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 that, is such a, that is such a big number, which is a C uh, to the power of four. So C, is 180,000 miles per second. So you take that and you multiply it by itself four times as the den denominator of a fraction, where G itself is itself very, very small, right, as a multiplicative thing. So it's eight pi, which is about eight times three, uh, multiplied by G, which is again, very, very small number, divided by a, a very large number, is going to make this tiny and then that's multiplied by whatever this is and if it's like a celestial body uh, that's really heavy well not heavy massive then that's going to mean that that's going to reduce it down to having a negligible effect on the curvature of space so that's why i'm able to do this okay which will not be possible if this wasn't adjusted in here and i would be flat as a pancake and dead right because this would this is doing a, a lot of work in making it so that the mass of the earth does not crush me flat right now this here is the curvature and we won't get into what's going on with all of this with the ship in the bottle and everything we'll come back to that later but essentially the um the G mu nu, which is a bit that is in uh, the G, the mu and the nu are um, Greek letters that mean that it is a tensor, and these refer to the rows and columns specifically. So it's a it's a two by two uh, tensor, and it is a form of um, where is it that I had it. Um, here and this here is a rank two tensor and we'll have it and it's all marked there 
in color and you'll see that you've got um, um, we've got uh, R which is the Ricci curvature tensor and that is got the subscripts uh, mu and nu in red and blue respectively and the red one is doing the rows which all marked out in that thing on the left in red and the uh, blue one is the columns which are again marked in blue so if you say well where am i in if i'm like uh, the top right hand corner then you'd need to have zero three so mu would have to be equal to zero and uh new would have to be equal to three because it's a third column over so if i zoom out a little bit and then i go off and move the cursor over it that would be that one okay and um you get to do this for that and for this that also has one and then you have it um here and here um so uh, the thing about the G's is that uh, in the case of this ship in a bottle, um, the ship starts off outside of the bottle and the bottle essentially adds the uh, G's. And the G's are the, um, um, the G's are the uh, metric. And the metric, was, as we've established, is this um, um, a selection of the um, what what Eric Weinstein says is the rulers and protractors needed for the space. Um, now, well, now's a good time to go back to my my description here because I cover all of this. So um, space time tells matter how to move. So you can see that the bit on the left of the equation would be the thing that as it's an equation is as that changes shape, uh, maybe it's not that obvious how it changes it, makes things obvious that things move. Um, right, space time tells matter how to move. So this is the same Einstein field equation here. How does it do it? How does it, how's the magic work? Well, the, you have this tensor, which has got four um, dimensions, right? It's a four, it's dealing with four dimensional space. And uh, the things inside of the tensor are actually partial differential equations and they are um, operating on a pseudo Riemannian manifold. And so you have your, um, your manifold of space, time, and you say, right, this is, I'm gonna need to have uh, a way of uh, measuring things with this um, in order to uh, see how, as, as it curves, how much it's curved by, because however much it curves by will change the path that something takes through that curved space. And the thing on the right T is the stress energy momentum tensor. And if you listen carefully, you think, I heard the word momentum in there. And so that's a clue that it's similar to Dirac doing the uh, thing with, for the electron, whereby he was saying, I want to know what the momentum is of an electron in special relativity. And so, in a similar sense, as far as I understand, this is like kind of like Newton, kind of like force equals mass times acceleration, uh, where you're saying, I want to know what the momentum of an object, and that's going to be um, imparted on it by its, you know, its current movement, but also, which is momentum, but also it's going to be affected by the space it's in. And this is the thing that Einstein comes in with, says it's not like, like the, you know, in Newtonian classical mechanics, 
something starts moving, you have a force and it just keeps going like that. It's in space and it's like, okay, and what happens? Well, it have a velocity, it won't accelerate, it will have accelerated to that velocity and it will stay at that velocity forever unless you go in and you try and stop it and you try and oppose it in some way, okay? And so that was his classical model of mechanics. And um, um, that's not like it's been entirely superseded by what we have with um, Einstein or what we have being proposed by Eric Weinstein. It's still, you know, momentum, force, that sort of thing is still inherently there. But it's got a bit more subtlety and nuance to it, where when you're dealing with something that's a very massive thing, it can warp space in the same sense as um, this is warping space, right? That's something that Newton never considered. And it's something that Einstein considered. And now we have um, Eric uh, Weinstein saying, there's more to it than just that. It's not just four dimensions that are being distorted. It's 14, right? And when we go to um, back to, so we have this thing and we are outside of the, the bottle. The bottle is actually where you have the um the um the bottle is where you have the metrics and the metrics are going to be uh, in the case of einstein um 10 um dimensional measures um four of length and uh six of angle and he didn't think he needed any more than that and he ended up with a theory where he didn't really have the headroom in terms of dimensions to then incorporate anything involving quantum field theory. So this thing at the top here, this has dimensions in it too. And the dimensions in it are inherently in these things, um, although they're usually thought of as internal dimensions. So they're not like extra dimensions in the same sense as up, down, left, right but they're like inside of things that like fermions and bosons and quarks and, you know, all of those stuff. There are extra dimensions inside of those things that are internal to them. And they kind of cheat to put them in there by using complex numbers. So they're like, they're in an, an imaginary wonderland. And um, you can obtain what you want from all of that by squaring it because the square root of minus one squared ends up just being minus one um and if you square that again you end up with you know minus one times minus one is one so it just kind of evaporates so um um the g mu nu thing is um as it is after it's been put in the bottle and before it gets put in the bottle, um, it is stripped down and it's uh, separated out. So um, but we won't get into that just yet because he doesn't, we'll do it when he comes to it in the lecture. But I'm hopeful that with speaking about the um, John Wheeler, it's maybe somewhat helpful um so he's saying space time tells matter how to move so if you have curved space time it will roll uh, something on here will roll around into the into the groove and and go along the groove and if there's a channel it will be walked along here i've got some grapes here um you know it, it it's kind of like that and you kind of rolling around 
um, on the fabric of of that because of things that are now changing space. So something that ordinary on a flat surface just goes straight along, like Newton, because he's assuming everything's flat and there's no distortions. If you start having a distortion in the geometry that things are happening in, it's going to start going, you know, a bit like a drunken sailor, isn't it? So, but if you put all your grapes on this, it's going to end up distorting the space. So it works both ways. But if you have something that's like more or less negligible, that's not really going to do a whole lot, right? So, um, So I say, click on this link to jump to such and such timestamp in Eric Weinstein's 2020 upload of his 2013 Oxford lectures on geometric unity. So we'll do this and um, we will open a link in new tab. So most fields, in this case Omega, um, are dancing on Y, which right. was called you in the lecture, unfortunately. Okay, so, right, okay, we've got it back to there. So that is what we've just been working on for like an hour to make it so this is uh, different. In fact, I think when I wrote my comment, it was a comment that was consistent with this. I'm not sure. But anyway, we'll have a look, see, see what the damage is. Um, and so that is saying, well, you know, refer to that when you are um, looking at this comment. But I'm going to keep it full size text for now. Um, in my unit of this video on this slide, it summarizes concept of the observers. Put simply, the universe we are aware of is not the whole story, and that there is a lot more that exists behind the scenes, which we cannot readily access from our four dimensions of space time, rather like the way fake news will quote someone out of context to select some of what they said someone else had said and then condemned them for saying it, but clipped only the part where they made the quote of the despicable person without the condemnation. So, for example, you know, uh, Donald Trump might say, um, you know, he condemns the things at Charlottesville and the actions of the, the um, you know, um, the neo-Nazis, and 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 then he, he might then say something about what they had said and then having quoted them then say and i totally reject that ideology and i think it's you know pernicious and blah 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 right but he quotes maybe what they said and say why he dislikes it and then they will have him just say the thing that was the quote of the other person that he was about to condemn right, and not have the bit where he condemns them. Now, as it is, I don't think that happened because I think he's smart enough to not make that green horn on the sake of quoting someone who says something terrible, right? Like, if you were to say, like, um, you know, Joy Reid said, uh, Jews smell, and then you would like to say, uh, that got clipped, and then I was meant to just show Oz a clip of me saying, do you smell? Then that would make me look anti-Semitic, rather than me saying that it was Joy Reid who said that, right? Well, actually, Joy Reid didn't say that. That was just an example. But, you know, you, maybe you believe that, right? Because I said that as part of an example, but now... It's like, well, that's actually an example of fake news because you can have misinformation as fake news as well. So, um, so this whole thing, like, not the whole story, and you know, taking something out of context and everything, uh, is is kind of analogous 
to this thing of the observers where um you know you we cannot readily access from our four dimensions of space time um everything about what's really going on so we are laboring under you know sort of not really the full truth of the matter you know um I mean, you know, in the Iraq war, for example, um, the second one, we thought there were weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq. And that's why we were all going back there for a second go of it. And they didn't have weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Just did not happen. So, and they knew they didn't have them. But they wanted to have a pretext to uh, have a second war. And... Um, they didn't have a UN resolution the first time around to enter Baghdad, so they had to stop, and that was frustrating for the senior, um, George Bush Sr. So his son gets into the presidency, and they said, right, this is where we finish the job. And so they needed to have a coalition, international coalition. They couldn't get the Arab states to support the action through the UN. So it wasn't a UN resolution-backed thing, and you could argue that that's why 9-11 was uh, an inside job because they need to have a pretext to get everyone to treat America as a victim who was entitled to do something uh, about going after Osama bin Laden who turned out to not be in Iraq or in Afghanistan but was actually in an ally country of Pakistan and then was revealed to be a CIA agent who had worked with the CIA in the 1980s in Afghanistan to teach the Mujahideen how to make improvised explosive devices with CIA training on how to do it. And then when the US forces went over to Afghanistan to look for him, even though he wasn't there, he's in Pakistan, um, they were kept on being blown up and maimed by improvised explosive devices made by the Taliban, who'd le learned how to make them from, you know, everyone else. So had it not been for the CIA training Assam bin Laden how to make these improvised explosive devices and him then going over there and telling them how to do it for the Mujahideen who were fighting Russia in the Cold War, then that technology wouldn't then have ended up in the hands of the Taliban and then being weaponized against US soldiers and then leaving people uh, maimed, right? So kind of bad, really, uh, that all of those people who got injured in Afghanistan who didn't even need to be going there because Osama bin Laden wasn't in the country, uh, went over there and got maimed by a in uh, knowledge of how to make a uh, improvised explosive device that had come from the CIA itself. So um, this is probably all news to you, but it's all facts. And there's so much more like things like this that I could say about anything, about everything. That it's like the amount that we get to know through news compared to the amount that if you do your research and you find out what's really going on, it's like, oh, oh. And it's like, it does make you feel like giving up because it's like, it's so um, dark. You know, the people in power, they're so dark and self-serving and evil really um that um that they are anti-american they make out they're american they're the president and the other thing and like no you're not no you're, you're not behaving as if you're uh, representative of the people and looking out for everyone and commander-in-chief and all of that you shouldn't even have that title george w bush you're a warmongering scumbag. And the Democrats are just the same. This isn't like a, a go at Republicans. 
there as bad. And the only one to come along that was like, okay, was Trump because he didn't start any new wars. And he was downscaling the footprint of forces inside of um, Afghanistan. But I think he was thinking of keeping a little bit there rather than completely removing um, uh, Fort Bagram, I think it is. And uh, in comes Biden and he just pulls everything out and he leaves the equipment behind and he and it's so much money on the equipment that got left behind and then it falls into the hands of the Taliban. So now they've got fantastic equipment and um, yeah, I mean, the whole thing's a complete shambles. Uh, but there the were people getting killed because the soldiers got taken out first and he should have taken out the people first and then taken out the soldiers last, right? Because they're there to protect everything, right? And Trump met a five-year-old boy. I think it was at Marlogo or something. And he asked him, what do you think should happen? Do you think they should take the troops out first or take the troops out last? <laughs> and the five-year-old boy said, do we take the troops out last? Because they keep everything safe. It's like, yes. Yes. Five-year-old boy is smarter than Joe Biden. So, um uh anyway oh how are we so for some reason i thought i'd have a bell go off now i'm just going to see what's happening about it and um i set it to remind me at five o'clock leave that on the screen for a bit so that is essentially um what we've got from the diagram that mathematics is not complexified though um that's how it was in 2020 
Well, I'd like to have a cup of tea because it's pretty cold. Let me warm, warm me up. Um, so what this is is um, the diagram of the of this. That's the same thing, and it might not be obvious that it is, but it is. So if I take that out and put that there, and I then make it smaller by shrinking it. Hold on, how do we do that? Come on, smaller. We've looked at this a lot while I was doing my uh, previous, uh, you know, drawings out and making it so that I had everything in my, uh, you know, I redid this so it was, um, it said Dirac and it had comma double strut C, didn't I? I had it like it was, um, where was it? No, that's not it. It went to the wrong thing. Um, is this it? No. What's happened to it? What's happened to it? It was this. There we are. I think I better save this. Um, because it's like, uh, might not work otherwise. Save as. Um, All right, so um, how hard is it going to be to have that on screen with everything else? Where is it? There. Um, and where is it here? There. Okay, so that needs to be over by three um hold on right there okay so you've got that one that's the way it used to look in the lecture right then if i go over to like that that's how it now looks that's it corrected that's how it should look in the lecture In the supplementary side of the and I'll get to why it uh, it needs to be complexified later. All right now, what I've done here is I've got um, XD. So start there, and we say um, XD is um, a natural number. Natural number, and what else have we got here? Um, make that a bit smaller still there that's all right that all fits um, we could bring this over a bit right So XD on the 2020 slide, um, this, where it says XD here on this slide from the 2020 um, upload of the 2013 Oxford lecture, uh, this is from the supplementary slide explainer. We will see that that is the same as this XD down here. And that could take any value, that's a natural number, and in the lecture, he doesn't even 
has this step, he just has it equal to four, right? Then you then say mathematically, um, we need M for Y, which is grown out of um, X. And the early part of the lecture is talking about how he does that. And he has a formula here that he uses, which is where M is equal to D squared plus 3D divided by two. And that's essentially the same, although it's written in one line as the formula that's over on the right, where you can see there that it's um, like that. So we don't know yet why it is that formula, but that is the formula he uses. So this is the metric, and in Einstein, it would yield 10 dimensions, and in his theory, it's 14. And then we get up the top there, and we have it be uh, C is divided in half, um, and then it's used as the, um, the two is raised to the power of C. Okay, so uh, that would mean that 14 divided by 2 is 7, and then 2 to the power of 7 will be 128, and so U will be 128, and then that would be Z u would be z128. Now, writing zu is a lot less complicated than writing this or what I wrote earlier, which is all this, which is really really complicated and that isn't as complicated as it could get because c here hasn't been defined as operating on anything and that could be c over this um but i suppose he just kept it simple because he was using formulas because he couldn't go c sem 7 um because then it would i mean what it would be it was with p it would be p of uh, of u um, dollar c of uh, c, c uh, of y um, with dimensions uh, d squared plus 3d divided by 2 uh, parenthesis to the power of 2 um, well not to the power of 2 no wrong with the dimensions two to the power of d squared plus three d divided by four um, uh, with the complex numbers as part of that st structure group that was defining that the uh, gauge group u, which was defining the principal bundle p, which was um, uh, with the um, the Dirac uh, thing, Z. So I take that to mean that Z is, in this instance, 128C, uh, uh, U128C, and that's what's characterizing Z. And they are U128 Dirac spinners. Um, but this is like a technical thing of like, well, strictly speaking, this is how it's been done through gauge theory, using a unitary group, using a principal fiber bundle over the chimeric fiber bundle C, which is inclusive of Y, although he doesn't write in the Y. And um, I was thinking, well, you probably need to write in the Y, right? So uh, there's reasons to do that. And I was kind of getting around to doing it with like the frame bundle and all of that as well, because that's not in there either. Because although this is pretty good, if you were to put it in and say you want the double cover on the frame bundle or the this or the that or the that, right? As he has in his paper, it would be incredibly convoluted. And by the time he talks about the frame bundle, he's no longer talking about it being um, complexified like this with C. 
So it's been decomposed from direct spinners into wild spinners. And then seemingly in the context of the paper, he is then doing something to it in order to make it be back into direct spinners. And I think he's done that because he kind of needs it in the form U6464, but he also needs to kind of talk about it in its full extent as being direct spinners. So he kind of recovers the direct spinners from the, well, not recovers, he's kind of like, elaborates it back into direct spinners for the purpose of, of his uh, total bundle thing. So um, uh, that's all in the paper. Um, the part of the paper that refers to that is um, somewhere. It might be here. It might be elsewhere. I'm not sure. I think I've gone and <laughs> I might have lost the the bit of the the thing that is a bit that I want. Where is it? What have I gone and done with it? Had all my tabs on it. That was for the lecture. Portal special presentation. Oh dear. Folk have gone and misplaced it. This has got all things to do with the lecture on it. So where is it? Is it in here? I'll go through it systematically from desktop one. Desktop one. No, not on desktop. Oh, it might be that. No, that's a PowerPoint. That's not it. Desktop two. Desktop three. No. Desktop four. Okay. No need to panic. Desktop. If I've closed the window, that would be a bit bad. Um, is this it? No. Oh, this is it. Okay, found it. Okay, this is it here. So, um, it's sort of in the wrong place in the sequence. Seven, it should be next to, well, we'll put it in the position three. There. So, go back to this, and if I go this way, I go to that and then I get the part of where it was in, in the slide within the context of this. And then I get where it is in the paper, which is a year later. And he says, for the rest of this exposition, we will let such and such Dirac, which is slightly different style of the row symbol, uh, uh, be the representation of this. And on co complex direct spinners using notation H. So we just do that. And um, on complex direct spinners. So that is um, huh. So all the stuff is written there. So I have made the progress by saying that where he was writing it and he was saying H, it, it should have been Z. Um, but here he's saying the frame bundle of the, of the uh, double cover of the frame bundle of C77. Uh, we look at that, we go to this, um, the double cover of the frame bundle. I'm gonna need this on the same page, aren't I? Otherwise, it's gonna be too hard. I need that there on two pages over. I need that on that, and then that's going to be here. What is this? What am I looking at here? That is wrong. That needs to be G. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Well, I think that's Z. If I amend this a bit, and I do this, and I do this without using typefaces, I do this by hand, then I go... Um, I keep thinking it's going to come up on here and I have the pencil and just be able to do it. And it's not letting me do that, is it? I wish I knew why it wasn't working. Um, so all of that's going to have to be saved and put into the um, sketchbook program again. So bring that down to there, bring that up to there, have the whole of that, and then uh, crop and then save and then we want that in sketchbook here which will be this and then we're going to have we might as well add it as a layer and then we're going to say um have another layer on top of that and then we will want this intervening layer to be white and we want to have um habits of paintbrush we want to erase all of this with the, um, we've got that, right? Then if I hide that, it comes back, right? Then we want this and we want to put in, oh, that's strange. It's now showing, oh, I've put it in the wrong place. I want to have it. But that's the white I'm hiding. No, no, wait a minute. What am I doing? That's that layer. What? That's on top of that. So this layer here is what I'm going to put on top. If I put it back like that, then I'm going to put it on this and it's going to add image to that layer. So I'm going to say add image. And I'm going to put in, well, hold on a minute, add image. Thought you weren't working there for a minute. Is this it? That's it. So we put that on top and we are principally interested in um, well, what we could do actually is we could rotate it like that. We've got a bit more room that way. So um, Then we're going to scale it up. Um, put it down there like that. And then uh, we want to have all of that on the screen. So um, like this, and then like this. And then we want to have Well, oh, we want that smaller. Okay, so we have that like that and bigger. Like that, okay. So we've got a little bit of the observers at the bottom there doing its thing. And um, don't really need to see met and all of that as well as the, as the Y. Get rid of that it's unnecessary so go here and here we could go and we could then say with a paintbrush we could get rid of this up oh, too much we want that smaller oh, that's, that's such a big uh paintbrush so we're going to do that That tied his sins up a bit. This thing here in, in Hebrew is gravity and it's kind of clutter that we don't really need. Um, that simplifies the diagram a lot. Um, 
and so what we're looking for is the this bit here and we'll cut it and then we'll move it out so we will do this do this we are not on the right layer we should be on this layer we do that then we do cut oh hold on undo no back oh do this right do this right on the right layer cut no not, not copy then paste then that is there then we rotate that that the other way Put it horizontal and then we'll make this be over here and then we'll make that bigger so the thing that says um that at the edge uh h should be a z so that should be um similar in size to that that's not big enough i think it's got a that 400 percent is as big as it goes it's getting very pixelated so if we um ignore the rest of this well we'll need to um, we've actually got it on the wrong layer haven't we because we wanted it on um yeah we put it on the wrong layer oh let's put it there that's all right um uh, we'll need to move the layer but this layer can go now this layer here can move so we can move that layer onto where it is that we want it which is like here um and then that's x y and z z but it won't be z it'll be h um but taking into account the dirac is in there um we need to move it over so it's got room for dirac and so um we'll have it there temporarily and then we'll get rid of it and then we'll bring uh what back um this and then we'll go and say put this on top of it and then we'll look at that alignment and we'll move it again where we'll say that will go on top of that where that is like that and that to rack in that thing there is sort of where that is so we kind of do this ish and that bit in the middle there where it's all that complexity <clears throat> we still have all of that but we kind of want both we want it to have it to say both so we'll leave that where it is and that's that so right let's go over this and mark it in red where it's wrong um i'm going to go like that pick red or well, red we're going to say right first of all that should be this and this should be z and um this isn't complexified so we want it to be complexified um h there is wrong and should be g um this frame bundle here is correct and this is missing a frame bundle um 
and I don't know where the frame bundle will be and where it comes into things actually in terms of this you know you go the frame bundle of that the double cover the frame bundle I mean all of this here that gets you to 128 um, that isn't the number that this is yielding in the context of this um, thing that I had earlier, right? So this here, if you look at it, it's all to do with um, U6464. That there is uh, Dirac, spin 7, U6464, and then it says H is equal to U6464 right there. So it's been decomposed. So that means we need this to be uh, decomposed. And so that's 128 there. And so that can't be right. That's got to be made into whatever it needs to be to be 6464. So in this, we can't be using D equals 4. It gets too complicated. Um, so put that in like that. Hide that. What? No, we need that. What am I hiding? We need to have D equals 4. Um, what let me do it on, on a layer that isn't letting me do stuff. 4. Where was the layer that I had here? Oh, I see. I got rid of that for the metric and everything. I see. Um, right. So I have four. That ends up being 14. Um, then it gets complexified and it gets complexified according to a rule where YM um, can be complexified to YMC if um, M is equal to 4K plus 2. And where k is a natural number. All right? So k has got to be an element of the natural numbers, and um, m is of that formula. And in the case where k equals 3, that would be a natural number. So you're all good on that one. And so you go 4 times 3 is 12, um, plus 2 um, is going to be 12 plus 2 equals 14. So that's a green light for it to be um, complexified. So actually all of that colour there, the red colour is all wrong. So that that's actually okay for you to go YMC is... Um, all right for 14 um, comma C that's perfectly legitimate <clears throat> so that should be 14 C here and come to think of it where I did this and I complexified it I never went and complexified this as well and I should have done um, good it, it sort of needs complexification doesn't it Anyway, too late to, you know, make everything super perfect. Um, so you make it complexified. Then you go off and say, I want it half of this, which is where the using the same formula, but then dividing it again by half to get a division of the formula by, not by two, but by four. That will give you 
uh, 2 to the power of uh, m um, divided by 2 will be the size of the space, right, for any spinner. So uh, a given spinner here will will need uh, for um, operating on a on a on a uh, on this. That's going to be giving you. Oh, that should be like much. Of, no, that's badly drawn. That should be a much, much bigger bracket. Because this is the Chimera fiber bundle is going into here. And that's operating on that. And that's operating on that. And then um, what the question is, is, is that group you then subject to a frame a double cover of a frame bundle or does a double cover of a frame bundle what's that do because the thing is it's u6464 i think the double cover of a frame bundle <coughs> takes u6464 so I think that this here then turns it into a Dirac and, and complexifies it again. So although we haven't yet got to the point where we decompose it, this in a sense recomposes it. I hadn't really realized that before. So when you do the double cover of the frame bundle of something that is, let's call it um, while um, spinners, then <clears throat> that will be um, yielding um, your direct spinners which is going to be Z. Okay. So, um, this here, if it was to be a formula, would be P um, of U of a dollar of C of y of seven seven that's the space that the chimeric fiber bundle was operating on and then when it says two to the power of blah 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 we don't do the calculation because it's like too hard that would be um, 128c And actually that C uh, that C there should be part of that. So that should be comma C in the power, not separate to this. Oh well I don't know actually whether it matters, whether it should be up there or whether it should be down here. Because the thing is is it ends up being 128 that side and and, and that, that side. So I don't think it really matters that much. So long as it's inside the bracket, it ends up like that. Um, don't know what's happening there. Um, right, seven seven. Then we've got that um, one hundred twenty eight, and. This has already been through 64, 64, then back to this. So 
it is in the state of wild spinners, not the rat spinners. Which means that C um, of that, I don't think changes the dimension of it. I think that it is the outer one here that does the job. Because it's this S of C to the power of that does it and makes it into something. So this here would be the would be effectively M, um, which would be here would be 14 comma C. So that is the input to this power there. So if you've got 14 comma double struck C, that goes into two to the power of M over two which then makes that 7 over 2, no, 7, that uh, makes it 2 to the power 7, which is 128. Um, when it's got C, when you divide C by 2, it's still an infinite set, so it, it makes no difference. And it's, it's like real numbers, dividing the entire 2 just, you know, scales it rather than anything else. So that's fine. So that is going to be that. And then that is the power of this, which is to do with this. Okay. And then the structure group here then has that 128C as the term. But because we've gone through decomposition, which we're not showing, because that's like, you know, decompose. And that ends up being 64, um, 64, which is actually 64 plus 64 minus. So that's going to end up being here. Uh, we're going to make the number, the size of the brush a bit smaller. So it's a bit easier to write in. So it's going to be 6, C, 64, 64. Okay, then we have that again. So that's inside of that bracket, that's inside of the Y bracket, and then you have the C bracket, and then you have that bracket. So how many brackets have we got? We need another matching bracket for the U. That's going to be over here. And that would be over this side. Now, if I then take this, and I then go off and say, ah, but I want to go back to where I was, and I want to take that, and I want to have the Dirac spinners, then I need to take that, and I need to go off and do a whole lot of, bunch of stuff with it. So then I do this, and I go, okay, um, I accept that challenge, and I go copy, and I go paste and I get that over here so that is going to be how long is this going to be long um, longer than I've given myself room for um, but actually, I could put it elsewhere on the screen. I could put it at the top here, because this is all screen too, isn't it? So I'll put it right at the top there. And um, I'll first of all wipe out that. And um, I'll make my brush bigger. I want to get rid of this. 
so that I can work in this area and um, right like that and then we'll just erase this little bit here where we were working on well, working on the group and well, actually it doesn't matter because you can't see it anyway it's off the screen because the way I've done the crop um, get rid of this as well that's what I wrote before when I was doing it myself earlier and it's probably going to be a lot better like this so so we do this so we're going to find a way of putting this in here it's going to need to have a P all the way over on the left over there and then room for it saying cross with the row Dirac Z um, and ideally the whole thing should be in line with this but I don't see that happening but we could try uh, fitting it all over that side of the diagram um, but actually having it on the left and it's fitting so it ends up with Z there would be um, kind of incredible really but we'll, we'll see so Right, don't forget the frame bundle thing. That's that's kind of important. Um, that there is a double cover of the frame bundle. Okay, so we need to do um, I've forgotten, what, I've forgotten what this thing was. What is this frame? Is it on the list on the thing here? Um, P. Oh, it's P of that. Oh, okay. That's very direct. So this here needs to have more red, which means here, I will need to have that and then have that and then have that from a color or select it from somewhere like this like that, and then I have to be back to uh, making it small again that'll do and then we'll have that be that's not very good it needs to be more saturated can I not make it more saturated than that full saturation okay so we've got the frame bundle here that's too bored and blurry um, okay so there's that and then we're going to do big P like that go over that and make that even bigger later and that's the wild spinners there, right? Uh, the frame model of the wild, wild system, blah, blah, blah. So that's the kind of general idea of what I want. And then I will put it in here, what it actually will look like. So it's going to be like this. It's going to end with Z. And so it's going to go something like written backwards. It's going to be on Z. And it's going to be Dirac in Roman. Then it's going to be row. Then it's going to be a cross term at the midpoint of that letter there and that and that. And then all of this stuff that I'm writing down here is a subscript only all of that here is what gets you 6464 so that is the frame bundle of C77 C77 
Now, is the phone bundle C77? Hmm. Is the phone bundle giving you more than the dollar thing? Yeah. Is this thing here unwieldy? If I just say frame bundle, double color the frame bundle, that is it going to be too much? If I say you is the group, and then I go off and say, well, actually, we want to do the double cover the group, that might be enough to get me this. So a double cover 64, 64 might get you back to U128 double strut C. But the frame bundle might be, is this something where that is the frame bundle? Because the frame bundle, is that getting you the... Um, Is that getting you the decomposed wild spinners of um, C77? There's a couple of ways this could go. Because C by itself, I don't think that is 6464. And it says it's Seven seven. So in there, there's no mention of 60, 64, 64. But you need to. So is it saying that you go from seven seven directly back to one hundred twenty eight C? Because that would be two to the power of like one of them. Complexified, wouldn't it? So if you knew that something has got left and right 7-7 seven, seven, and it's symmetric, and then you say, right, give give me one of those sevens and I will use it as a power of two, and then I'll ally it with the complex numbers. Is that what it's doing? with FR, with the frame bundle. Because I don't want to just put an FR in front of this and put it down here and say FR of all of this and then a double cover of all of this and it be overkill. Because the thing is, is what overkill would that be if you did that? Because wouldn't it be that the frame bundle would be for this to be making something out of C then C is not 6464 C is like Y77 and it's hiding the Y77 in there it's like C of Y oh what what C of Y77. And then you're doing the frame model of that to get to the next thing. And that here is looking very like that there. So if that is like that, then the dollar thing and the u of the dollar thing that gets you to i mean the u is just a unitary group with that as the size of the group the dollar thing is what generates 64 64. so i'm inclined to think that the frame bundle and the dollar thing are 
well, they're not synonymous because, wait a second. The dollar thing with this, it isn't, it isn't dollar with 6464, 64, is it? It's, it's dollar in the case of this thing here with 128C. So when it's dollar, it's Dirac spinners. So this is instead of dollar. So you don't have the dollar when it's an FR. And so having got that far, you're basically saying, don't give me the direct spinners, give me the wild spinners, which means it does give you 64, 64. And then the double cover of that will then give you the direct spinners, 128C. Right, okay, so in the case of doing this, you are going to do P Dirac, and you want something that's going to be Dirac spinners, which is why you have the double cover of the frame bundle that is operating on the wall spinners. And the wall spinners are that, and they look like that, and... Um, Okay, so I think we're ready. So we can go like that for you. Then we need to have 64, 64 in there. So I can write it, hold on. Um, then we do this. Then we do this. Y there C there. If we were to do that, that would not make sense because this is um wild spinners, not direct spinners. So we get rid of that and then we go off and put in the frame bundle and then we then do the double cover in order to get it so that it's fit to be Dirac and then we then make that our principal bundle which means we then do that and that's it so that is the correct formula for the principal bundle uh, according to this whole damn thing um so we'll get rid of that and we'll put in a p there and wow so and so that will then move over to where this is and that would be um that far over and that would be uh mean that that would be that far over so it would be quite far over it would be kind of like moving it uh, v and i'd have to move it like this and then down here like that and then i'd have to shrink it a bit so it fit on there and i'll go a bit smaller still and I'll then put it there. But wait a second, I've missed out a whole bunch of stuff because I haven't put in the U part. Where's the U part? I haven't put in the U of this, have I? But the thing is, is he doesn't do it either. He doesn't say he doesn't include the U in his thing where it's this. Um, so he, this thing here, this frank P of double cover of FR C77 and H, he says H is equal to U6464. So he puts it in at the end. So, so long as you say 
that Z is equal to U6464 is in there. So you could probably simplify it and take that out and um, get that away and, and not have that extra complexity. So it would be FR of C of Y and then have a bracket there and then have that. It would be that and you just scrub that out and then it would be that. So, okay. And then you have to have the prior definition of Z and then you, well, I mean, you need to define your group. But uh, he says, uh, in this, he says P of G um, is equal to this. And he then says P of the double cover of FR of C of Y seven seven brackets for that and then brackets for this and it's only two brackets because you don't need the 64 64 part yeah and then you do cross term higher up up here and then you go low down row then Dirac in Roman letters and you then have Z high and then you say where um, Z is equal to U6464. And this is going to be while uh, spinners. Okay, okay, okay. I think we understand. So, that's kind of complicated, isn't it? So we want to have a bit of different color and we want to go and knock this out. Um, as not not being relevant, and this is relevant. That's not relevant. So that's our um, that's the whole thing. And then we're going to have another color, which is going to like put a box around all this. We're going to say that's the stuff that we're interested in. That. Okay. Right. That's good stuff. Right. I'm going to. I'll get to reading the comments in a minute. I've really got to make a phone call um, and make a cup of tea. So um, I feel quite pleased that I've done that because I now understand that the frame bundle, double cover frame bundle, is to take you from, I think, wild spinners back up into dealing with direct spinners, which means that the gauge group is of um u128 so that means that that will be uh u128 c i would imagine and if it's not that what the hell's going on because what is going on how can it be otherwise if it's like z is this and the rest of it is different but i've got to mess up my z there um, 
there. Okay. It could all be tidied up a bit more. Got a low battery on my phone, can't make a phone call.
tea. Um, I just need to see if the phone is charging at all. It's not too bad. I could probably do something with it. Um, I'm going to uh, leave something on while I'm away on the phone. And before I do that, though, I need to finish off the rest of my thing. So this is basically that, but without the um, complexification. So if I was going to edit it and put in the complexification, I put in a little subscript C there and a little subscript C there and possibly even one there. Because I think you could complexify the dimensions of space time as well um, in order to get this because real space would uh, exist within complex space, wouldn't it? So um, I don't know. I mean, he hasn't said that, but um, um, but the main thing I wanted to do, do is not explain the whole of geometric unity here and now, but to say um, how to calculate things. And I don't think I'm doing a very good job of it. Um, so M is the unrestricted set of dimensional measures of the surface XD, which is calculated as an enumeration of every coordinate axis, the angles between each pair of coordinate axes, and the component parts of an arrow in terms of the length alongside each adjacent axis in the coordinate system. Um, so, um, if you look at this and you go off and say, right, how does that work? And you just go hide everything else. Well, you need to hide everything else. Then we on the top layer, yeah, we're going to do some coordinate axes. So we're going to say, let's say green for the baseline. And we're going to say green. And that's going to be the X axis, right? And so that's one dimension. And then we're going to have a second dimension, which is going to be blue to match the sky. We're going to go up from here. That's at 90 degrees, and that's going to be Y. So, so far, so good. Most people are going to be happy with that. In that, we're going to have an arrow. I'll call it A, right? And on that, you could then say, well, this arrow would have parts that would be um, how much it would be in each of these dimensions, right? So the dimensional component in X would be from here to here, wouldn't it, right? And that could be seen as in context with A as being um, from that point to that point because it has to be in parallel to x but only we're not thinking in terms of how much up in this direction it's going that's not considered we're only considering how much in this direction it's going okay these are the component parts of the arrow of a so that's the first thing and then we're going to do it also um, for y. And then we're going to do a how much of y it is. And if we were going to do the amount in y, well, well, we'd probably put something over here to say how much in y it was right as that's going to be parallel to this and so that's going to be measuring it in y as much as it was in the other 
right? Now, it's a bit hard to tell what's going on there. So what we'll do is we will do it in terms of the colors of the components that we have. So we have this, we'll make it a bit thinner, and then we'll zoom in. And we're going to draw a component for this part in the horizontal to there. So that's the same as this. Right? And then we're going to do it for Y, which is going to mean matching the Y. And then we're going to say, from this position, though, we're going to draw up to the tip here. Right? And that's going to be the same as us going along um, in the adjacent axis. Okay? So going from that as our starting point, here, we can then go along in X by a certain amount, and then up in Y by a certain amount. And that gets us all the way along that arrow, okay? And we could measure this. We could go off and say, right, well, we want to have measures, and we're going to say the measures are going to be so you turn that into threes and um, that's into little tick marks along there. So that dimension now has scale. And then we're going to say that's uh, one division, one division, one division. That, that would be the origin, would be there, that would be there, that would be there. So this is very simple coordinate space. You could make this all into a grid, of course. And all of these grid squares would be square, and they'd all be uh, 90 degree angles, etc, etc. But we don't need to complicate things with grid squares, because it's fairly obvious what's going on here, right? So we've got an arrow in a coordinate space, which is defined by an X and Y axis, which are our dimensions. And the arrow is described by coordinates, um, but, sorry, by component parts. So if we were only thinking about the arrow and we didn't know that the origin was down here, then if you would just say, I have a point here, I want to know how much I need to go in terms of the um, axes of the dimensions um, to get to an offset, right? And this offset will be the tip of the arrow. You've got your starting position, you've got your ending position. How do you get there? And it's like, well, you go so many blocks this way, like in you know Manhattan. You go so many blocks on east, and then you go so many blocks north. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to go one, two, three blocks uh, east. It isn't east, but we're just going to say it's east for the sake of... Um, this example, and then we're going to go uh, one block north, because that's just one block. And so that's going to be one block north. And so that's our direction. So even though we don't know where we're starting from, right, because I mean, here we have zero, but in space, in outer space, we don't have a zero, right? There is no fixed point from which everything is officially measured. So that goes, and so we have a implicit frame of reference for doing relativity with, and we're just going to say, uh, okay, well, we're measuring stuff happening within this local area. We're going to place our reference frame, right? And this is our coordinate space for, you know, 
the sun and the moon and the earth and whatever, right? And so we pick our position within, you know, relative to the sun, let's say. And we have, say, the sun here. And so that would be Sol, which is the official name of the sun. And then we'll say, and this is B, maybe the earth, right? And then we'll be like, um, then we like saying, well, this could be the moon, right? Because we want to work out how to get to the moon. But it's not all two dimensions, it's four dimensional, but we're not drawing in the extra dimension. We're making everything on the same plane, which it basically is in space, because the Earth is going around the sun and the moon's going around the Earth. It's all basically happening on the same uh, flat elliptic plane. And um, obviously the distance of the Earth from Sol is more than, it's more than three by three uh, units away. Um, and of course, by this measure, if it was consistent, then the moon would be incredibly far away, right? Because if the, the if the distance between the sun and the earth is one distance, then the distance between the earth and the moon would be as far um, in terms of how far east it is. Uh, so that that doesn't make sense scale wise. So don't don't worry about that for the purpose of this. Uh, this isn't to scale at all. Not um, to scale. And this isn't like a commentary on general relativity not being to scale. I'm just saying it's a bad drawing. Um, but the point is, I shouldn't have started putting on soul and earth and moon and so forth. And then I've got mixed metaphors with Manhattan distances, you know, going around Manhattan going so many blocks uh, east and so many blocks north. But what we've got here is we've got a way of marking this line with the lines below, the tick marks below. So we've got that one there, that one there, and we've got just the one there from this point to that point. And so <coughs> that gives us our thing where we can now forget about the axes and zoom in. and we are just um, dealing with um, our, um, you know, we've got our instructions of go, like I'm in Manhattan, I don't know roughly where I am in Manhattan. I don't know any of the landmarks in Manhattan. But someone says, well, if you leave your apartment building or your hotel that you're staying in, I know you're staying in, to meet me at Trump Tower, you need to go three blocks east and one block north because they've walked it before they've got a map or something right so I go off and I cross you know that distance and I find myself in front of Trump Tower and I wouldn't have known how to get there because I'm not you know I'm not a New Yorker and I don't know where things are so I mean you could say well I'll just get in a taxi and tell them to take me to Trump Tower but this um this arrangement here would would be like that so to work that out you'd have to say trump tower would be here and then your hotel um would be here it would be um three blocks west of trump tower and one block south of trump tower right so that's all straightforward i think and that's where it is where you have it and it is just two axes and then an arrow between those axes. Now, we can then complicate this by then saying, well, what happens if we're dealing with a third axis? And the third axis will have coming out of the screen like um, like that. And that's going to be the Z axis. And at the moment, this arrow here isn't making use of it. But if it was, it would have, you know, it would have some sort of thing where it would be start here and end here 
and then as a result of that it would have some kind of adjacency to that and you know but it, it wouldn't because it'd have to be that that z would have to be go further down wouldn't it it would have to be i have to draw this sort of like that and then that would then um be in terms of how far along that it was i think wouldn't it um is that right it, it complicates things to add in a that z dimension when you're dealing with um with this figure so i'd, I'd sooner not um i could draw things again and i can then say let's just keep things uh as being um that and now let's have a third dimension there going away and so these are all dimensions these are in the foreground that's going off into the distance and then we want to have another dimension which is going to be like well how do you make this one orthogonal to these because these are all got 90 degree angles that's an angle um there's an angle there and then there's an angle um here and then there's going to be an angle um basically there right and how does this work with this um doesn't seem to work at all well and you count up those angles which there's three of them and if you're going to la label them there would be uh the angles between um you know it would be um the angle here of the x and then y and then z um then this one here we're gonna to have to give it a name i'm going to give it the name w because i can't call it t because we're not dealing with time and this is going to be the fourth dimension okay and it doesn't go after z so there's no letters after z and this is just um space right fourth mention of space and then we go and say okay um let's write down our angle well first of all we're going to have how many axes let's enumerate those we I mean, let's name them we've got x y z and out in front we've got w so we've got four of those Now we're going to have angles between pairs of axes. And this is what um, Einstein did when he was um doing uh, special and general relativity so we have an angle between say x and y which is the green one and um so there's an angle between x and y and then we have an angle between um y and z which is the red one an uh, angle between the z and x the z and x uh, which is the yellow one now we're going to have more angles where it's all w with everything else so it's w with x w with y and W with 
dead. Right? We count that up. Going to have six of those. Now, when we looked over here, we had this thing that had components. We had the same number of components, i.e. two component parts, and one along the horizontal, one along the top, um, as we did before. And we can write the components in that instance for the arrow A as being, say, A is equal to and we write it as a vector and we say uh, how much in the x and how much in the y so in the case of that one it's like well we went three blocks east and then we went one block north and the both of those were positive so that one block north would be like that and so that one would be the x um translation and that one would be the Y translation from that point there to get to that point there. You go that way along there and then that way along there. And that's what that tells you to do. You apply that one first and then you apply that one second. Um, you could do it the other way around. Uh, it get, gets you the same answer. All that happens then is you go that way and then that way. And that is essentially either way it doesn't matter, like, so long as you know you're east from your west, from your east from your north, it doesn't matter if you get your instructions as being, go to Trump Tower and it's three east, one north, or one north and three east. Either way, it's going to get you there, right? From the, from the correct starting position. So... We will um, hide this stuff. We're getting a bit busy. All right. And we now need to have the components of um, the uh, arrow that we want. So the, the components of the arrow, we're going to just take it from here. And say, what is it in this circumstance? He's going to say, well, the components are going to be, hold on. The components are, try and select it without selecting anything else. Um, the components are going to be there. Um, of an arrow, and um, we on that of arrow, and just finish off cut on there. And the component parts of the arrow are going to be how much in each of these um, portions that are adjacent to the um, axis, right? So how much in X, how much in Y, how much in Z, and not forgetting W. So this is going to be a vector, which is going to be how much in W, how much in X, how much in Y, and how much in Z, All right? And again, we've seen this before. This is a rank one tensor so we know that we've seen the ones that have got like this and it's like both directions now when you come across them in einstein's work it's not written in like this with a grid it's written in like this in an open thing where you kind of um, it's written in like this, where it's kind of like, you know, zero, 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 um, one, um, that's 
those are not real values that you'd see but that's kind of that's kind of what it would look like and some people would say oh well that's a matrix and the thing is is like well yes it is but um a tensor will have things about it that are geometrically specific to a tensor and they're a little bit different um but also a tensor is a generalization it's a it's a something that can be a two by two matrix like uh, no it would be a four by four matrix this but it could be like that or it could be like this where it is a uh i think you do row then column so it'd be a four by one um and that is um, a vector. Um, and if it's just a single entry, sad little single entry by itself, and it is a one by one, then that is called a scalar. And that will be a rank zero. okay now you can have a rank a half um and we could i could leave you with that next but this is going to be equals to four of course and if you add this up you get four and six and four and so four and six um four equals 14. So that will be how it is that you get to um, the 14 dimensions of geometry unity by uh, enumerating the axes, the angles between pair of axes and the components of the arrow within the coordinate space. And that part there is not usually considered and it's only this these things here that are in um, um, general relativity and then if you are in dealing with geometric unity then you have all of this here and it includes that so when he says he's going beneath Einstein he is uh, saying that you know, he's not, he's using restrictive set of dimensional measures and he's selected them. He's, Einstein selected 10 dimensional measures and Eric Weinstein didn't select a damn thing because he just let everything make use of everything that was available. And so this is the unrestricted um set of um, dimensional measures for x4 right so he starts off with x4 Einstein doesn't he starts off with actually strictly speaking he starts off with m uh, he starts off with m13 um, but that's just to kind of as a convention um, probably write that three bit better okay so he starts off with M13 just because he's using different lettering. Um, it could have been an X. It doesn't really matter that it's an X or, or an M. And um, this is, um, I feel, closer to he, I feel he's not looking, I feel that Eric Weinstein is not looking himself out. Um, 
from a uh, theory of everything some ways down the road um, because he is not selecting a set of dimensional measures. If you go into it and you say, right, I just will have and pluck out 10, and that's what I'm using, that's all I need to do my theory of gravity, well, that's all well and good, but why did you pick 10 out of all the ones that are available? There are a total of 14 available, right? And you're only using 10, which is kind of like, well, why, right? Because it's like you're adding in a parameterization to pick 10 out of 14, and you're leaving behind four, right? So the four that remain could be used for something. And the 10 that you have, maybe they could serve a double purpose. And so where we are with geometric unity is it's actually 7-7 seven, seven, um, is equal to 6-4 um, which is a 10 part plus 1-3. And then if you add up all of those things, you'll see that they all add up correspondingly. So that um, and that uh, yields um, 7. 6 and 1 is 7. 4 and 3 is also 7. Okay? So that is a super, 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 duper, uber, 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 simple explanation of what's going on in geometric unity in terms of the spaces. And then this thing here, ends up being a spin group of spin, um, well, first of all, the one at the bottom is spin 1, 3, and then that one is crossed with spin 6, 4. Okay, and then that one then goes on to make your group here, which is um uh spin seven seven right and we've seen elsewhere that he says well spin seven seven is inside of u sixty four sixty four it was on the other page he did the other day other other thing and then he kind of puts it inside a, a frame bundle and then that ends up being this U128C of um, these um, Dirac um, um, spinners, All right? And so that's essentially it. Uh, with the geometric unity thing, and this is all geometric unity in terms of the spin groups. And I'm um, having explained that we could talk a little bit more about tensors and scalars and stuff like that in the context of quantum field theory. And um, I could leave on a video and see if I could phone someone up. I need to phone up. Um, so the so this is the spin seven seven is equal to um, u sixty four sixty four like that, yeah. And then we need to look up the stuff that says the spins or six four something rather. Where was it? Um, Here he's doing something where the while spinners of the structure groups spin seven seven. He has the left handed things that spin left and the right handed stuff, and then it fits inside of the drag. It doesn't say U 128C, um, but it does say that the left handed stuff is uh, positive there, and the right handed stuff is negative. 
and then you go and you look at the this thing which is a fermionic field complex and um that is um also got it there and you'll see above the line it has a spin 77 with 64 minus and then down there at 64 plus and so there is a um 64 64 split going on in this diagram and this is all to do with the whole thing being um non-chiral uh having parity and then if we look at the um i don't know where it's going to be it's probably um here this is going to be that same information but this is as a slide from the lecture and so it's a bit hard to see um but that's essentially the same bit of information there as it is on the other one um if i go and i bring over the document we don't really need it here now when put it over there then i put this there and that there then oh we need that bigger so we need to have that over there so that one you can see roughly that this is the same thing right hopefully and um so this uh, slide was in the lecture in 2013 and it's a dead giveaway that um this was also um uh, based around u6464 talking too much that my my teeth going cold so that is like the most important thing in the entire reaction because he's saying in his lecture um at this one point he says um chirality is not fundamental uh but it's only emergent and the chiral complements are dark matter if we make that a little bit smaller maybe we do that so chirality which is like hands being different you know one hand cannot fit into the uh, space of another hand that shape and that shape they look like the same but they can't actually occupy the same space if they were symmetrical they could um that thing that is handedness uh which is referred to in uh science as chirality um uh, which is a trait of uh, the weak interaction um is something which is something he thinks is not fundamental and he says that uh and it was controversial at the time uh when it was experimentally shown that in our universe the weak interaction had particles that um span out left of the experiment six percent more the time than the other span out up to the right and it was like well that's odd we would expect it to be a mirror symmetry where it goes you know 50 50 50 50 but as it was it was kind of like um it's kind of like uh you know 60 40 um uh 60 40 and then what well, 60 40 and then you know 60 40 so yeah invert the experiment you get um it coming out with a different result where it's now going left rather than right because you turned it upside down and it shouldn't be you know it shouldn't matter what the orientation is um so um he's saying oh well the answer to that is simply that yes it is doing this handedness thing on this um you know space time 
But when you consider the whole thing, the whole of this, it's going to be um, uh, having symmetry within all of that because you've got all that much more room for everything to have a quantum field theory that has that symmetry. Whereas over here, it's it's only got four dimensions. There's not really room for it to have extra fields that would give it all of that. So that's quite a big, complicated diagram. And um, he can do that diagram because um, he's got U6464. And U6464 is massive uh, in terms of like how big it is as a as a gauge group com compared to say the um standard model which is which is probably covered is uh su um three cross su2 cross u1 so compared to u1 which is hybrid charge which includes within it u1 em which is um electricity magnetism and light unified so you've got all of those phenomena like all the colors of the rainbow, um, you've got your cosmic rays, your extreme ultraviolet light, your ultraviolet light, uh, you know, violet into red, infrared, um, microwaves, um, television, radio waves, and then the extreme long frequency waves that are used to communicate with nuclear submarines. All of that is the electromagnetic spectrum. And, you know, in that, you've got pink, right? You know, inside of that visible light, you've got pink. Pink is one color among many, right? So just think of all the colors that are in the, the visible wavelength. And that's not even like the colors of flowers, because the colors of flowers, flowers are stripy. The leaves of flowers have got stripes on them. And um, you know, all the ones that you think are not striped, you know, they've got stripes on them, and they're there to attract bees because the bees can see in ultraviolet light. So they've all got these ultraviolet markings on them. Um, so we, we go in the garden, it's like we, we're not seeing half of what's out there. Um, so this um, thing is pretty crucial to the fact that he is saying his theory is non chiral and is describing a fundamentally non chiral world um, or observerse out of which uh, our universe will seem as if it's chiral. He's not disputing the results of the research that led to um, uh, Nobel Prize, right? Where they were saying, well, we found out that this weak interaction is um, uh, chiral. He's not saying it's not. He's saying that that's how it is in our universe, but there's more than just our universe. And if you were to go and be outside of our universe, it would not seem chiral anymore, right? So we're only seeing a part of the story, okay? And there is probably a bit in this, in the lecture, where he mentions this, but I don't know where it is. Um, it will be um I'd like to find the bit where he mentions it. Got it there. Um I've I made a comment on this, so I should know from the comment where it is. Uh two oh eight thirty-five. Okay. We then choose to add some stuff that we can't see at all, that's dark. And this matter would be governed by forces that were dark too. There might be dark electromagnetism and dark strong and dark weak. It might be that things break in that sector completely differently. And it doesn't break down to an SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 because these are different SU3s, SU2s, and U1s. 
and it may be that there would be like a high energy SU5, you know, or some uh, salam model. Imagine then that chirality was not fundamental, but it was emergent, that you had some complex, and as long as there were cross terms, these two halves would talk to each other. But if the cross terms went away, the two terms would become decoupled. And just the way we have a left hand and we have a right hand, and you ask me, right, imagine you have a neurological condition in an Oliver Sacks sort of an idiom, and somebody's only aware of one side of their body, and they say, oh my God, I'm deformed, I'm asymmetric. Right? But we actually have a symmetry between the two things that can't see each other. Then we would still have a chiral world, but the chirality wouldn't be fundamental. There'd be something else keeping the fermions light. And that would be the absence of the cross terms. Now, if you look at what happens in our replacement for the Einstein field equations, the term that would counterbalance the scalar curvature, if you put these equations on a sphere, they wouldn't be satisfied if the T term had a zero expectation value because there would be non-trivial scalar curvature in the, in the swervature terms, but there'd be nothing to counterbalance. It. So it's fundamentally the scalar curvature that would coax the VEV on the augmented torsion out of the vacuum. So the VEV is the vacuum excitation value. To have a non-zero level. And if you pumped up that sphere and it smeared out the curvature, which you can't get rid of because of topological considerations, so let's say from Chernvay theory, you would have a very diffuse, very small term. And that term would be the term that was playing the role of the cosmological constant. So in a large universe, you'd have a curvature that was spread out and things would be very light and things would get very dark due to the absence of curvature linking the sector. And that turns out to be exactly our complex. Okay. So um, that's pretty much like the payoff to the talk. So in other words, just to recap, starting with nothing other than a four manifold, we built a bundle U. The bundle U had no metric, but it almost had a metric. It had a metric up to a connection. There was another bundle on top of that bundle called the chimeric bundle. The chimeric bundle had an intrinsic metric. We built our spinners on that. We restricted ourselves to those spinners. We moved most of our attention to the emergent metric on U14, which gave, gave us a map between the chimeric bundle and the tangent bundle of U14. We built a toolkit allowing us to choose symmetric field content to define equations of motion on the cotangent space of that field content, to form a homogeneous vector bundle with the fermion, to come up with unifications of the Einstein field equations, Yang-Mills equations, and Dirac equation. We then broke those things apart under decomposition, pulling things back from U14, and we found a three-generation model where nothing has been put in by hand, and we have a 10-dimensional normal component, which looks like the spin 10 theory. I can tell you where there are problems in this story. I can tell you that when we move from Euclidean metric to Minkowski metric, we seem to be off by a sign somewhere, or I could be mistaken. I could tell you that the propagation in 14 dimensions has to be worked out so that we would be fooled into thinking we were in a four dimensional world. There are lots of things to ask about this theory. But I find it remarkable that tying our hands, we find ourselves with new equations, unifications, and three generations in a way that seems surprisingly rich, certainly unexpected. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, so I obviously am skipping a large portion of the lecture because I didn't want to miss the conclusion by running out of time. That doesn't mean that I'm quitting. <laughs> I'm not quitting, honestly. Um, I'm going to go back to where he was at the beginning and where that all leads in with 
his talk about Witten and everything. Now, the um, there's lots here to go through, obviously. And um, it's like, what order do you even do it in? It's like, not really that clear. And it's like, you know, there's, there's so much to kind of cover. Um, but um, I think what's important to, is to say we will um, have a quick look at a video uh, which is about um, quantum field theory visualized. So uh, that should be here. Uh, close that. Is it something I can do about this? It seems awfully large. Oh, it's because I made it like that before. I see. Um, so, quantum field theory visualized. There we are. In uh, visualized. This video is excellent, 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 right? It's by far the best video about this topic online. And while I go away to make a cup of tea and see if I can get through to my brother to wish him a happy birthday, um, I'm going to leave this plane. Hopefully I don't get into trouble playing it and we will skip over some of this and we will get to maybe here and uh, let's see what is it um okay um so um Right, that sort of looks like that's looking at it, um, which is kind of fun. Um, let's get going on this. That said, special relativity imposes some restrictions. It forces us to respect We're certain symmetries like which correspond to the geometry of space-time. Symmetries of translation, rotation, or changing frame of reference. These symmetries are only respected by certain mathematical objects, and we can classify them with a parameter, spin. The simplest objects that we can use are numbers. We give them spin zero because when we rotate space around a number, it does not vary. Vectors, on the other hand, indicate a direction in space. Their appearance depends on the orientation in which they are observed. We assign them spin 1, because when we rotate space by a full turn, a vector also describes a full turn. Finally, relativity also allows other more exotic objects, and in particular spinners, which have spin 1 half. You have to make two turns around a spinner, for it to come back to its initial state. All these mathematical objects seem very abstract, and some are difficult to understand, but technically they all obey the symmetries of relativity, and are therefore potential candidates with which we could fill our universe. In addition to imposing the types of objects that are allowed, Space-time symmetries also set restrictions on the way objects behave inside the field. 
Each symmetry forces the field to respect the conservation of certain quantity over time. To obey relativity, our field must respect the conservation of energy, momentum, angular momentum, and velocity of the center of mass. Moreover, the mathematical objects themselves can contain symmetries of their own. If we decide to form a field with complex numbers, for example, they exhibit an internal symmetry, which implies the conservation of another quantity over time related to the very nature of complex numbers, the electric charge. At this stage, we have a space time which we have filled with a field which satisfies all the restrictions imposed by special relativity. But our goal is to describe the microscopic world, so it's time to turn our field into a quantum field. In quantum mechanics, to transform a classical object into a quantum object, we allowed it to adopt several positions at the same time, with more or less probability. This is superposition. Similarly, to transform a classical field into a quantum field, we allow it to adopt several configurations, multiple ways it can evolve with more or less importance. I think this is Over time, Everett. our field evolves as a superposition of all possible scenarios. Transitioning from a classical field to a quantum field results in a very interesting property. Just like an electron in an atom has well-defined energy levels, a quantum field also has energy levels. It can only contain an integer number of disturbances, quanta of energy, that can appear or disappear. So this is the work These of are particles. Planck. Much like a wave on the surface of water, a particle is simply a disturbance which propagates within the field. So it's excitation. A quantum field is also agitated by fluctuations, time. which keep popping in and out so of it. Isn't something moving These are called space. virtual particles. It's, like it's here. These and virtual it's particles here. exist only right. very briefly, like, so that it is strictly it's like, impossible to It's like a Mexican wave at a stadium, and people like going like this and putting their hands up in a row. And like step by step, coming, the waves our model universe is getting closer to reality. They don't move from their seats. We now describe a space-time filled with a quantum field, inside which move disturbances, particles, in a soup of fluctuations, virtual particles. In our universe, several fields coexist and constitute different families of particles. Some are vector fields, spin one, and the particles they contain are photons, Z and W bosons, and gluons. Others are fields of spinners, spin one half. They are the fermions that make up matter, quarks, electrons, muons, tau particles, and neutrinos. Finally, there is a field of spin zero, the Higgs field. Among all these fields, most have internal symmetries which provide them with quantities that are conserved over time. Charges, which distinguish their particles between several versions. So that's the work of... Um, um, that is the work of... Should be here somewhere. Um, I don't know. It might be on here somewhere. Here. So this is going to be Galois leading to the work of Sophus Lee, who then led to the work of Emmy Nerther. Okay. And Emmy Nerther is very important because she's the one who said, oh, this guy, Sophus Lee, who made differential manifolds uh with, with the, he 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 um took Everest galois groups uh, which are a set that has operations you know what a set is 
um, and surfacely said, well, we have that operate on differential manifolds, and that you can use that to describe this. And she came along and said, um, these uh, Lee groups that surface Lee's invented, um, they have, in, have these internal symmetries and the symmetries correspond to conservation laws in physics. So um, you will have for a given symmetry, which was covered in that documentary just now, you will have things like translation and rotation and things like that will be your symmetries. And then that will lead to things like conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. I'm not saying those exact things correspond. Um, those are the ones that you get from those symmetries. But I'm saying that she was the one to say physics was based on mathematics on this basic level of this thing. Now, the Lee the work of Lee, Lee gives you... Um, Where is it? Come on. There. Give you this. So these are all Lee groups. Okay? And you could even have a Lee group that defines the um, Lorentzian, uh, Lorentz group that is used by um, general relativity. And that looks like SL2, comma, double strut C. Okay? And from that, you get your X13. So this Lee group business um, is very, very important. And we'll, while I'm away trying to make a phone call, I'm going to leave you with um, Ed Witten, I think, if I can find him. Um, where is he? Where is Edward Witten? Hmm, this is it. So I put it at the beginning and um, hopefully you don't get any problems with the music. The story that leads to relativity began in the 19th century with the work of Maxwell, Faraday, and others on electricity and magnetism. They weren't originally trying to describe light, but when Maxwell discovered how to write equations that described electric and magnetic forces, an amazing thing happened, and those equations actually also predicted and described the propagation of light waves, and as it turned out later, also radio waves, TV waves, gamma rays, and so on, which are all different manifestations of the same basic phenomenon, the same basic kind of wave seen with different energies that came out of Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations have the very funny property that they tell you that light waves will travel in any direction at the same speed that we called and developed the theory of curved space time. And his basic concept was that when a planet goes around the sun, it's not because it's attracted to the sun, as Newton would have said, Rather, the sun has created curvature in space-time, and the planet is trying to find the closest thing to a straight line in a curved space-time. Just like Einstein's theories were developed to resolve contradictions between previously existing theories, the same was true for quantum theory. In fact, it happened, or it got started, in the same period that Einstein was developing relativity theory, and he himself was one of the protagonists. With quantum theory, the trouble started when the electron was discovered, just near the beginning of the 20th century. And the problem with the electron, it's an electrically charged particle, and as far as one could see, it was just a, a point particle, but at any rate, it was much smaller than anything known. And there was also the atomic nucleus discovered by Rutherford in his famous scattering experiments. And then there's a problem 
which is that the electron attracted to the atomic nucleus by electrical forces should be emitting electromagnetic radiation, otherwise known as light waves, according to Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. And when physicists calculated how long it would take an electron to spiral into an atomic nucleus, and therefore for the atom to collapse by emitting light waves, they got a ridiculously small time, much less than a million millionth of a second. So clearly something was wrong and a new kind of theory was needed. So Bohr took a famous step in 1913 with the Bohr atom, where he just guessed some rules whereby classical physics was incomplete and the electron just wasn't allowed to tumble all the way into the nucleus. But these rules didn't come with a coherent set of equations. You couldn't really calculate the energy states of an atom. Bohr proposed that there were energy states and he had some sort of arbitrary rules for what they would be in a few cases. But the 1910s were a period of tremendous experimental progress and lots of discoveries were made that gave clues that a new kind of theory was needed. And eventually it was put in its contemporary form in the 1920s when physicists got the brilliant idea that an electron, although it looks like a particle in most respects, can also be treated as a wave. And somehow the wave like properties of the electron cause it to be spread out and make it impossible for the electron to spiral all the way into the atomic nucleus. Um, there was an amazing constellation of intellectual history and the development of technology that made the science of science testing this possible at almost the same time that the theoretical idea emerged. So the science of the experiments were made by shining a beam of, of electrons on a crystal of atoms and looking at the directions with which the electrons emerge. <clears throat> so if you treat the electron as a classical point particle, it could come out in any direction. But waves have special behavior, which in everyday life you see, for example, if you see a rainbow in the sky, where scattered waves come out at preferred directions, a rainbow is created because the preferred direction depends on the color of the light. For an electron, the color corresponds to the electron's energy. When it scatters from a crystal, it will come off with preferred directions depending on its energy. And this was actually observed experimentally in around 1925 by Davison and Garmer. If you're curious where they got the electron beams that they scattered from their crystal, well, uh, old fashioned televisions, not the modern plasma screens, but old fashioned televisions were based on creating electron beams that make light spots when they meet the screen that you see. So um, technology creating electron beams has been important in the last century. And one of its applications was to test this basic idea of quantum theory. Wow. So I like putting a lot of music in this. And it's in Italian. They're sort of showing off a bit of the old thing I don't like very much, where they do this, but rather than showing it in 3D, they show it like as if it's in a trampoline. And I'm like, it's not like a trampoline. So that old thing of that moving through space with the moon rolling around it and everything, it's kind of like, well, no, not really. Because you're missing out on, you know, I mean, for some, one thing, it's yes, far too close to the sun, you know. But anyway, you know, people try with their graphics. This is the best I've seen, because it even includes the clocks. Um, I think this is Max Planck. Uh, <clears throat> so everything sort of roughly in the in a plane. This thing here that they show of the atom with the nucleus and 
electrons going around it. It's nothing like that. Um, we might be able to see a video of the um, electron. Um, I don't know if it's actually a video or, well, we'll see. Electron um, shells. image or something what atoms really look like um i think this is it i've seen this video before um we go These are um, so this is what you usually get, and then this is more like how things are. Or rainbow donuts, which are definitely more technically accurate or technically inspired, but none of which feel like they give me a sense of what's actually going on. Like, what does this blobby thing have to do with orbiting electrons? There. And another. So these are the electron cells. And these are the probability of where they are. And another. In fact, I made a bunch of these. And they're all mesmerizing and beautiful. And isn't the ground state of the hydrogen atom just so cute? And aren't the excited states so majestic? There's so much structure and detail in them, I just love it. You can see patterns in the orbitals, and you can get a sense that they actually are orbitals. I mean, something is orbiting. Okay, so I do have to be clear. The dots don't each represent a separate electron. The whole collection represents the wave function of a single electron, and the individual dots represent all the places that electron could be. Mm -hmm. A higher density of dots means a higher probability of the electron being there. The bigger orbitals are the ones with higher energies, because electrons with more energy are more likely to be far away from the nucleus. The motion of the dots is showing the flow of the wave function, and does correspond to an extent with its actual angular momentum, though they're not electron trajectories. Unless you think Bohmian trajectories are real, in which case they really are electron trajectories. I'll let the philosophers of physics fight that one out. Okay. But the point is, these visuals are created by representing actual electron wave functions in a visual language that our brains can understand, that of objects and light and shadows and motion in 3D space. There's actually stuff orbiting, and they're pretty. I hope you like them as much as I do. Oh, one final thing. I 100% get that these are not easy to draw. So if you want a cartoon representation of an atom that's simple but more closely based in atomic physics, here's my proposal. It's based on the orbitals from the p-block of the periodic table. One of them has the electron orbiting one way, one in the opposite way, and in the third one, the electron is orbiting the same amount, but around some perpendicular direction, and we can't know which, which is why the dots aren't moving in the middle orbital, and why I've drawn a dotted line and question mark for the sideways circle. Okay. And if you want, you can add an electron to each orbital, or two electrons, one oriented spin up and one spin down. This is a minute physics approved cartoon representation of an atom. Okay. But really, the beautiful 3D ones are where my heart is. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. So, um, I don't think that's an actual picture uh, of of the thing. Uh, that's like a simulation of the picture. They've done, I think, pictures of the thing. That's an actual picture of the thing. So, we're going to see if we can find that. Um electron um, okay individual atoms um, close up of atoms in a crystal this is 2021 it's fairly recent so let's zoom in <laughs> zoom in um so photograph of atoms um i 
and it's praesodium ortho scandate crystal. They used an electron microscope to analyze the crystal by calculating the angles of scattered electrons. So throw electrons at it, electrons come back at you, then you go, oh, well, you must have hit something. Whereabouts would it be? Probably be here, and therefore get an image from that. You can't use light because it, I don't know, I suppose it would get absorbed and energize the subject, but the electrons would just be deflected using, um, you know, an electromagnetic field without really affecting things, I don't think. Um, Oh, well, I want you to pay money, I think, to see the picture of the atom. Oh, well, yeah. Um, so we could see a bit more of what happened with the quantum field theory explained thing. The desktop one, here we are. We'll go back to this a bit. Have we got more on this? Standard model. Oh, we've got like antimatter. They talk about antimatter interactions. Uh, I think this is probably quite important. Uh, how is it that everything interacts in all of this? So we skipped some of the video. So there's reason for you to watch the video. Let's focus on one of the simplest interactions between the photon field and the electron field. We will allow an electron to emit or absorb a virtual photon and vice versa. Allowing only this simple interaction will have drastic consequences. For instance, in the following situation. We start with two electrons motionless. Over time, the two electrons progress towards the future. At first, one might think that the two electrons remain motionless indefinitely. But that would be forgetting that our electrons are constantly moving through the photon field with which we allow them to interact. We saw that a quantum field realizes all possible evolutions at the same time. In a way, each evolution describes a scenario. And in some of these scenarios, the electrons will interact with the photon field. In this scenario, for example, the electron emits a virtual photon at a certain instant, which carries away part of its momentum, and the virtual photon is absorbed a little later by the other electron. In this other scenario, the electrons exchange this time two photons. Or again, in this third, more complex scenario, the electron emits a virtual photon which is converted into a pair of virtual electron and positron that annihilate together into a virtual photon, which finally ends up absorbed by the second electron. By exchanging part of their momentum carried by virtual particles, the two electrons will in some scenarios get closer and in others get further apart. Now consider the following analogy. On a guitar, a string can vibrate with different frequencies, each of which corresponds to a pure sound. But when we pluck the string, it starts to vibrate in a superposition of all these frequencies with more or less amplitude. And the synthesis of all these pure sounds together with different amplitudes is what makes the total sound produced by the string. Similarly, a quantum field evolves according to every possible scenario with more or less amplitude, and it is the synthesis of all these scenarios together that describe the real evolution of the physical system. Okay, now this is an opinion alert, okay? My position on this, and this is not 
my reaction to Eric Weinstein. This is not to do with him. My position on this is that quantum field theory doesn't exist in the sense that um, it's not real. And I don't think what they're describing here um, is physics. And I think it's mathematics. And I think it's well-defined mathematics. And I think that it's consistent. And I think their models are correct. And they can predict things with it. But it's not real. And then you might say, well, what is real? And I think what's real is the stuff that we say is real. That is stuff that is that we have semantically um, assert to be real. So if you touch grass, you have qualia philosophically from the interaction with the grass. Now you can say, like Bishop Berkeley, you know, he was a medieval philosopher and he said, I can't be sure that anything's out there. Everything I do is mediated by my senses. So, you know, I could, you know, an apple could drop from the tree and you might say, well, that's gravity, but I don't know that I saw it. I mean, it could be that, you know, it's it's like I'm being fooled. My mind doesn't, I don't have a brain. My mind is somehow being given these sensations of seeing a tree with an apple that grows to Bigfoot stalk and then it um, falls to the ground and it's due to gravity, right? And we can say, oh, well, you know, physics starts from the position of saying there are phenomena in the world and the world is objectively real and it's outside of us and we're part of, well, it's outside of our minds, but it's uh, where our brains are part of that world and the phenomena are definitely there, right? And that extends from an apple being physically real all the way down to um, quantum phenomena, right? And the superposition of states and, you know, all of that, right? And I disagree. Um, Bridget Berkeley was saying, you can't be sure of anything that's out there in terms of your um, senses, okay? Uh, it's all mediated through, you know, if you touch something, well, yes, you've got touch receptors, but that's just a sense. If you're smelling something, that's just a sense. If you're hearing something, that's just a sense. If you're seeing something, that's just a sense. If you're feeling hot or cold, that's just a sense. So there are no direct apprehensions of what we might call quote unquote reality. So how do we know it's there? We don't know that we have a brain, right? We're just a mind. In fact, in my circumstance, I might be the only person to exist or the only mind to exist or you listening to this thinking how silly I am. Well, you might be the only mind to exist and it's completely subjective, everything you experience. So how do you know that there is any um, objective reality? And you might say, well, I stub my toe, I get pain and all of that, that's real, pain is real. Pain is seen to be a bad thing by our brains, which have evolved and our minds have evolved in order to make us think that they are like, let's avoid doing that again, because we'll damage ourselves, right? So when we get pain, unless like we're masochists, we like, well, that's thanks for you know, burning my hand on the stove. At least I didn't touch it too much and do do too much damage. If I rest my hand on the stove and start burning, 
I get the pain in order to tell me to take my hand away. Okay, now you can go and kind of say, I'm going to apply quote unquote mind over matter in order to keep my hand there, just to prove a point. But what I'm getting at is that the whole thing about, well, surely pain validates reality and it it doesn't really because it's just another sensation and same same goes with anything else you know having an orgasm it's just another sensation everything's just a sensation and you'll have people who have tested this out and they're like buddhist monks and they will put themselves into a starvation diet and get walled up in somewhere and and you know they give them a little drip feed of water and they go into this kind of meditative state and they think that's the way to reach nirvana unfortunately for them um you think oh i thought that buddhism was like one of the nice religions that didn't have weirdos in it but no no, practically every religion in the world, all of them have weirdos in it. And, you know, when you start realising that it's kind of a consistent pattern of religion and weirdos, you start realising that actually maybe there's a problem with religion. Right? That maybe not being religious is probably the better option. And then you say, well, what about atheism right that's like led to um communism led to maoism and it's like well not really because both marxism and maoism are a form of religion okay so they are in a sense a kind of cult and we have what we have in america in terms of woke is um maoism um, mixed with uh, Butler, Butlerism, Judas Butler, who's a student of Michel Foucault, which is post postmodernism. So it's kind of like a different, it's in a guise where it couldn't easily be it re rejected like an immune response by American colleges, because they were kind of quite keen on French uh, philosophy. Uh, the 1970s and 80s and so it kind of inveigled its way into the higher education it's kind of like oh well they're doing stuff to do with you know Michel Foucault he's cool and you know Jacques Derrida and Jean Baudrillard who inspired um, the Wachowski uh, brothers to make uh, the Matrix and you've got um, he wrote the book Simulations and Simulacra, which is in the film. Um, uh, and Judas Butler was a student of um, Michelle Foucault, and she's the one who starts up um, um, queer theory, and then Gail Rubin's working on queer theory, and um, that sort of lays the groundwork for taking the um, LGB thing and then they go off and they start saying well that's not enough even though you know you've got like gay marriage and stuff like that we need to keep pushing on this as if we're a minority that we're, isn't being totally normalized and embraced by society no we've got to make them seem like victims so we need another victim category which is a subgroup within the group that doesn't actually exist um, because there is no such thing as trans. And they go off and say, there's a thing. And I say, what is it? And they say, oh, it's called trans. And so they manage to create a thing called trans that doesn't exist. And then they go further when they say, uh, you don't actually have to do all this stuff for surgeries and stuff to be in this category there is like a umbrella categories for everything, which is going to bring in the LGB under this category. And um, it's queer. And that's offensive to people who are LGB because that 
term queer was seen as a slur uh, when it was used against them uh, initially. And then they rewrite history, they rewrite the events of the Stonewall Inn, which was um, started not by someone who's trans, no one was trans at that um, event, and um, it was started by the bouncer, who was a lesbian woman with blonde hair. Um, and they have retroactively made her a man. Yes, they've retroactively claimed that she was a man who was trans, rather than let her be a woman who was butch. Because they thought from the photographs, oh, well, she looks like a, a butch man who looks like he's dressing up as a woman, right? And so they thought she was a man who was dressing as a woman. Like, no, but we're dressing, I mean, let, just like, honestly, it's so stupid. And it's not even that long ago. It's not even that long ago, and they can't get the history straight. So, um, I mean, Fred Sargent is on Twitter. If you if you want to kind of irritate him, just say stuff about Stonewall, and he'll say, "I was there. I know what happened. Everything that everyone's saying that what happened is all wrong," and you get steamed up about it. Um, so. Um, A bit about Bishop Berkeley. You then lead on to Rene Descartes, who uh, came along a lot later, uh, but still, you know, today's, you know, in today's terms, is like ages ago. And he was a philosopher, and he said, um, "I, I doubt this. I doubt my senses. I doubt, you know, same stuff with Bishop Berkeley, covering the same ground." But then he said, oh, well, the only thing I um, am sure that I'm not doubting is the fact that I'm doubting. So I might not be real. I might not be in the world. My, the world might not be real. My senses might not be real. I might not like, have hands and nose and mouth and ears. It might all just be illusion presented somehow to my mind which might be i don't know where my mind is but i mean i seem to have a mind but i don't know what how that is doing what it's doing how that mind operates in what form that mind is constituted but there is a mind because it is actively doubting so to the extent that it's actively doubting and that characterizes the operation of the mind that doubtfulness is um, an acknowledgement that there is a process at work, which means that there must be that at least, right? So that led to cogito ergo sum, which is Latin for, um, I think, uh, therefore I am, which is kind of, like I doubt, therefore I am. And um, you can't really do better than that. That is where you are, that's where you're stuck. And um, you might say, well, there's gravity. And it's like, well, you perceive gravity, um, but your perceptions are senses. So no, actually, everything is uh, mediated through senses of a body that you don't know for sure you have out of a world that you don't know that you're in. And um, you do appear to be thinking and you, yourself, um, we're not quite sure about that either because the self could be an illusion. Like, if you think enough about that question, you kind of go a little bit mad, but it's kind of like, what is the self? And what is doing all of this thinking? And then you end up thinking about thinking and thinking about the process of thinking about thinking. And you have to be careful to structure your thoughts to make sure you're not 
kind of having a combinatorial, combinatorial explosion of uh, thoughts and sub thoughts, right? It almost helps to have a piece of paper and say, I'll have this offshoot of this thought, allow myself to come back to it, but I will branch that thought off and make a note and then carry on in my main set of thoughts and then revisit the other th sets of thought from that context because they will still be there right but you'll need to have a kind of mind map to be able to help order it and if you don't have the help I and mean, it sounds silly you have to have a, have a piece of paper and write it down but if you don't do that you will lose track of it all because your short-term memory isn't good enough to be able to keep track of those things and it's almost like it's deliberate it's almost like um the illusion of self relies on the fact that you kind of have stuff that's kind of slips out of your immediate apprehension and it kind of the stage is only so much so big for so many players at any one time in the play and then you start adding in new players and it's like well some of them are going to have to leave the stage Right, the ones that have said their lines, they you can go now. Now I have some more people on stage. Otherwise, it's going to be too many people on stage. Right, and it's kind of like that with the mind, and um, you don't notice it, but it is like there's a limit um, about how many things you can keep in your short-term memory all at once, and um, that has a way of like you know you're less likely to forget those things that are directly being consciously apprehended and the things that kind of go into your short-term memory um are kind of reasonably okay and the stuff that goes into your well no actually the stuff that goes into your short-term memory could get forgotten before it goes into your long-term memory and once it's in the long-term memory it might form enough associations with other stuff to have some purchase for it to be retrieved because it's more a question of like being able to find it again through the associations with other things than it is to it actually like it's like a filing system where you can go back to it and find it immediately it's helps to associate information with other information as much as possible so that when you come to elicit it it's got lots of kind of almost like metadata stuck to it. And then that metadata allows you to um, find it because your, your brain is, well, I say brain, your mind that presumes the existence of the brain um, has a whole lot of um, um, of those qualities, right? Now, in terms of how it, how it operates, seemingly. Um, now, obviously, in saying all that I've said, you know, you may mess up and you talk about brain and, you know, things like that as if it's a thing. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, what I'm saying is that you can't be sure that anything's real. Um, but what tends to happen is that for the sake of argument, for the kind of sake of kind of like livability, um, you can't go through life thinking, I doubt everything. So what happens is you tend to say, well, that pain, whether or not it was real or not, and the world is real or not, I don't like that. So I'm going to avoid doing that thing that hurts right that's not saying that the world's real that's just saying that i'm going to behave differently to avoid a sensation i don't like right um and it could be physical pain it could be heartbreak it could be whatever right um it could be like nursing someone you know back to health because you don't want them to die and suffer grief so people are helping other people um, overcome injury and stuff because they don't want them to die because of that. So that's, that's a good thing, um, one would think. But they're motivated out of, you know, not wanting to be bereft, right? Um, 
but then you have situations where people are, are terminally ill and you you're coping with that and you know that they're going to die and then it becomes kind of an inverse situation whereby you are almost having to grieve them ahead of they, their death because you know it's going to be really hard to deal with them dying and you're just thinking i've got plenty of time now i could probably start taking stock of my relationship with them say everything i want to say to them while they're here not leave things in a bad way and you know they're deteriorating their health is deteriorating so i could do to say all the things i need to say to them while they're here right and um it's good if you can do that you know don't be the person who doesn't see you know your sick uh, relative and then you travel around the world from australia to go to the funeral because like well you have to go to the funeral like for fuck the funeral go and see them the year before they died right make the effort to make the trip around the world when they were sick and they needed a visitor and don't go to the funeral right i mean you might not have the money for the plane ticket you see so i'm saying don't go to the funeral just because it's like the done thing and like where were you at the funeral fuck everyone else at the funeral they can go fuck themselves you should go for the benefit of the person who's now in the coffin right so um go go and see them before they get in the coffin and um that's the way i operate and i don't go to funerals at all ever um because there's no point because they the person isn't there um but i make sure that i you know see the person uh who's unwell um before they die and i think that's the way to operate um and you might say, well, how do you know to do that if you've just been saying nothing's real? And it's like, well, that's because it would pain me to do otherwise. And although that pain isn't real in, in a sense where you can say for definite it's out there and the world's real, uh, I would prefer not to experience that pain, that regret, that guilt, right? So I am... Um, you might say that doesn't make sense to feel guilt when you say nothing's real because surely if you felt that way you could just switch it off and be callous and not care and you might say well that's actually quite a good point actually you should in a way be able to um not give a fuck um because I'm, I'm a bit actually a, a bit of a sociopath and i've noticed this about myself and i have thought about murdering people and i thought i could murder that person i could murder that person and nothing really is holding me back from doing it um and i'm talking about quite important people like assassinating people and i don't care about myself about what would happen if i did it or whether i get stopped stop from doing it and it would lead to terrible consequences for the rest of my life because i'm that pissed off but um it just uh, well actually i tried to do it and i couldn't leave the country so so i missed the inauguration uh of joe biden uh so because of the lockdowns i couldn't um uh, leave the country because of the airports were closed so like okay so i suppose he's gonna have to live then but i mean you, i i i was going to be killing him right i was gonna shoot him with a sniper rifle um and um it's like well surely that's real I was like, well, I suppose, I don't know. I mean, is it real? Is anything real? Maybe that's me trying to make things real by actually changing things.
And if I'd somehow miraculously managed to do it, I think the country in America would be better off. Even if Kamala Harris was was president, or as she would be. Um, she's not mentally defected. Well, I, mean, I can disagree with her on policy, but she's not mentally defective, and she's not as corrupt as Joe Biden. Um, she's a bit involved with um, BLM and Nazis and stuff because of the bailouts of people who were in the George Floyd riots. But it's not terrible. It's not terrible. I mean, if she ends up on the ballot in the Democrat um, primaries because they kind of take the opportunity of the primaries to um, get rid of Biden and they put her in instead, I won't mind. Now, I don't think she's got a chance of winning against Trump. But um, I actually think she should be, um, I mean, 25th Amendment, they should invoke, invoke the 25th Amendment, and they should have her be technically president or the president for however long left they have until November. Have a female president. I don't care. If it's her, first female president. Um, I mean, the other option is kind of wild. You could go off and make AOC president. We would only be for like a month. Right? Because she's 35 in um, October. And the election's in November, right? So she could... They could invoke the 25th Amendment and get rid of Biden and put AOC in place and keep Kamala as vice. You know. So, I suppose it is weird for me to say, you know, I, I was planning on assassinating Joe Biden. Um, I've said these things in the past and I know that it gets me in trouble because I'm thinking, well, now I know I can't go to America, right? To, if I had wanted to, not that I ever did, but I'm very conscious that if I say something like that, they won't let me in the country. Which is fair enough. You know, they can go and fuck themselves, right? In their, in their country with all of these neon signs all over the place. They have such natural resources um, and beauty, natural beauty, in the wilderness. And they stay in their smelly cities with the rats and the homeless people that are shitting all over the streets and the corrupt mayors. And they keep re-electing, you know, Democrat mayors, even though... Um, it, they are acting against everyone's interests and raising taxes and bringing in immigrants and it's just terrible what's happening in New York and in Chicago. Um, complete failure. Oh, and in San Francisco, yeah, San Francisco. Um, extraordinary, extraordinarily bad. Um, you know, it shouldn't be that Mexico City is better than cities in America, but it is, okay? Um, and I think like the street food and the water will kind of give you diarrhea, but that's because foreign visitors are gonna be eating it and not used to it. And the people who live there are actually used to it. Um, but, I mean, the stuff they put in the food in America isn't exactly safe, right? So, um, kind of complaining about, you know, a taco in Mexico City making you squits 
um, is like kind of missing the point, really. Because um, most of the food, most places, is, is kind of bad. Um, I think um, food in Italy, food in Japan, they're probably all that. Um, uh, I think French food's got too much cream in it. Um, is there anywhere else that has any food that's decent? Um, not really. Um, not really. Think about world recipes. Um, pretty, pretty, pretty thin deal, really. The food from around the world is Italy and Japan, and that's more or less it. And that's terrible. But just two countries know how to cook. Um, so, I mean, you know, Jewish food is like not really any good, not that I've experienced, um, um, yeah, every, every culture has its own strengths, you know, you know, comedy, um, rap, um, you know, sports, whatever it is, they've all kind of got their own few things that they're good at and other things they're terrible at. Um, I don't fancy eating okra. Um, so let's see, what was I saying? I was saying about how you don't know the things are real, um, you doubt everything, so you know that you're thinking, um, and the illusion of self and how um, me saying I think is itself a fiction and you know, the, the thing that I ascribe to experiencing my senses such that they might be even real um, or assuming even that the senses are just fake, that entity of the self is, I think, itself a fiction. And you, you or I, I do not exist. So the world does not exist and I don't exist. My senses could be fake. And if you really, really think about it, there's no way of... You know, if you can't pin down your 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 yourself, when I say yourself, yourself, you can't pin it down, and um, I think it might be that you are reacting to things, and then your mind is making up a story to reassure you about what you're reacting to as if you're in control um so it could be that free will is an illusion and it's a a um retroactively applied re uh, rationalization of things um working out sometimes in your favor uh, according to your wants and desires um and when it doesn't, then you just say, well, better luck next time uh, for me to have my free will and have it satisfied. Well, it's not always going to be the case. It's going to go my way, is it? Because the world is full of other people who presumably also have free will. And so for them to have the world yield to them, it might be at the expense of it going my way. So, you know, not everyone can win the lottery, um, main prize in the lottery, because there's only like, you know, I mean, yes, but that's not a very good example because it divides up, doesn't it, if everyone gets the same number. Um, 
Well, if it was not dividing, right? If it was not dividing up and it was like 25 million pounds that you were winning and you pick unique numbers and no one else picked those unique numbers um, and you thought you had freely chosen those numbers and they weren't like your birthday or anything because people who pick their birthdays and everything, they're limiting themselves to the range of numbers that are on the form because the numbers go up to something like 40, is it? Or is it 49? They go way beyond like 30 or 31 for a month. So if you put down your birthday and all of that on there, you're not using half the numbers. So uh, that's why there's so many rollovers because they are in the bounds of people's self-selected dates that don't go up into the higher number dates. And so when I did do the lottery, I always picked uh, by hand numbers that were higher, but then I would make it so I changed them all the time. So that I didn't get into the psychological trap of thinking, this is, must be the week I do the lottery because you know every week I do, I must keep doing the same numbers. Those are my numbers. And if I happen to forget, then it's like I have anxiety over maybe, oh, I would win that week because of sod's law, you know, um, that would be the one week that the numbers would come up would be the ones that when you hadn't done them and you'd see the numbers and you think, great, I've won. Oh, no, I didn't do the ticket, you know. So I bet that happens to people a lot and it really upsets them. And the way to get around that is to have a lucky dip. But the thing with the lucky dip, it can be low range, but it, it tends not to be. It tends to have like a fairly even distribution with like at least one high number. So uh, if you see it and it comes out of the machine, it's got a high number outside of the month range. Uh, it's like, you know, good to use. And then you don't look at the numbers too carefully and you don't repeat them in, you know, every other week. Um, because you might not to do it one week. And, um, you know, you can kind of judge to do it as and when the rollovers seem to be getting to a, a significant amount. And um, it might be about to um, inevitably um, have to be a win. Um, well, not have to be a win, but be a win. But the thing is with the free will thing is... Um, Eric Weinstein doesn't like to even talk about it. Um, he said that. He said so. And I I would like to think that there was free will and that there was a way of being able to um, not have your life be completely deterministic. So it's not like free will in the sense that, um, you know, someone could work out in, th in theory, if they knew enough about the world, what your whole future would be and everything that's going to happen to you if they knew your situation and the world situation perfectly using like an amazing theory of everything, an amazing computer. Um, and so they'd know your destiny and your doom and your triumphs and your failures and it's like well um that's not really my concern about whether or not they could do that even if that was possible that's foreknowledge of those events with me um and acting on them and and having that privileged information to maybe fuck with me is not the concern as much as it is that evidently um, on that basis, it implies maybe that I am always picking the same choices when the choices come up. So you have like door A and door B, and I'm like going through door B. And, um, and then like the same situation arises and it's like, which door? And what sh what options should I pick? Should I stick with what I did the last time or do the other thing? But 
as if, as this is a completely new clean slate, right? Where I have no memory of what went before. It's just a new simulation. Then would I not have the option of it all, also picking door A? Um, now, should I have, is it better to have certainty of purpose so you're consistent under the same context to be picking door B because that is you, that's your personality. You are under those stimuli picking door B because you would. And then you're not like randomly for no good reason, for no explained reason, picking door A. I can't see that you would do otherwise other than pick door B. You picked it before, whatever impinged on your self in order to lead you to conclude you could go through door B, uh, the same stimuli are there, same memories are there because it's a reset of uh, when it was run before, you're going to do the same thing again. But interestingly in the video game, when you have the opportunity to have like a, you know, you die and you respawn and you have another go at the same situation. An example of this would be Halo. If you're fighting in Halo and you get killed and you get back into the fray, you can go and do it completely differently. So in Halo, um, let's have a look. If, I mean, probably if I get a video on Halo, there's probably going to be people playing it and not dying. So um, Halo uh, Combat Evolved, and we need it to be, say, um, would it be this? And then it would be um, no deaths. So we don't want no deaths. We want lots of deaths. Um, speed running. Um, So um, I'm not sure this is going to work because um, if I try a different level. Um, thing is, that people tend not not to um, show their work. Um, if they fail, um, original Xbox, right? Well, okay, we'll try this, but what we'll do is, um, I want to see if you get killed. Get some sound now. We should now have access to the main facility. Let's find the map room. That's one of the baddies. Now this is the first person. Okay, I think you're dealing with um, uh, invisible hunters there. Bravo right, well, he's cut out a lot by doing okay, that. Let's move down the beach. Keep an eye out for any cargo we can salvage.
Well, he's not going to die from blunts. Um. What? Well, this guy is way too good. If you can hit them with a the plasma thing from there. Um. I don't know that I'm going to be able to find. What I'm looking for is uh, repeated deaths. Um, see, the thing is, if you die in Halo, and then it puts you back to like an auto save point, and then you go through again from there, and there's no delay. You don't sort of like reloading the game from the last point that you had saved. Um, hmm. No, I can't do anything about this. It's um, multiple deaths. Oh, okay. This might be a bit more like it. So, um, so uh, he's, uh, by lots of things, he's got... What the hell? That's noisy. With, 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 he looks like he's gone aboard the um, enemy ship. Truth and Reconciliation, yeah. So, um, kind of have this kind of grav lift thing that takes you up, and they end up in this sort of entry bay, and um, then you're here with your squad, and then enemies start pouring in from these doors who are aliens. So, on an alien ship, I don't know why it looks like that because it shouldn't. Oh, there's an invisible one with a sword. You're going around slicing everyone up. And then you die. Okay, so you die. So this is you. Thank God I found one. So finally I found what I wanted to talk about. This is to do with free will. So what he did before uh, was like, now he's got an opportunity to do it all again. Does he do the same thing again? No, he moves somewhere else, right? They come in the door and then they go off and he now is doing something else, but he dies this time. Starts off at the same position again. Now he's thinking, well, I tried that, I tried this. I'm going to move over here now. And it's like, I think he's going to keep dying. But the point is, is that, yeah, yeah, okay. This is good. This is exactly what I wanted. Because I wanted to show that he keeps on going back to the same starting position. And then it's like, you have free will over your choices second time around. Third time around, fourth time around, etc., etc., etc. right? So is this free will where you have, um, the same starting setup, and then you do different things under it. So, what does that mean? The game, the simulation of the game, the physics of the game, which is simulated, is all constant. It's all the rules don't change, right? What you do in the way of your inputs in the game, you like play with this, you go around, you do anything to decide, I'm going to shoot these things. That, a uh, bit less of this, more of this, um, because it's not using this one to aim. Um, that is um, you have 
player agency in the world through your interface with it through this and the world is constrained as a set of possibilities uh, allowing you to only do the things that are within the rules of the game kind of a bit like chess has it having rules but the rules are rules of the ai of the enemies and the ai of your squad and what they're prepared to do and the um you know your resources your ammo your your, your shield of your your armor and um you are afforded the means through this to be able to inhabit this world which is fictional right right just as in the sense of bishop berkeley it's like sensory information that's coming to you is like doesn't really come to you and this controller vibrates and so it's giving you feedback through your hands that you're like an explosion has gone off and you feel it rumble but it's not like, oh, a grenade's gone off, I am in danger, right? Because if you die from a grenade going off really close to you, because it's like a threat of the grenade when it's distant and rumbling, but if it hits you really close, it makes it rumble a lot, and then you die, well, you don't stay dead for any length of time at all. You go off and you do this repeat cycle thing of... Uh, starting again and again and again and of course if you went and did the same thing that next time um and assume the game gave you the same setup the next time around from the same spawn point then it would be um and i think it does i am pretty confident it's the same Thing happens if you do the same thing um, from the same, you know, auto save, then the, the, the world isn't changing, the, the physics of the world isn't changing, the rules of the game aren't changing. What's changing is what you choose to do. Now, the thing with life is that you're not usually presented a scenario where you get to do the same thing twice. Um, you don't get to have exactly the same scenario in an every identical respect in the future as in the past and that learn from your mistakes and then apply it again in the future. Um, I mean, you could think about a very simple example and you could say, you know, um, you know, you ate 17 chocolate ice creams and threw up because it's too much. And then the opportunity presents itself to you in the future to eat 17 chocolate ice creams again. And you're thinking, oh, this is just like what happened before. If I eat 17 chocolate ice creams again, uh, there's a pretty good likelihood I'll throw up. And so you don't do it. Or it could be, you know, you get really drunk and have a really bad hangover. And then that makes you think, you know what? It's not worth it getting that drunk. I won't get that drunk again. And you can kind of maybe do things to mitigate the hangover or you give up drinking. So, because you've got a problem. But that might be your choice that is like you're learning from your mistakes now if someone tries to take that away from you and says oh but you know you making those mistakes and learning from them that was always going to be the case and we can say mathematically that that would be the physical outcome of all of those things that would we include you in our predictive model then we will be able to say that you will have an aversion to eating lots and lots of chocolate and drinking a lot and stuff and you'll start behaving differently and shape up and
So whatever you do, there'd be some people who uh, aren't believing in free will that would say you are destined to do X or Y, right? On the basis of their idea of, I mean, they could make it a post-rationalization of any action, however unusual you took. Let's say I did something really out of character and I went to San Moritz, spent a whole bunch of money, uh, you know, rented out a lodge and then went skiing, right? Had to take lessons and go skiing. I had no earthly desire to do that ever in my life. No interest at all. I could do it. I could afford to go, right? Nothing's stopping me. I've got a passport, right? I could go tomorrow. I mean, I need to stay in for the uh, gas man who's going to hopefully repair the boiler, but I don't have to. I'm going to San Moritz or Aspen or wherever, wherever there's snow, right? And so you might say, well, that's free will. Why don't I be spontaneous and do something? And like, the whole idea of being spontaneous might be like, that would get critiqued by someone. And they would say, oh, well, you only acted like that to prove a point that you could be spontaneous and to demonstrate that you had free will by doing something out of the ordinary that was unpredictable. And we can predict that you do something unpredictable and knowing enough about you it would be this because it would be something that you wouldn't like because you wouldn't spontaneously do something you'd like because then people would say, well, you've just given yourself to do something you like. It's only really a proof of you demonstrating your free will if you were bloody minded enough to do something you hate, right? And... Um, It's a problem. It's a problem. Um, see, if it is just a matter of you keep getting goes where you can have a, a choice to do different things, um, isn't that good enough? I mean, if you, I mean, okay, I'm not saying you get a choice to do anything, because, I mean, in this, his choices are being opposed by the game killing him, all right? So he has free will, maybe, to do and choose what to do, and none of it's working out. Uh, and maybe there's, uh, by the end of the stream, he'll have figured out what it is to do to get past this thing, which is kind of like a puzzle, maybe, um, and it's trial and error, and then you find out your way through. But you might say, well, on a meta level, there's only one solution to the puzzle. Therefore, um, you know, that's deterministic, isn't it? You're eventually going to be doing that thing that will work. Um, so your ultimate outcome will be that ultimate thing. And... All the other things that you tried, all the other paths that you took, um, are irrelevant. But then again, it's kind of reminiscent of this, whether like all of these different pathways through space, where it's like uh, they're in superposition and stuff like this. And it's like, isn't it like that? Aren't these all the different ways he played the game? And then... Is it like that? Because this is all serial, right? This is all serial. It's all happening in sequence. But is it not that you could re-edit this, sync it so all of them started off with you at the same position at the beginning, standing uh, on the dais here, 
and then you will superimpose the imagery as you went off in different directions. And in a way, it'd be like you are the you know, electron or whatever going through space and then through time this way. And all the different choices would be all the different pathways you take through this space. And these things would all simultaneously exist as possibilities. And then you'd end up with whatever choice that got taken would be the net sum of these probabilities. So you don't get multiple tries at something, but the aggregate uh, probabilistic average of things that are happening as mathematical alternatives in, in a kind of simultaneous, um, you know, multi, multi attempt thing like this eventually yields something, which is what happens. And that might be more something where there's like a multiplayer content content right where in this it's single player but if it was multiplayer and you kept on having to play from the beginning each time for the same position and then all of those multiplayer games would then have aggregates wouldn't it so if you look at Halo 3 um, heat maps um, we can look at these, you know, maps in Halo, and then we can say, we'll look at the, um, got various uh, things, there's um, Last Resort, and so what we're looking for is where the activity is on the maps. And it'd be useful to have a context picture for the heat map. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that one is. I have a feeling that one is the pit. Um, a while back, Bungie, the makers of the Halo series of games, started tracking data on the services, how different online multiplayer maps are performing. They converted the data on kills and deaths in the multiplayer games into heat maps and then started publishing the maps online for everyone to see. Okay. The advantages to players are that you can see places to avoid, the places with the highest deaths, and the locations from where the most kills come from. The map above shows the data for the map called the pit. I had the right idea of which one it was called just when looking at that. Yeah, amazing. But you can narrow down the information based on the type of weapon used. I see. For example, the map below shows the locations killed made with sniper rifle. So let's see. The sniper rifle will be being used here um, and here. No, wait, here and here. Um, yeah, these are the towers on the left-hand side, and it won't be particularly off, off the right. Oh, wait a minute. What is the orientation of this diagram? That, these are the towers. These are the towers. That is the main 
base with the tunnel underneath it, which comes out here. And then this is the kind of valley area. And then there's a channel here and a back part here. So yeah, these are the towers from where you do the sniping. Okay. Okay. There we go. These are the towers where you do the sniping. Um, The darker the red, the more frequent the deaths. Hmm. Okay. So. The relevance of this is it's kind of like this in the sense that accumulation of lots and lots of games had led to that heat map. And as accumulations of this leads to there being like one aggregate probabilistic kind of what ends up being the case of all these, these different Everettian multiverses. The ways it can evolve with more or less importance. Over time, our field evolves as a superposition of all possible scenarios. Transitioning from a classical field to a quantum field results in a very interesting property. Just okay, then he talks about energy levels. So if you were to look at this and say, the thing about, you know, kind of learning from your mistakes, trial and error, over a narrative time, if you were to say, imagine that I have a way of cloning myself and the universe into lots of different universes, and then having multiple me's try out every possible choice. So, I mean, if I did it trivially with just two, I come up to the pair of doors. There's a door A and a door B. I'm inclined to go through a door B. I don't know why. That's what I tend to choose. But there's another option. So my clone goes through door A. And then that, because we both have the same initial state, um, we both explore both possibilities and there might be consequences that come from the other possibility that might be negative that would then mean that that was um uh this this thing with the interactions here there might be something going on here where there might be interactions between the different universes um, but it's not like splitting they might be somehow talking to each other um, like there could be like a probabilistic net outcome of these things where Certain interactions occur in certain scenarios and not in others. And then the ones, what governs what interactions lead to what is a question. You could watch that part of the video, but. Okay, the point I wanted to make about all of this quantum field theory not being real is that I'm not saying it's not correct. I'm saying that in the same sense that, say, the natural numbers, there are lots and lots of natural numbers, 
right? There's like an infinite number. Um, I don't think it doesn't bother me that for any number you can think of, however big, there's one more. Okay, one one numerically larger number than that number, because it would bother me more if that wasn't true. So. I'm looking at something where I think about these things as being that all of these multiverses are, they can be infinite, it doesn't bother me, provided that they're not real. If they're physical, I have a real issue with it. But if they're mathematical, I don't care. And then you say, well, at what point do things become real? And I say, I'm not sure they do. I think that our way, that our mathematics that is making us have thoughts and whatever, because it's all happening through fields, right? So we're made out of fields. I'm constituent, constituented, I'm constituted by fields. My electrical impulse is in what would be my brain if I had a brain um that is made of fields but again the fields are mathematics everything's fields right there's no matter there's no anything that's tangible um in so far as the mathematical description of physics is concerned it's all quantum field theory and so you have that and then you say but your mind has language and your language touches grass and it has the qualia of that sensation of touch and your mind says i have just touched that field of grass and it's both a field of grass so actual field of grass and well as it's having one field coming from parts of your body to the blade of grass and that sensation of touch coming from the interaction of those fields. Um, as far as we have constructed our um, idea of the world uh, around um, um, the, our mind describing the world in terms of this mathematics. And it's a mathematical model um, that's thought to describe an objective reality but what if it's just a mathematical model why does it actually have to be something that really exists what what part of why does that even matter right why do you need that if you've got you know your halo 3 game and it and it works i think i closed the window if the halo 3 game works and it is just um fiction it then doesn't matter does it right because you you've got your game you're having fun what does it matter if it's not real um i mean the thing is is that with that game they make it extremely dangerous and risky so you die a lot um but they also say well we, that won't be fun if you die a lot and that's the end. Uh, you, you, it's dangerous to die, and that's like that's the end of the game. Thank you for your, you know, sixty dollars. Uh, that's the end of it. Yeah, you get one go. That won't go over very well with people. They want to have more than one go. In fact, they want to make it so that every time they die, they immediately are back into the fray without delay. And that's what that game does. But it puts you back exactly where you. Well, when you started so it's kind of like a groundhog day and i don't think people realize that so i'm glad i was able to find that video um because it's kind of like i mean had they tried out the same thing each time i think it would have gone the same way um with them uh being unable to escape their fate out of the ignorance of what they had done before. But if you were aware of what you've done before and you vary it, there's a chance it could work out differently. Now, are we informed by other 
kind of like versions of ourselves in other parallel realities that were effectively mathematical in nature? I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't know how I sometimes come to decisions. And it feels as if there's more going on in influencing my thought process. Um, but is it not like my mind is um, imagining the future and working out future potential scenarios as to outcomes and working out like, like a chess moves on a, a chess table, it kind of says, you think so many moves ahead. And you think, well, if the uh, player I'm playing against, you know, what's their next moves going to be? And they've got to have multiple ones they could make. And then for all of those moves they could make, you have to think of all the moves you'd make and all the moves they would make back in response to those moves down sort of like eight layers deep. And that's why it seems so crazy that, you know, people can play chess and, and do this and think um, this deeply. Um, um, some historical chess positions. Let's see if he recognises them. This position, I bet it looks familiar. Uh -huh, yeah, uh, this looks an awful lot like uh, Tal Botvinnik. I think the continuation here was probably Queen D5 and then Rook A6 and uh, Tal, Tal 1. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right, should I go on to the next one? <laughs> I was literally reading about this, like this is the book that is on my bedside table about the Kaspar Karpov matches. Does this ring any bells? <laughs> yeah, this is the old naked one, uh, the tricky, tricky mist. So this is Anand Shivanchuk from one of the uh, Intel Rapid tournaments, probably from like 95 or something. Uh, 94, I think. But 94. So he not only knows the position, but he knows the moves that go on from this now position. Now I'm going to play through an opening. And it's not in the game he played. Stop me when you recognize the game, and if you can tell me who was playing back. I mean, all the all the games get their their moves written down in chess notation. Against Sabata. What year? Uh, 87, 88, 88, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good one. <laughs> uh, so this is like top three worst chess memories that I have. This is the game Carlson Howell from World Youth Championship 2002. 
uh, I need, needed to win the um, last game. I was half a point in front of Yanda Pomishi. The most annoying part uh, I remember about that last round is that Yanda Pomishi was playing against um, an Indonesian player, Susilo Dinata. I think he played a cover kind of black. He had an extra pawn and, and, and a great position, and then he just collapsed. And I was losing my advantage as well, and I just remember just raging like crazy. Uh, I could but, tell. So um, that's quite interesting. Um, that's... Uh, Then we're going to go and see if we can find, uh, I think it's either 4D chess or 5D chess. Oh, this is it. So someone's made a game um, which is um, very, very complicated. So I thought this would be interesting in the context of this, and then maybe it would um, illuminate the problem of free will. So I'm going to take my king, and I'm going to move him back in time. So my king on the original timeline has now moved in to the branching timeline. There's two kings on this board. And the aim of the game is you have to protect every king across every reality. I don't need to worry about this board so much now because my king does not exist. He, the, the player, the PC cannot win in this reality anymore because I, I've gone back in time. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, or did I just lose? Yeah, I, I can take that. You can take that, that's fine. I know, I'm starting to get, I liked the period where I actually still had a queen on the board, so what I'm going to do, okay, now he jumped forward, what did he do? So he's now got two queens on this world line, and one of them is currently putting my king in check on this world line. Like, if you're not following, just look at the board state. I haven't lost yet, so I, 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 need, I need to prevent this from happening when the present catches up. No, oh, the no, wait, no, I have actually it. lost. God, please, you haven't won a game yet. Well, look, maybe we'll do better against a human, because the human might not understand what's going on, too. Okay, I can get the king back out. Good grief. Uh, but that's going to cause another branch in reality, unfortunately. How is that checkmate? Okay, now, is time... Where, where they go backwards in time, which I suppose is a way of saying... I, my piece is under threat, my king's under threat, I want to bring it back in time. And there's a latitude by which you can do that somehow. Is that something that we might have going on in our universe or in the observerse? I mean, if the observerse has the recovery of space-time from Sem 7, it's recovering 1-3, where is it getting the one from if there's seven times? Because we could have three spatial dimensions that would be consistently moving forward, but we could have a multi-stranded time that would be changing and weaving um, itself out of different time all the time. And we wouldn't be aware of it, would we? If it's like having a book and everything you write in the book has to be has to be written in sequence, right? And then I write something like here, and I have my that's in my list of people in the that are responsible for um everything but if i go down here and i go and i start saying i'm going to write something 
and then I go and I'm gonna say um, I am a author <coughs> number <coughs> number one and I write in italics and then um, I am author number two and I write in bold <coughs> I am author number <coughs> Right, so you have all of this <coughs> and you are continuously writing forward and you can't go backwards. But even though your ten overall temple direction is forwards, the authors are the different authors. <coughs> so from the point of view of time if you had this and you said let's do this in parallel um you would want to have some kind of indent wouldn't you i don't think i've got an indent um I'm thinking this would be um, there, and then this would be like that. Now we're used to seeing things that are written like that as being um, the cursor would be here. We're used to seeing things as being like, oh, well, you read across and the next line is like the next line because you read like that. That's not what I'm doing. I'm doing a one-dimensional, well, not a one-dimensional, a three-dimensional time where you're not aware of what time you're in. So those three dimensions are actually going to feel to you like this. And they are not spatially, they collapse the spaces like that. Those three spaces, those three space times, um, there is like um, one comma three, which is this one. And then there's um, two comma three, which is this one. And then there's three comma three, which is this one. Now in geometric unity, there's like seven comma three. So there's the seventh dimension of time and the third dimension of space. And then it has extra dimensions of space beyond that. But I don't think we need to worry about that with this. Because obviously it's recovering a certain, you know, specific group of, um, 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 it's recovering the metrics of uh, Lorentz in space time from the 14 dimensional fiber bundle. And I'm thinking we've got other dimensions of time at play. They could all be going forward in the same sense. Some of them could be going backward, which would be interesting because that would mean that we have the same situation as the. The, the thing where the the, the um, chess boards allow things to go backwards. Now, if they did though, and you could go backwards, what would be the implication of that? Because 
I mean, if you were deterministic, would it not mean that you couldn't go backwards? That any decision you'd made... I mean, surely, if you at will go backwards in time and change the past, would that not break determinism? However, if you had it so that you were allowed to, and you did something exceptional, then you have an exceptional event, and then that will then go back and change the past. But how does it change the past? It, hmm, is it capable of changing another timeline other than your own? You can't change your own timeline. You can't change back and say, I'm author number four or whatever, and change something about this, because you are in that timeline for that amount of time. You stay that, but you could go back and change something in this, maybe, because it's not the active timeline. But no, why would that be... The why would that be the active time? Why would any of them be active or inactive? Oh, maybe, maybe what happens is you change which one you're conscious in. So you are, your consciousness is in any one of these things. So it starts off and you're here. And so you're in this first one and you're not aware of any other timeline. And then you end up in this one. And again, you're not aware of anything else. Uh, well, hold on a minute. You have your own internal state and memory of the world. And you were in this parallel universe. But that parallel universe is no longer in effect, and now you're in this parallel universe, and you and then and then you jump again into this one. And so you're constantly slipping between realities but you're not slipping between spaces as much as you're slipping between times so there's a coherency of um there's a coherency of where where matter is um but it's in a state of superposition because to some extent there's there might be interference here there might be some stuff in between that is going to be hold on as well. Is that more like it? Um, Cause I'm wondering whether or not it would be safer to allow time to change and keep space the same because it might be that uh if space changed or like i was to slip between spaces all the time because the thing is is like if you say we have 
multiple parallel universes. Um, where is it? Here. And I'm like flitting between them all the time. Um, if that's the way my my brain works, like Penrose is talking about microtubules in the brain, then if there's something like that going on at a low level, then I could have free will because I wouldn't be subject to other people having to, I mean, the determinism, it's, it's inherently non-deterministic, this, isn't it? I mean, you can't, it's determined by observation. And that's sort of experimental observation, not just looking at it, observation. So that not the case that these things are Trying to remember what time I started the stream. How long has it been? 11 hours. Has it really been 11 hours? Um, okay. Um, well, I've got nothing else happening this evening uh, after I've had my dinner, so I can carry on. It will get cold, though. <laughs> um, this has been interesting. I mean, I think the question of free will is um, one which is a, a very, very tricky. And this notion of, um, what's this, 5D chess? Did I have 5D chess? No, I haven't put that video in yet. The 5D chess game. Um, We don't quite know what model is our universe and how complicated it is and what consequences it was if it was more elaborate. And just because we think of things as being relatively simple in three-dimensional space and time moving forward, it could be a lot more complicated. And we had um, Pet Weinstein on the Joe Rogan experience saying how you know, how you know, we think we're having a conversation where we're going forward in time sort of thing. And I'm like, mm, well, um, I don't know what happened to it. Is this it? No. Um, where's the Joe Rogan experience thing? Episode 1945, I think it was. I don't know if we still got it. Um... This is it. So he says, we're having a conversation here. We'll do this explanation again of him doing the things on the table. And we'll have it next to my drawing of space. Is this it? So this is the next page over. And so what we want to do actually is we want to have that on the page over this way um and we want to have that like that and then we want to have that those are the axes there and then we have right we have this and then we have w x y z and then four angles between pairs of axes. Uh, no, sorry, four four axes, uh, six um, angles between pairs of axes, and then this tensile down here that's got four elements, which adds up to four plus six plus four, which was fourteen. So, how do we? And these are the things here with the angles between them but then you've got to consider W. So I think if I was going to just be more optimized about this, I would put that over that side, I think. You don't really need the whole screen. Then 
This is him doing the thing on the table there. And we'll go back to that. And then we're going to bring up the this. And we'll put that that side and make it a little bit smaller so that we've got that on there. And that should be all the information, pretty much. So um, we'll do that. Go back a little bit. I think he says Y14. Um, I think um, Joe Rogan says Y14. He's pretty good at asking the questions that need asking. Even if he understands, he asks for the benefit of his audience so the audience can keep up with his um, guests. Seven years or whatever it is. And like today's the first day that I'm sort of free because I've kept this to myself. So if you want to ask but me why? any question about geometric unity. But why? Why did you keep this to yourself? So, no, it's not them. It, yet again, it's too the logic to that method? No. Yes, but I doubt that I'm wrong. Give me the layman's version of the theory. All right. Yeah. First time ever. Yeah. Um, do you know that, well, let's start off with Escher's. We won't have the drawing hands again. Why? Because the, the thing is, is he says, give me the layman's theory, of theory. It's not a theory. Uh, it's certainly not a theory of everything. This whole thing with the drawing hands here is, um, It's as if it's a theory of everything. It's like, oh, what we're going to try and do is you're going to try and start with almost nothing, which is a piece of paper, and have it magically draw with ink that it creates uh, hands drawing hands. And it's like a very, like, no, you missed the point of the lithograph. It's actually, it wasn't, I mean, for one thing, it's nothing, it's not the ink created anything. It was printed from a lithograph. There's a stone that was cut, and then the stone was inked, and then it was put on a piece of paper and rolled, and it transferred the ink in one fell swoop with that image onto that piece of paper. There wasn't a process. So it's completely inappropriate to use a lithograph and, and then say the hands are drawing the hands. It's an illustration of hands drawing hands, but the paper making the hands drawing the hands, the paper didn't make anything. It was a roller that went and transferred the image off the uh, stone uh, into um, the pa paper. Because it was grooves in the stone that had the ink. Um, and then that's what got left on the thing. And that's how you can do multiple lithographs. That will have like an addition number somewhere, you know, in the bottom right hand corner, or say one of, you know, however many. And uh, it could be 200, 250. Um, that's how you make your money. Because they don't want to go to all that trouble over the door and just sell one. You know, it's just like ridiculous. You know, you've got to sell, you know, a lot, but you can't make it so that there are an, in, an unlimited number of them because um, people will just go, you know, it's not special anymore. So they recognize that it's hard work to make an image like that. So they go off and they pay a decent amount of money for the print known that it is collectible because it's one of an edition of a limited run. And it's done by the artist and the artist marks it as being a certain number out of a something. It's like a, a, like a fraction. You don't go off and just add, you know, you don't just say, you know, one or 35 on it. It's 35 over 35 out of 250. Now, 
I have done an etching which is not that different from a lithograph. Uh, it's not on stone, it's on a met metal sheet. And um, printing pressed ink, roller, whole deal. And it was an interesting process to do it um, at art college. And um, I thought it was quite nice, quite a nice process to sort of put in the work in the drawing, because I quite like drawing. And then have it go through this process where it's like, it kind of takes it uh, as a remove away from you um, actually having made it. It That extra layer of process means it just sort of springs into being as a, as a realized artwork, which doesn't sort of betray the hand that drew it. So in a way, in a sense, Escher might be saying, from an artistic critique point of view, point of view Escher's saying, who draw this? Who drew this? Like, did the top hand draw it? Well, the top hand's drawing the bottom hand, but then he's drawing into being the bottom hand, which is drawing the top hand. So it's kind of like a paradox. But the actual subtextual why sly joke is actually... No, the hands aren't drawing the hands. And it isn't me that had the hand in drawing this either. The lithograph printing press effectively printed this, right? So there was no drawing involved at all. And so the whole thing is a joke because there's no drawing involved even though it's all about drawing. And it's called drawing hands. It's not a drawing. Now, when he went through the process to create this in the first place, he would have had to have done a drawing of drawing hands. But when he came to print it, and this is a print, then, and, and the drawing he did would have been on the stone, right? We wouldn't have been on a piece of paper. There's no way that I know of that you draw on a piece of paper and then that gets somehow turned into a lithograph. Um, so I don't think there's like a pencil sketch kicking around somewhere um, of this. You know, it's like the original and then somehow the rest of it is... I mean, you might be able to do it with photo lithography take a photograph of the lithograph and then use that with some kind of process like acids to turn a lithograph stone into something you could then print lithographs. But that would be a technique that came along after he did this. Because the photo lithography came out after he did this. Um, and Eric has said something about this being a canvas and it it's definitely not a canvas. It's on paper. The paper doesn't make ink. And Joe Rogan kind of gets, catches them on that. And he's like saying that it's a metaphor. But if it's a metaphor, it's, it's all very clunky. And, uh, it's like, He's trying to talk about things to do with the theory of everything whilst kind of not talk, talking about my theory being the theory of everything. And I mean, he's now, you know, as of episode 1628, he's now saying it's the theory of everything. And that's a mistake in my view. Um, he's got, who is it? we look at this, he does come out and say it. Um, it says, what do you think? Um, he hands him something 
Ah, vad heter det så blir det? Put it about here. So this is much later on, and this went quite badly. Okay. Is it? Explain what it is. What, what, is, what is this thing that you you handed me? What is this? It is okay. This is the hardest thing for me to say because okay. I have to not hedge it. I think it's the theory of everything. And what do you mean by that? There is a moment where you have to say this, I believe, about a radical departure. And you don't want to say it because you want to hedge it. It is, it, Jamie, if you could bring that up and you go a little bit, uh, maybe two pages in. Is this available online so someone can peruse it? In fact, uh, okay, right there on the left, uh, go down that table. You see where it says X4? Yes. X4 is four parameters. It could be salty, sweet, sour, bitter. It could be low, uh, treble, medium, uh, base, and volume. And the question that I took from Einstein was, can we generate the world, everything, from something as innocuous as four parameters? And if you think about a fertilized egg, somebody can hand you a picture of an embryo and in vitro fertilization. You're like, well, that's your, that's your child to be. Like, Get the fuck out. Well, that fertilized egg somehow self-assembles into something that you cannot even imagine. And that's a mystery. The question is, in some sense. Um, uh, Joshua Mooney, how, thank you for being here. Hello, um, a World War Time Observer is its own dimension does the observer dimension then to run as the dimension of time control mechanism that actually imprisons us in base reality proto space time before einstein put rulers and practice practice on it his manifold is semi rumpian no that's not um the, the word would be the mathematical term would be semi uh Riemannian. Okay, and it's named after a guy called Ber Bernard Riemann. Okay, so if we go, we've heard him say this thing about it being a theory of everything, and Bernard Riemann is uh, somewhere here. Um, it should be on this. Oh, it's on this other page. So we've got Bernard Riemann. That's him there from uh, 1863. Big beard, small glasses. Every one of these people, practically without a con exception, has got a really high forehead. So it's like, okay, okay. I'm starting to see a pattern here. Um, so. The key word there is differential geometry, and we see this kind of saddle shaped thing. That's the sort of thing he was into, and um, that's the sort of thing you need for doing um, the mathematics of um, um, space time. So, where's space time? We've gone and lost it again. I think it's here. No, it's here. Is that it? That's space time. Okay, so that's a picture of space time, and um, what you have is clocks that are going around like that, and out away from the mass of the star, they're going around at normal speed, and then closer to the star, they're going around a lot slower. Right, and unfortunately, the the animation isn't that long. So it kind of keeps on jumping back. But it should just be turning continuously. And um, like that. But that is a far better um, version of the, you know, the, the way that mass will um, cause a warp in space and squish space around it. So it's pulling, gathering in all those things, kind of like a fly that has been caught in a spider's web. 
that is um, much more like um, general relativity than um, when you see it and it's just um, like a trampoline with a bowling ball in it. That trampoline bowling ball thing is old hat and it's not properly representative of what's going on. Um, let's see. So when he says proto space time, I take issue with him saying that because what he's doing there with X4, and I'm going to get myself a four so I can do it properly. We're going to get ourselves a four because we're going to be professional. And we've got about 11 hours. We might be about to run out of time. I'm going to do that. X4 um, is um, is a primitive um, four-dimensional um, semi-Romanian or uh, pseudo um, Y Manian Y Manian manifold. So you can think of that in layman's terms as a kind of 4D surface. Okay. And um, it will be. Um, You know, it, it will have no structure uh, in the sense of it having no way of measures. So it has it has no measurements. Um, it has no um, time, right? So he will say, oh, before time. And it's like, no, you can't use the word before when you're talking about time because you need time to talk about something happening before, right? All you can do is say there's space and then how many dimensions it has and then use that to grow what you have up thereafter. And then what you have is you have this thing where you grow the space, which is this, and this is how it works. So you start off very simply, like with two dimensions, and you say I've got x and y, and you can have like you normal know, like a graph, and you can have a little arrow in it, which is that little red arrow, and then you say right, we're interested in knowing how to get from the base of the arrow to the tip. So you go um, start off there. And then you go uh, three along that way and one up. So you can think of this almost like you're in a street um, in um, New York and you get invited to lunch and they say you get an invite in your hotel and they say you need to go um, three blocks east and one block north from your hotel and then you'll find... Um, Trump Tower. And so uh, you do this and you follow the instructions and it works because it's all on the grid, right? And if you had gone one block north and then three blocks east, it would still get you to the same location because you just go up there and then across like that. All right. So that's pretty nifty. And that is what he's added in to the way that Einstein measured things. Because Einstein would measure the number of axes where there were four of them. And then he would measure, because uh, there's four dimensions, and then he'd measure uh, the angles between pairs of those axes. And the reason you do that is because it's not, always the case that they are 90 degrees so if this is like 90 degrees 90 degrees 90 degrees right well in a situation like i was showing before with the rotating thing with the clocks on it those are squishing or they're splaying 
And so the angles aren't staying 90 degrees. Sometimes they're less, sometimes they're more. And so if we go back and have a look at that, we'll see that this is, some of them on the outside are more like cubes. That's a bit more like straight lines, perpendicular things at the corner there. That's not too bad as a kind of, you know, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. You can see it's in perspective, but it's like, okay. And then here you can see it's curving in, curving in. So the angles of these things are now um, warping. And it's, it's strange. It's like that there, you can see it's not at a right angle. It's, it's gone from being like that to being like that. So that's because of um, the geometry being distorted by the, the mass of the star. And um, we will go back to this. And so, um, uh, Albert Einstein said, for, for uh, general relativity to work, I will need to have 10 dimensions because I will need to have axes for those and I'll have angles between them so that those angles can change. And this is where he will be talking about um, um, the, um, he will talk about degrees of freedom, which is like dimensions, and he'll be talking about um, um, protractors, like the angles between the dimensions, the degrees of freedom. These being the degrees of freedom. And then later he'll talk about um, a length, and this is the thing that does the length. But the thing that does the length isn't a ruler, because he talks about rulers, this would be a ruler, it's straight. Here is a surface that if it's curved, like space-time is curved, you put it on top of cur curved space-time and it's no longer viable because it's like you can't measure things on it because it doesn't go around the corner, doesn't go around the curve. However, if you make use of the fact that the scarf has got the stripes on it, you can use the stripes to do the measurement, right? So if I hold it like that, you can see I could go and pick a point and I could go along all the stripes and I could count how many stripes. And that way I would find how long the distance was from place to place when it would be on a concave surface, really, really difficult with this ruler to measure that. I'd have to do it in tiny little pieces so, I mean, differential geometry is, in a sense, using a straight ruler, but very, very short straight ruler to just measure the, incrementally measure a distance by tiny, tiny pieces and then sum up the distance. Uh, but um, having it be this thing where it's effectively a tape measure, I think would be a better analogy. And he does mix metaphors. He'll, he'll talk about draw, drawing hands, and then he'll be talking about a fertilized egg, and then he'll be talking about an embryo on an ultrasound, and then he'll be talking about... Or he'll be talking about one thing after another after another. And I'm like, well, it's sort of a bit scattergun. It's kind of like he's hoping he'll throw something at the wall and it'll stick. Um, now, before we get unstuck, Marcel we need to see how far into the recording we are. And we've got to stop because it is time. And I will do another one very soon. Um, 